2023 was a wild year for movies and TV. Like, how did we get Barbenheimer, John Wick 4, New Adventure Time, and The Last of Us TV show all in one year? This feels like years worth of stuff, but I could also just be crazy. Still, now that we're winding down 2023 and getting ready for 2024, it's the perfect time to revisit all the awesome stuff that came out this year. So we've packed all of our biggest and brightest 107 facts videos about this year's hottest content into one easy to watch video. We've got over a thousand facts for you, so get ready. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. I'm Keegan and here's a bunch of facts from 2023. Make sure you like the video if you liked it and subscribe for more like this in 2024. Let's get into it. We'll kick things off with the smash video game hit of the year, the Super Mario Bros movie. First of all, what a super fun movie, but also, who could have guessed that Disney would get beaten at his own animation game? At this point, the movie has made over $1.3 billion in the box office, and that's not even taking into account all the Mario merch that got made in the aftermath. Way to go, Illumination. Let's delve deep into 107 facts. Number 1. The Super Mario Bros. movie was produced and animated by Illumination Studios. If you aren't familiar, Illumination is most widely known for the Despicable Me series of movies, including Minions. Number 2. While Nintendo largely handed Illumination the reins, they also had a hand in the film's development as co-producers. Number 3. The Mario movie was directed by Aaron Horvath and Michael Jelinek. You'll likely know them from their work on Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go. Number 4. This newest Super Mario Bros. movie is actually the first time Mario has had a movie in 30 years. The first Mario movie premiered in 1993 as a live-action film. Number 5. At the time, the first Mario movie was a critical and commercial failure, so Nintendo held off on an idea for a new Mario movie as a way of protecting their IP. Number 6. Mario creator and Nintendo higher-up Shigeru Miyamoto was first inspired to revisit the idea of a Mario movie when Nintendo started adding their older games to the Virtual Console on Wii U and Nintendo 3DS. Number 7. From the jump, Nintendo knew they wanted the next Mario movie to be animated this time, unlike 1993's live-action one. However, Nintendo also knew that making a movie was nothing like making a game, so they would need outside help in the film's creation. Number 8. Originally, Nintendo was actually in discussions with Sony over a potential Mario movie. Sony had been trying to get the rights to a Mario movie even before 2014. At least, that's according to the hacked Sony Pictures emails that surfaced in November 2014. Number 9. According to those emails, in February and July 2014, Sony Pictures producer Avi Arad met with Nintendo in Tokyo to negotiate. In October, Arad actually emailed Sony Pictures chief Amy Pascal saying he'd closed a deal. Number 10. Also, Pascal named Gendy Tartakovsky as a possible director for the would-be Sony Mario movie. Tartakovsky is well known for Dexter's Lab and Samurai Jack, and he also directed Sony's Hotel Transylvania. Number 11. However, all the talks between Sony and Nintendo fell through. After the news of the leaks broke, Arad clarified that the aforementioned deal was only in the early stages of negotiations, and that no official arrangement was ever made between Sony and Nintendo. Number 12. Meanwhile, Nintendo was cozying up with Universal. Nintendo was working with Universal's parks and resorts divisions to create what would become Super Nintendo World. Number 13. At one point during the process, Shigeru Miyamoto was introduced to Chris Melodandri, founder of Universal's Illumination Studios and a veteran of 3D animated films. Number 14. The two hit it off and found a number of similarities in their creative processes and approaches to creation. In particular, Miyamoto liked Melodandri's cost-conscious and time-conscious approach to making animated films. Number 15. In fact, Miyamoto and Melodandri hit it off so well that Miyamoto decided that he'd want Melodandri and his Illumination Studios to handle a Mario movie. Number 16. By 2016, Miyamoto and Melodandri started to have more serious conversations about collaborating on a Mario movie, but both understood that they could walk away with no hard feelings if the project didn't work out. Number 17. News slipped about the collaboration in November 2017, with the then Nintendo president Tatsumi Kimishima clarifying that, while no deal had been made yet, they were looking towards a 2020 release date, if a deal was secured. Number 18. Sure enough, in January 2017, Nintendo officially announced that the Super Mario Bros. film was in production, with Miyamoto and Melodandri both serving as producers. Number 19. 
The main cast of characters was announced as part of a Nintendo Direct in September 2021. Leading things off, the first announcement was Chris Pratt as Mario. Number 20. The reaction to Chris Pratt's casting was mixed to say the least, and memed endlessly to say more. Also, the news put to bed any speculation or possibility that Charles Martinet, Mario's longtime voice actor in the games, would be reprising his role for the movie. Number 21. Charles Martinet is in the movie though, just not as Mario. He actually plays Mario and Luigi's father. This is the first time we've gotten a real good look at Mario and Luigi's family in any official capacity. Number 22. The designs for Mario's family that we see in the movie come from Nintendo themselves. The company actually had designed Mario's family years ago and gave the concepts to Illumination as a starting point. Number 23. According to Horvath, while Illumination Studios adjusted a number of the family's designs, Mario's mother and father are very close to Nintendo's original designs. In fact, Mario's dad is almost a one-to-one -one recreation of Nintendo's notes for the character. Number 24. Charles Martinet also plays another smaller role in the Super Mario Bros. movie, Giuseppe. He's the guy playing the arcade game in the pizzeria. Number 25. Early impressions of Chris Pratt's Mario voice weren't optimistic, but his original take on the character sounded very different from what audiences got to hear. According to Kerry Payton, Pratt's first Mario voice leaned much more into the New York Italian vibe. Number 26. Oh, and for the record, Kerry Payton voices the Penguin King. You'll recognize his voice as Cyborg in Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go. Number 27. However, Pratt's early version of Mario's voice was scrapped. Apparently, it had a little too much New Jersey in it and even sounded too much like Tony Soprano. Number 28. Of course, while Mario is naturally the star of the Super Mario Bros. movie, he's just that, one of the Mario brothers. His brother Luigi is played by Charlie Day. Number 29. Just like in Pratt's case, Charlie Day's original voice for Luigi was far too Italian mobster sounding for the rest of the team's taste. Where Pratt sounded too much like Tony Soprano, Charlie's first Luigi voice apparently sounded straight out of the classic gangster film Goodfellas. Number 30. Of course, it's not a Mario movie worth its salt without Princess Peach. She's played by Anya Taylor-Joy. Number 31. This is actually the first time out of Japan that Princess Peach has been called Peach in anything other than a game. For the longest time, she's just been referred to as her old school localized name, Princess Toadstool. Number 32. Where there's Peach, you know Bowser isn't too far, cooking up one of his schemes. For the Super Mario movie, the Koopa King is played by Jack Black. Number 33. Bowser's top henchman, Kamek, is voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, a prolific voice actor who's appeared in tons of projects, including Family Guy and The Simpsons. Number 34. Keegan-Michael Key, one half of Key and Peele, plays both halves of Toad in the Super Mario Bros. movie. Number 35. As far as the character's speaking rhythm go, Key actually based his voice for Toad on a friend of his. He noted that most examples of Toad's original voice are just a series of exclamations, as he called them, so there wasn't much for him to go on in terms of reference. Number 36. While Chris Pratt as Mario took the gold medal for memed casting choices, Seth Rogen playing Donkey Kong definitely came in with a solid silver. Number 37. Unlike Chris Pratt and Charlie Day, Seth Rogen had no intentions of putting on any kind of voice for DK, and was clear about that from the beginning. He said that he assured Illumination that he doesn't do voices, and that if they wanted him to play Donkey Kong, then they'd have to be ready for Donkey Kong to sound just like Seth Rogen. Number 38. Approaching the character, Rogan said that all you seem to know about Donkey Kong is that he throws barrels and does not like Mario very much, and his performance reflects that. Number 39. Cranky Kong is in the mix too. He's voiced by Fred Armisen. Number 40. We know all these classic Mario and Donkey Kong characters, but the movie also adds a new character, a Luma named Luma Lee. Luma Lee is actually voiced by Michael Jelinek's daughter, Juliette Jelinek. Number 41. Production on the Super Mario Bros. movie began in September 2020 at Illumination Studios in Paris. Number 42. All of the animation work on the film concluded in October 2022, with post-production work wrapping months later in around March of 2023.
Number 43. Stylistically, Jelinek and Horvath wanted the animation team to find a balance between realism and stylized animation. They didn't want the characters to feel too squash and stretchy, and were looking to make the film feel more grounded. Number 44. Watching the Super Mario Bros. movie, you'll see more than just top-notch animation. You'll also see tons of Mario and Nintendo Easter eggs sprinkled throughout. The pizzeria that they show is called Punch-Out, a reference to the old Nintendo Entertainment System game Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. It even has the same two exclamation points. Number 45. The pictures on the walls of Punch-Out Pizzeria feature a number of classic Punch-Out characters like Little Mac, his trainer Doc Lewis, and a few famous Punch-Out series opponents like Glass Joe and Bear Hugger. Number 46. In the Punch-Out Pizzeria, there's also an arcade cabinet for a game called Jumpman. It's a callback to what Mario was originally called when he first appeared in the 1981 arcade game Donkey Kong, before he was called Mario. Number 47. With his blue shirt and red overalls, Giuseppe's design is also a callback to Mario's original look when he was still known as Jumpman. Number 48. While in Brooklyn, you can see a French restaurant in the background called Chasse du Canard. Translated into English, Chasse du Canard means duck hunt, like the classic NES light gun game packaged with the OG Super Mario Bros. The restaurant even has the duck hunt duck as a logo. Number 49. You can also see a painting of the dog from Duck Hunt in the apartment where Mario and Luigi take their first plumbing gig. Number 50. In that same apartment, you can see a glass statue of a Pikmin as well. Number 51. The music from Mario and Luigi's plumbing commercial is actually the theme song of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, featuring Captain Lou Albano as Mario. Number 52. Also, the woman that appears in the commercial is played by Jeannie Elias. She actually played Princess Toadstool in the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, even though she goes uncredited in the movie. Number 53. Also in the commercial, the website that appears at the end is an actual website that you can visit for Super Mario Bros. Plumbing, complete with testimonials, job openings, and even a live chat function. Number 54. The logo on the van itself uses the same font that the Super Mario Bros. series has used since the very first game on the NES. Also, the pictures of the brothers on the van are from early promotional materials from the games. Number 55. While running to the Mario Bros. first plumbing job, Mario slides down a pole attached to a restaurant called Castle Burger. It's a nod to the ending of original Mario levels. Castle Burger is even shaped exactly like the castles at the end of each level. Number 56. On the side of a truck, you can also see Mr. Game & Watch from Nintendo's early line of Game & Watch handheld games. And Smash Bros, of course. Number 57. There's another super deep cut Nintendo reference in Brooklyn. You can see a background advertisement for Hanafuda cards as a reference to Nintendo's origins. Founded in 1889, Nintendo first sold handmade Hanafuda cards. Number 58. Towards the end of the movie, back in Brooklyn, we see an interview from the mayor of the city, Pauline. Pauline was the damsel in distress of the original Donkey Kong, as well as the mayor of New Donk City in Super Mario Odyssey. Number 59. As another character reference, there's also Mario and Luigi's old boss, Spike. This is the same Spike who was the foreman in Wrecking Crew, a different game featuring Mario working as his employee. Number 60. In the Mario movie, Spike is voiced by comedian Sebastian Maniscalco. Number 61. After Brooklyn floods, you can also see a car wash inspired by classic NES title Balloon Fight. Number 62. After Mario and Luigi save the day, in the crowd, you can see a character resembling the late Nintendo president and CEO, Satoru Iwata. Number 63. There are a few classic Nintendo references in Mario's room. He sits down and plays classic NES game Kid Icarus on his NES. If you look closely, you'll also see a copy of the Odyssey in the background, a reference to Super Mario Odyssey. Number 64. You can also see a model R-Wing from Star Fox and a poster featuring the Blue Falcon, Captain Falcon's racing machine from the F-Zero series. Number 65. Luigi's cell phone ring is the same as the starting jingle from the Nintendo GameCube. Also, the default icon for callers on the phone is the default me from consoles like the Nintendo Wii and beyond. Number 66. In the Mushroom Kingdom itself, Mario and Toad walk by the Crazy Cap store, the same store featured in Super Mario Odyssey. Number 67. You'll also see an antique shop full of classic Mario power-ups, including some more recent ones like the Boomerang from 2011's Super Mario Land. You can also find more old-school power-ups like the music box from Mario 3 and the hammer Jumpman uses in the OG Donkey Kong arcade game. Number 68. 
There are also plenty of other classic power-ups to see along Mario's adventure throughout the movie, including the classic Super Mushroom, Fire Flower, and Invincibility Star. Number 69. For as many Easter eggs as you can see, there are also some you can hear. The Super Mario Bros. Super Show theme is a deep cut, but you can also hear the classic Underground World 1-2 theme when Mario and Luigi head into the sewers. Number 70. It only makes sense that we hear some classic Mario themes. The legendary composer of the Mario series, Koji Kondo, actually worked on the game's score and helped to incorporate his music. Number 71. Kondo assisted the composer of the Mario movie score, Brian Tyler. Number 72. However, arguably the biggest song of the whole movie has to be Bowser's power ballad, Peaches. This isn't from Koji Kondo though. This song was written as a collaboration between the directors, editor Eric Osmond, producer John Spiker, and even Jack Black himself. Number 73. If you can believe it, this song wasn't even in the movie's first draft. But Horvath wanted a musical number in more of a heavy metal style. When he pitched the idea, he used Jack Black's band Tenacious D as an example. Number 74. After some tweaking, the song was reworked into a ballad, with Eric Osmond on the original vocals as a proof of concept. Jack Black recorded his vocals for the song two days later with an original piano track by his pianist. Number 75. Jack Black actually came up with the idea to change the song into a ballad, steering it away from its heavy metal direction. Number 76. The song even received its own live-action music video with Jack Black front and center, dressed in a Bowser-inspired outfit. The music video was directed by Cole Bennett of Lyrical Lemonade. Number 77. The song Peaches gained some legs and popularity in its own right, reaching number 61 on iTunes streaming chart and even cracking into the Billboard Hot 100 at the 83 spot. Number 78. The piano that Bowser plays actually has the name Ludwig von Koopa on it, a reference to one of the Koopalings from Super Mario Bros. 3. Number 79. Once Mario reaches the inside of Peach's Castle, we hear the same Peach's Castle overworld theme from Super Mario 64. Number 80. Around the castle, you can even see a number of paintings that would lead to the levels from Super Mario 64. Number 81. After Mario and Luigi get split up, we then catch up with Luigi and hear the theme from the classic GameCube launch title Luigi's Mansion. Number 82. While it is Mario's movie, first and foremost, there are a number of Donkey Kong shoutouts as well. When DK makes his big entrance at the arena, you hear the unmistakable DK rap from the opening of Donkey Kong 64. Number 83. Confusingly, the song is not properly credited to its composer, Grant Kirkhope, in the credits. The DK rap simply is attributed to the game itself, from Donkey Kong 64. Number 84. There are plenty of classic Donkey Kong characters in the background of the arena, like the famous Diddy Kong, Dixie Kong, and Funky Kong. There are a few other deeper cut Kongs in the mix like Swanky, Kitty, and Chunky Kong too. Number 85. You'll also find tons of Mario Kart references in the Super Mario Bros. movie. Everything from the pieces used to assemble the carts, the gliders, and the anti-gravity capabilities of the carts themselves. Number 86. The Mario Kart sequence also features the classic Mario Kart staple level Rainbow Road, as well as items like bananas, green shells, and even the dreaded blue shell, even though it's actually one of Bowser's cronies this time around. Number 87. Remember the part of the race where Mario flies off the track of Rainbow Road only to land back on the track at a lower level? That's a reference to a famous Rainbow Road shortcut in Mario Kart 64. Number 88. Speaking of, a number of the racers have 64 on their helmets in reference to Mario Kart 64 as well as the Nintendo 64 console in general. Number 89. At the end of the race, Mario and Bowser get swallowed by a giant eel known as a Mare. While it's appeared a number of times in a number of different games, the Mare first debuted in Super Mario 64. Number 90. For Bowser and Peach's would-be wedding, while Bowser is not dressed fully to the nines like in Super Mario Odyssey, he is still wearing the same top hat from the game. Number 91. Among the wedding guests, you can see other classic Mario villains like King Boo from Luigi's Mansion and even King Bob-omb from bob -omb Battlefield in Super Mario 64. Number 92. 
The Super Mario Bros. movie originally had a planned release date of December 21st, 2022, but it was pushed back to April 7th, 2023. Number 93. Eventually, the release date was bumped forward a few days, releasing in the United States on April 5th, 2023. Number 94. The actors of the Mario movie dressed their best for the premiere. Chris Pratt and Charlie Day wore coordinated red and green suits. Anya Taylor-Joy rocked Peach's pink biker gear, while Jack Black donned a customized Bowser-themed suit, complete with a spiky shell on the back. Number 95. Other countries saw the Mario movie released on later dates, such as April 26th in South Korea, April 28th in Japan, and even as late as May 26th in Poland. Number 96. Since its initial release, the Super Mario Bros. movie has pulled in a bunch of cash. As of April 16th, the film grossed $353 million in US and Canada, and nearly $693 million total around the world. Number 97. After one week, the Mario movie became the highest grossing movie of 2023. So far. Number 98. Also, the movie became the highest grossing video game adaptation of all time, beating out Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Warcraft. Number 99. While the details of the deal between Nintendo and Universal aren't fully known, both companies co-financed the movie, so they must both be happy with the Mario movie's performance. Number 100. As far as other Nintendo movies go, given the film's success, a sequel is all but inevitable. In 2021, Nintendo's current president, Shuntaro Furukawa, said Nintendo would be interested if the Mario movie was a success. Number 101. We may even get a direct Mario sequel. The post credit scene drops a major hint that Yoshi is on the way, complete with his trademark green spotted egg. Number 102. We even see a herd of Yoshis in the movie proper, although the classic green Yoshi we know and love is conspicuously absent. Number 103. A few of the actors are down for spin-offs too. Seth Rogen has said that there's plenty of opportunity for a Donkey Kong spin-off comparing the Kong's family tree to the Fast and Furious franchise and its emphasis on family. Number 104. Charlie Day is also keen to return as Luigi. He said he'd love nothing more than to have a standalone Luigi's Mansion movie. Number 105. And it's no surprise that Jack Black is willing to return as Bowser, but perhaps not as the villain. Jack Black actually floated the idea that Wario would be the villain of the next movie, and that Bowser and Mario would be forced to team up. Number 106 and Jack Black even threw out a name as a possible Wario, Pedro Pascal. Number 107. At this point, there's no telling if a Mario sequel is in the works though. Chris Melodandry has been pretty quiet, only saying that the team was more focused about the current Mario movie than what would come next. Well, with the buzz that this latest Mario movie has created, I doubt that we'll have to wait another 30 years for the next one. At least, I hope. Next up is the absolute number one box office grossing movie of the year. Hi Barbie. 2023 was especially pink and disco influenced thanks to Hasbro's smash hit. It's looking like a lot more toy themed movies are coming down the pipe too, although I'm not so sure they can capture lightning in a bottle quite like Greta Gerwig. Only time will tell. For now, it's time for 107 facts about Barbie. Number 1. Barbie was released on July 21st, 2023. It's a fresh take on the iconic Barbie franchise, bringing the beloved character to life in a way that's never been seen before. Number 2. The film is directed by Greta Gerwig, an acclaimed filmmaker known for her unique and particularly feminist storytelling. Number 3. The screenplay was co-written by Gerwig and her partner and fellow director, Noah Baumbach. This dynamic duo has previously collaborated on critically acclaimed films like Frances Ha and Mistress America. Number 4. Barbie herself, aka Stereotypical Barbie, is played by Margot Robbie. Robbie is an Academy Award nominated actress known for her roles in films like The Wolf of Wall Street and I, Tanya. I wonder if they're stocking Stereotypical Barbies on the shelves at Toys R Us now. Number 5. There's a moment in the film that pokes fun at Margot Robbie's Hollywood looks, where Barbie wonders if she's pretty, and the frame freezes while the narrator makes a note to the filmmakers. Margot Robbie is not the actress to get this point across. Number 6. Margot Robbie had one special request for Greta Gerwig. She wanted a slide for Barbie's house that would go from her bedroom to her swimming pool. This did indeed make it into the movie. Number 7. Barbie was produced by Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap Entertainment, along with Mattel Films. Number 8. 
Mattel Films was previously known as Mattel Playground Productions and largely produced animated content based on their toy properties. Number 9. Mattel Playground Productions did make a live-action toy movie prior to Barbie. In 2016, a Max Steel flick hit theaters. This was their final production before being absorbed into Mattel Creations and then made into Mattel Films. Number 10. The Barbie Movie is the first live-action film in the Barbie franchise. Number 11. If you're looking for more Barbie action, don't worry. There are 30 animated films based on the Pretty in Pink doll. Number 12. The film is set in a fictional city called Barbie Land, and everything is just as pink and perfect as you'd expect. Every Barbie has her own dream house, jam-packed with enough furniture, clothing, and accessories to last a lifetime of plastic playtime. Number 13. Barbie Land is essentially an alternate dimension. The settings and characters are incredibly detailed and visually engaging, but they also create a very Twilight Zone-esque uncanny valley feel, where not everything is as it seems. Number 14. The dream houses showcased in the movie take their inspiration from the era Barbie was first introduced, the 1950s. Stereotypical Barbie's house can be found on a suburban cul-de-sac, a pretty classic representation of the American dream that was so popular at the time. Number 15. Actors had to wear sneaky harnesses and wires while inhabiting their dream houses. These structures were built without walls to add to the dollhouse illusion, and so the crew was sometimes worried about actors falling out of the houses during takes. Number 16. The Barbie dream houses in the movie were over 25 feet high. Margot Robbie did all of her own stunts, including jumping from the top of the house. So graceful. Number 17. The rest of the houses, including their furniture, were very functional though. The actors playing Barbies and Kens would just hang out on the old school furniture between takes. Number 18. Not everything is perfect though. Most of the stuff in Barbie Land is scaled to look like the actual toys rather than be fit for human use. An example of this has to be Barbie's Corvette, which is a little too small for Margot Robbie, but boy does she look like a doll in a toy car. Number 19. Barbie Land mostly gets by without green screen, too. Pretty much everything you see on screen is handmade. The backdrops are old school matte paintings made to look like old soundstage musicals. Number 20. The lighting and artificial feel of Barbie Land were inspired by The Truman Show. Director Greta Gerwig consulted with Peter Weir, the director of The Truman Show, to achieve the desired effect. Number 21. While proving himself as the number one beach guy, Ryan Gosling's Ken tries to go surfing and finds out the hard way that everything is painted in. Number 22. No solid black or white colors were used in any of the Barbie Land set designs. The production team had multiple meetings about the different shades of pink they would include in their shots. Number 23. Barbie pink is a very specific pink. To be precise, it's Pantone 219, and Barbie used so much of it during production that it contributed to a worldwide shortage of pink paint. Number 24. The Barbie ambulance, which rescued Ken after his surfing mishap, was an actual toy that was made to look like a full-sized ambulance. It automatically opens out into an operating room, which is a fully realized special effect on set. Number 25. Barbie Land is actually located in Hertfordshire, England. The film was shot at Warner Bros. Studios Leavesden, where eight stages were transformed into Barbie Land. Number 26. The view outside of the Mattel boardroom in the movie is a hand-painted scenic panorama over 250 feet long. It includes a nod to Warner Bros. and the city of Los Angeles, reminiscent of the Emerald City from The Wizard of Oz. Number 27. The Barbie Land beach scenes were filmed indoors at Warner Bros. Studios Leavesden, while a blizzard was happening outside. Number 28. Nothing ever gets dirty in Barbie Land. Even when the Kens take over and everything starts getting weird, there's no dirt or grime. Number 29. In fact, there isn't grass or gravel either. Ken wears a pair of boxing shoes specifically meant for smooth surfaces, and he never has to worry about coming across different terrain. Number 30. The film features a diverse cast of characters, reflecting the diversity of the real world. This is in line with Mattel's recent efforts to make the Barbie line more inclusive and representative. Number 31. Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling aren't the only Barbie and Ken in the movie. 
Other notable Barbies include Issa Rae, Emma Mackey, Hari Nap, Sharon Rooney, Ritu Arya, and Nicola Kuglin. Number 32. Some additional Kens include Simu Liu, Kingsley Ben-Adir, Nakuti Gatwa, and Scott Evans. Yes, they're all named Barbie or Ken. Number 33. Upon release, the film received positive reviews from critics who have praised its humor, heart, and subversive take on the Barbie franchise. At the time of writing, Barbie sits at an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes and 7.4 out of 10 on IMDb. Number 34. Critical acclaim can only get you so far, though. How about that money? Well, Barbie is also a box office success, earning over $350 million during its first weekend in theaters. Number 35. The cash just keeps rolling in, too. Barbie has now made over $1 billion in box office sales. Number 36. With these huge numbers, Greta Gerwig is now the first solo female director to cross the billion dollar mark. There are only a few movies co-directed by women that have earned more. Frozen, Frozen 2, and Captain Marvel. Number 37. Ryan Gosling plays the role of Ken in the film. According to Gosling, he accepted the role after seeing his daughter's Ken doll lying face down in the mud next to a squished lemon. He took a picture of the doll and lemon and sent it to Greta Gerwig, saying, I shall be your Ken. His story must be told. Ken was written specifically for Ryan Gosling. Greta Gerwig said, we wrote this part specifically for him. Even though he's so wonderful in dramatic roles, I knew he was really funny as I had watched all his Saturday Night Live appearances. There was no plan B, it was always Ryan. Number 39. Margot Robbie also shared the same sentiment, saying Ryan ticked all the boxes. She also called him a brilliant actor who could do romance and comedy well. She continued on to say, you'd think there are dozens of guys that could play Ken, but there's actually not. And of course, he also looks like Ken. He's gorgeous. Number 40. Michael Sarah plays Ken's buddy, Alan. The Alan doll was introduced in 1964, with a major selling point being that all of Ken's clothes fit him. Number 41. Alan, after having mostly nothing to do while movie, decides to whip out some kick-ass moves while trying to escape Barbie Land. Who would have thought? Number 42. Alan's girlfriend turned wife, Midge, also appears in the film, played by Emerald Fennel. Both characters were canonically married in 1990 with the Wedding Day Midge dolls. This doesn't seem to be the case in the movie, though. Number 43. The song I'm Just Ken was written by composer Mark Ronson largely as a joke, and he recorded a demo for Gerwig, not seriously expecting it to be included on the soundtrack. However, Gerwig liked the song, and when she shared it with Ryan Gosling, he felt so strongly that it added to the character of Ken that he successfully advocated for it to be made into a musical number for the film. Number 44. The font used in the film is based on the font that was used for all Barbie dolls, products, and merchandise from 1975 to 1991. The Barbie logo usually undergoes a makeover for each generation, and this film is no exception. Number 45. The film is filled with deep Barbie cuts, and equally deep commentary on the transition from girlhood to womanhood. The final scenes are not only emblematic of the film's lighthearted and comedic approach to complex topics, but also perfectly encapsulate Barbie's metaphorical journey into womanhood. Number 46. The final scene of the film has Barbie introducing herself as Barbara Handler, seeking an appointment with a gynecologist. This is a callback to one of the first scenes in the real world, where Barbie and Ken specifically distinguish themselves as different from real people because they don't have genitals. Number 47. Barbie's new identity, Barbara Handler, combines the last name of her creator, Ruth Handler, and the first name of Ruth's daughter, the same daughter who was the original inspiration for Barbie. Number 48. The very first scene of the movie, which just so happens to be the first glimpse of Barbie we got way back when the first teaser dropped, parodies 2001 A Space Odyssey. Little girls play the part of monkeys, and a giant Margot Robbie replaces the ominous monolith. Number 49. The swimsuit chosen for Barbie in the film is almost identical to the one sported by the very first Barbie doll. Black and white stripes never go out of style. Number 50. Barbie also wore this iconic swimsuit on the cover of a very controversial Sports Illustrated ad with a caption that read, I belong here. Bold. Number 51. The Matrix gets a quick and foot-focused shout-out when Kate McKinnon's weird Barbie offers the choice between knowing the truth, 
Birkenstocks, or returning to her old life, heels. Barbie wants to wake up in her bed and believe whatever she believes, but Weird Barbie wants to show her how deep the rabbit hole goes. Number 52. Barbie features a cameo by Anne Roth, an Academy Award-winning costume designer who worked with Greta Gerwig in the film White Noise. She plays the older woman who Barbie sits down beside at a bus stop. Number 53. The film approaches its climax with a powerful monologue by Gloria, played by America Ferreira, discussing the impossible standards of being a woman. Each impossible standard she mentions can be imagined forming one of the Barbies that we've met in Barbie Land in this movie. Number 54. Ryan Gosling, who plays Ken, wore a Chanel onesie in one of the scenes. This was his first time wearing a onesie from the luxury brand. Number 55. Gosling's physique in the film is all real, no CGI involved. Hopefully the lack of genitals wasn't achieved for real. Number 56. The film was shot in London, a location that Margot Robbie particularly enjoys. She praised the level of craftsmanship in England, saying it's unparalleled and that the best of the best exists there. Number 57. Despite its popularity, the Barbie movie does not feature the original Barbie Girl song by Aqua. Instead, fans were treated to a chopped and screwed version of the tune called Barbie World. It featured Nicki Minaj, who herself has a storied history with Barbie and Ice Spice. Number 58. Aqua's late 90s hit wasn't originally going to be included in the movie at all. There's a long history of legal battles between the band and Mattel, which culminated in a kiss and make up moment where Mattel used their own version of Barbie Girl in an ad for a new line of dolls. Number 59. It doesn't look like Aqua forbade Mattel from using their song, nor like any bad blood remains between the two. It just looks like Gerwig and the rest of the creative team found a new way to implement the song into the movie. Number 60. Barbie's car was operated by a remote-controlled transmitter. Just like any kid out there who plays with Barbie, Margot Robbie's Barbie was able to drive hands-free around the set thanks to a member of the SFX team sitting in a custom-built chair and using VR drone technology. Number 61. You gotta keep the car juiced up though. The Flamingo mailbox outside Barbie's dream house doubles as an electric charging station for Barbie's car. Number 62. The song that everyone sings while leaving Barbie land in the pink Corvette is Closer to Fine by the Indigo Girls. Number 63. Margot Robbie instituted a mandatory pink day on the Barbie set. Inspired by the movie Mean Girls, every Wednesday the crew was encouraged to wear something pink. Everyone got involved and took it very seriously. If someone didn't wear the playful pigment, Robbie would collect fines and donate them to charity. Number 64. Emma Mackey was cast in Barbie as a look-alike joke. Margot Robbie told BuzzFeed that she gets mistaken for Mackey often, and that Barbie almost contained a joke about how they both look alike, but the idea was scrapped. Number 65. The Barbie dance party sequence includes specific dance elements from Busby Berkeley's Gold Diggers, one of Greta Gerwig's favorite films. Number 66. Over 30 individual hobby horses were made for the Kens in the movie. Each one was handmade and given its own individual characteristics by the art department. Number 67. Greta Gerwig referenced Midnight Cowboy to illustrate how she wanted them to appear. Number 68. Will Ferrell's character in the Barbie movie is simply named Mattel CEO. His name is never revealed. Number 69. His other Mattel executives are also named as such. There's Mattel executives 1 and 2, as well as young Mattel executive and an even younger Mattel employee. Number 70. When Barbie observes a session of the Barbie Land Supreme Court, Margot Robbie is wearing a vintage Chanel suit that had previously been worn by model and actress Claudia Schiffer. Number 71. Margot Robbie's Barbie never wears any rings on her fingers, a nod to the classic toy having fingers that are connected and therefore don't accommodate rings. Number 72. The Kens in the movie share one thing in common apart from their adoration of Barbie. Body waxing. As director Greta Gerwig explained to them on numerous occasions, Kens are not mammals, they're dolls. Number 73. The cast and crew of Barbie have 50 Academy Award nominations between them, including ones for Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, and a total of 8 Oscar wins. Number 74. The film's soundtrack includes music from several artists, including Dua Lipa, Charlie XCX, Ava Max, Carol G, Lizzo, and even Ryan Gosling. Number 75. 
Dua Lipa plays a mermaid Barbie in the movie, and even cavorts with a Ken that I couldn't see. Weird. This is a John Cena joke. Number 76. The Barbie soundtrack is also available on vinyl, with limited edition colorways to boot. Is it really Barbie if it's not available in hot pink? Number 77. Ryan Gosling claims that he doesn't remember much about performing I Am Ken due to being exposed to high levels of bleach. Number 78. The movie is filled with dolls straight from the toy aisle. We've got Postal Worker Barbie, Malibu Barbie, President Barbie, Astrophysicist Barbie, Supreme Court Justice Barbie, Author Barbie, Writer Barbie, Reporter Barbie, and even several Mermaid Barbies, all of which are based on actual Barbie dolls. Number 79. There are characters like Weird Barbie, played by Kate McKinnon, who may not be an officially licensed Barbie doll, but is certainly one of the ones we remember the most. This is the Barbie that most people grew up with, that got played with a little too hard, and now looks like Cynthia from Rugrats. Number 80. Weird Barbie is actually now getting her own limited edition run of dolls, complete with a hot pink outfit, face markings, and cut and colored hair. Way to go, Kate. Number 81. There are other oft-forgotten and usually ill-advised Barbies featured in the movie as well. Barbie Video Girl, with a TV attached to her back, is particularly memorable. Number 82. Growing up Skipper also makes an appearance, with some, uh, realistic parts. This is a fascinating example of corporate creativity gone awry. Number 83. Alan isn't the only odd duck Ken either. Sugar Daddy Ken and Earring Magic Ken are both based on real dolls that actually existed. Whoever was in charge there definitely didn't realize the market they were appealing to. Number 84. Earring Magic Ken was actually quite popular with the gay community at the time, and the dolls sold out immediately. The earring is one thing, sure, but the necklace this particular Ken came bundled with reminded a lot of people of a, how do you say, a marital aid that was popular with young men in the rave scene in the 90s. Number 85. The film features a pooping plastic dog. A shout out to Tanner, a toy dog who actually did poop out little pellets. Ew. The Tanner line was recalled in 2007 after it was found that kids were swallowing the magnets used in the pooper scooper. Yum. Magnets. Number 86. The pregnant Barbie Midge makes an appearance too. She was discontinued after parents became concerned that she would encourage teen pregnancy. Number 87. Everything in Barbie Land functions as if it's part of a playset. There's no actual water in the cups and the showers or even on the beach. The doll's movements are restricted in specific ways too, which is why Alan can't get over that fence in that one scene. Number 88. Barbie and Ken don't even lock lips when they're supposed to kiss. Being made of plastic, the best they can do is smush their static faces as close together as possible, which is exactly what they emulate in the one attempt at a kissing scene. Number 89. The film features several direct metaphors that give this film the unique Barbie feel where everything is just one frightening degree away from perfect. For example, Barbie's waterless cold shower moment or even when Will Ferrell tries to literally put her into a box. Number 90. The film features plenty of Easter eggs from past playsets, including ice cream stands, the roller disco, and Barbie's glam pool. Number 91. The Chelsea Doll Treehouse is pretty much remade in its entirety as another one of the Barbie dream houses in the movie. Number 92. The set where Barbie meets Ruth Handler for the first time is reminiscent of the very first Barbie dream house playset. Number 93. The shops in town aren't actual playsets, but they still bring a unique life to Barbie's world. She drives past a perfect hair salon referencing her flawless hair. Number 94. Barbie also passes a candy store early in the film with the title misspelled, which is a reference to one of Barbie's dogs, Candy. More on that misspelling in a minute. Number 95. The journey from Barbie land to the real world felt incredibly similar to the one taken by Buddy the Elf in the movie Elf. Isn't it funny how Will Ferrell makes an appearance in both? Number 96. When the Barbies throw their goodbye party, they put up a really long banner to see their stereotypical friend off. If you look closely, it reads, Bon voyage to reality and good luck with restoring the membrane between our world and theirs so you don't get cellulite. Specificity is key, folks. Number 97. As Barbie departs Barbie Land, you can see a Warner Brothers water tower off in the desert. Isn't that also in the Animaniacs? Number 98. When Barbie and Ken get arrested in the real world, Ken's placard simply reads, and Ken. Number 99. 
Barbie Land has its own Mount Rushmore. Breezing past the colonial implications that this brings to the table, the four heads depicted here belong to the first Barbie, original Barbie from 1959, the first black Barbie, original Christy from 1968, the first Asian Barbie, Oriental Barbie from 1981, and the first Latina Barbie, California Dream Teresa from 1987. Number 100. This Hokage rock is forever changed when Ken takes over though. He replaces all of these barrier-breaking Barbies with images of horses. Number 101. Ken's obsession with horses is, of course, inextricably linked to masculinity, but there's one horse reference you may have missed. Ken's huge fur coat is modeled after one worn by Sylvester Stallone, aka the Italian Stallion. Number 102. Barbie has a tiny copy of Moby Dick on her side table, but how does she read it? Number 103. Amy Schumer was originally supposed to create a Barbie movie of her very own. Eventually, she backed out, citing creative differences with Sony, who had the rights at the time. Number 104. The scene where Barbie steps out of her pink puffball high heels to reveal that classically impossible Barbie foot posture actually features Margot Robbie's feet. No special effects, just some double-sided tape, a support bar, and a dream. Number 105. As King of the Beach, Ryan Gosling received a beach-themed present on the daily from Margot Robbie. Each one came in a pink package with a bow and would be addressed from Barbie to Ken. He had quite the collection of sun and sand inspired objects by the end of filming. Number 106. There are no elements in Barbie Land. No water, no air, no fire, no earth. The Avatar would be ashamed. Number 107. Additionally, there is no writing in Barbie Land. Seriously, take a closer look at anything that looks like it might have a decipherable language on it next time you give it a watch. It's all gibberish. And with that, it's all wrapped up in a nice pink bow. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was really cool too, although it left a lot of folks a little dissatisfied thanks to a major cliffhanger. The sequel being unfortunately delayed stung too. But hey, Miles Morales' tale will be getting a definitive ending relatively soon, and we will learn the fate of the Spider-Verse at large. So you better study up with our 107 Facts video. Number 1. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is a sequel to the Oscar-winning animated film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. But you already knew that, didn't you? Number 2. Speaking of things that you already knew, this film features a massive amount of Easter eggs. There's plenty for fans to spot and enjoy, and you're probably here to see all the ones you missed. Never fear, we've got plenty. Number 3. The film features over 200 different spider people. In the face of potentially infinite spider people, that doesn't seem too impressive, but come on, having 200 in one movie is pretty cool. Number 4. The film opens with a logo of the Comics Code Authority, a nod to the organization that regulated comic books from 1954 to 2011. This logo was also present in the opening credits of the first film, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Number 5. The film catches us up on what Gwen Stacy, voiced by Haley Steinfeld, has been up to since the last film. Gwen's universe has a watercolor aesthetic and is very stylistically similar to Robbie Rodriguez's original comics. Number 6. Speaking of Gwen Stacy and her universe, she drums in a band called the Mary Chains. Ha! Number 7. We get a deeper look at Gwen's universe's version of Peter Parker, who turns himself into the Lizard. The two go head to head, and Gwen, not realizing that the Lizard is actually her best friend, ends up being unable to stop Peter's death. Number 8. J.K. Simmons reprises his iconic role as J. Jonah Jameson, Spider-Man's harshest critic, not to mention editor extraordinaire in multiple variants across the Spider-Verse. Number 9. JJJ seems to function a little differently than Spider-Man when existing across multiple universes. It's always J.K. Simmons. Number 10. The film introduces Yuri Watanabe, a police lieutenant who is a regular face in various Spider-Man storylines. In the comics, Yuri eventually adopts the alter ego of Wraith. Number 11. An old-school Italian Renaissance variant of the Vulture makes a very stylish appearance. Number 12. Renaissance Vulture doesn't get to stick around long though, as Spider-Man 2099 arrives to take care of him. 2099, aka Miguel O'Hara, is voiced by Oscar Isaac. Number 13. 
2099 originates from Spider-Man 2099 and is pretty different than classic Spider-Man. He became super-powered while trying to cure his addiction to a drug he was tricked into taking and had half of his DNA reprogrammed into spider mode. This gave him super strength and speed, but no spider sense. He can also see in the dark and has fangs. Number 14. 2099 is assisted by his own personal AI known as Lila. Not Rocket Raccoon's soulmate, but Lyrate Lifeform Approximation. Number 15. Across the Spider-Verse also premieres the first big screen appearance of Jessica Drew, also known as Spider-Woman, voiced by Issa Rae. Number 16. Drew gets some serious badass points on merit of her being pregnant while fighting crime and also having a sweet motorcycle. Number 17. Drew's comics counterpart is a few degrees of Kevin Bacon away from the high evolutionary. Her father was a research partner of said Guardian's Big Bad and managed to develop a spider serum to help her recover from a childhood illness although she did get put into one of the High Evolutionary's accelerator tubes. Number 18. Her powers in the comics are a little odd, too. She uses bioelectricity, can glide in the air, and also uses pheromones to control the men in her immediate vicinity. Didn't get to see any of that in the movie. Number 19. Spider-Man 2099 drops a little No Way Home reference, lamenting and don't get me started about Doctor Strange and the nerd from Earth 199999. Seems like Peter and Strange caused some real issues in the Spider-Verse with that whole conundrum. Number 20. When 2099 rips off one of the Vulture's wings, the villain pulls a new wing from a pocket dimension. This makes 2099 a little exasperated as he mentions Hammer Space. Number 21. What's Hammer Space? Well, think about characters, often cartoons, who seem to have an infinite supply of invisible and impossible storage space. Pulling a comically large hammer out of a teensy tiny pocket, dropping an anvil that materialized out of nowhere out of someone's head. It's not fully explained, but it does have a fun moment in the sun. Number 22. Genke, Miles' roommate, is seen playing the 2018 Spider-Man game from Insomniac in PlayStation Studios, which is funny because he's also a character in that game, too. I wonder if he noticed. Number 23. The Spot, voiced by Jason Schwartzman, is introduced as the main villain for the Spider-Verse trilogy. Number 24. The Spot, aka Jonathan Owen, is a high-ranking employee at Alchemax, who brought the spider that bit Miles into their universe while testing Kingpin and Olivia Octavius' collider from the first film. Number 25. The Spot also got his powers thanks to Miles Morales, although he doesn't seem too thankful for them. When Miles destroyed the Super Collider, Owen was the one caught in the explosion and mutated into the villain we now see in the movie. Number 26. The Spot has the power to create his namesake Spots, which are essentially little black holes in space. These can be used to travel between dimensions or to teleport himself and objects throughout space. Number 27. He even makes a fun little reference to another Spider-Man villain by claiming that he's got the power of the multiverse in the palm of his hand. Doc Ock would be proud. Number 28. The Spot hops between many different universes, which is an absolute treasure trove of easter eggs. One verse the Spot visits is reminiscent of Spider-Man's first ever appearance in the Amazing Fantasy comics. Number 29. Another quick verse appears to be made entirely of Legos, which could be a lot of fun to see happen. I wonder if Emmett has ever run into a Lego Spider-Man. Number 30. One more fun verse-hopping easter egg for now. The Spot also comes face to face with Eddie Brock's friend and convenience store owner Mrs. Chen from the Venom films. Number 31. We get to visit Earth 50101, which is the home of Pavitra Prabhakar, aka Spider-Man India. This universe is a tribute to the Indian comic book series Spider-Man India that debuted in 2004. Number 32. Pav didn't get his powers through a scientifically altered spider bite. Instead, an ancient mystical yogi gave him the powers of a spider. Number 33. Spider-Man India is voiced by Karin Sony. You might recognize his voice from another Marvel product, too. Sony also plays the recurring character Topinder in the Deadpool movies. There's also a universe where Spider-Man's a cowboy, a nod to the comic book series Weird Western Tales. Number 35. And on that note, let's shine a spotlight on some of the alternate Spider-Men and the comics they likely come from that we see in the background during the movie, rapid fire style, starting with Samurai Spider-Man. This one has a pretty wicked action figure from Bondi and might be a nod to the Five Ronin series, although that features Wolverine, Hulk, The Punisher, Psylocke, and Deadpool, not Spidey. Number 36. 
Then there's Bag Spider-Man. This is more of a one-off, but it does exist in the comics. Spider-Man ditched the symbiote suit and is given a spare costume by the Human Torch, complete with a paper bag to complete the anonymity. Number 37. Hark. Medieval Knight Spider-Man makes a quick appearance. This version could be pulled from the Marvel Medieval Universe where Spidey is an armored knight with blades in his wrists instead of webs. Or maybe even Peter Parkwa from Marvel 1602. Number 38. Get your bananas ready as Monkey Spider-Man from Marvel Apes has a moment in the sun too. Number 39. If you spend a lot of time looking at different types of G-pens and ink, you might have noticed the Mangaverse Spider-Man swinging about. This version of Peter Parker is a member of the Ninja Spider Clan and has ninja training to augment his spider powers. Number 40. Remember Peter Parker's high school bully, Eugene Flash Thompson? Well, in an alternate universe, he is bitten by a radioactive spider of his very own and becomes Captain Spider. He's got most of the same powers as Spider-Man, but he never develops web shooters. You can tell it's not regular Spider-Man by the shock of ginger hair poking out of the top of the mask. And you can see that ginger hair make a guest appearance in this movie. Number 41. Of course, Werewolf Spider-Man makes his own appearance. Number 42. In another wild canon event, we meet the superior Spider-Man. This version of Spidey witnessed the demise of Peter Parker and is actually Otto Octavius taking up the mantle of Friendly and Neighborhood. He's the superior Spider-Man though, don't get it twisted. Number 43. The six-armed, mindless, monstrous doppelganger Spider-Man shows up as well. Number 44. There's a Titan Spider-Man taking after the race Thanos belongs to. Number 45. We see another alternate Spider-Man make an appearance from a universe where Uncle Ben never bites the dust. Armored Spider-Man becomes a billionaire and a jerk and thinks he's better than everyone. Although he can shoot lasers, so I guess that does make him better than most. Number 46. Who says superheroes can't get dressed up? Dapper Spider-Man makes an appearance and looks good doing it. Number 47. Antiheroes and foils get a chance to briefly shine here too as Kane Parker, aka the Scarlet Spider, makes a quick appearance. Kane was originally a villain, a clone gone wrong, that wanted to take out some of his anger on the world, but eventually redeemed himself. Number 48. Similar to Mystique, there is a shape-shifting Spider-Man, which brings up a lot of questions as to how this Spidey would handle his crime fighting. Number 49. Briefly spotted in trailers, too, Cyborg Spider-Woman makes her debut in Across the Spider-Verse. This hulking, metallic spider variant sports an enormous arm cannon and is pretty darn intimidating. There was an action figure released by Hasbro ahead of time, too. Number 50. Insomniac's video game Spider-Man show up too. Number 51. Spider-Rex, a Tyrannosaurus Rex version of our hero pops in for a visit. Yes, that is real. He got his powers from a meteorite filled with spiders. Look it up. Number 52. And of course, Peter Parked Car is in Across the Spider-Verse. He's an anthropomorphic vehicle similar in style to Lightning McQueen and should be taken very seriously. Number 53. Back to some more quote-unquote normal spider variants, we catch a glimpse of Lady Spider, who hails from a steampunk universe. She's got some spider arms sticking out of her back, and she's pretty darn cool. Number 54. Did you catch Spider-Man Unlimited? Because he's here too. Only 90s kids remember. Number 55. Spider-Man 1967 makes his way onto the big screen as well. Only 60s kids remember. He's got the best theme song too. Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Number 56. Mary Jane herself makes an appearance as a kind of Spider-Man, walking around with all of the other spider folks. This time, she's wearing her spinneret costume from Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, where she and Peter are a crime-fighting couple. Number 57. Sun Spider, aka Charlotte Weber, shows up too. This spider person has Ehlers Denlos Syndrome and often uses crutches or a wheelchair, even when donning her spider suit. Number 58. A professional wrestler Spider-Man takes to the ring, referencing Spider-Man's origin story, where he initially uses his powers to become a professional wrestler before becoming a superhero. To be honest, that's an equally awesome career. Number 59. 
It's not just spider people seeing the limelight, some spider tech makes the cut as well. Spider Armor Mark III, designed by Peter Parker as a last resort against the Sinister Six, makes an appearance in the movie too. Number 60. Now we can take a look at some of these spider people with more substantial roles, as well as well-known voice actors. Let's start with Spider-Punk, aka Hobie Brown, who is voiced by Daniel Kaluuya. He makes his big screen debut as a fascist fighting anti-establishment spider person, appearing as he does in his own comic series. Number 61. Spider-Bite, aka Margot Kess, is played by Amanda Stenberg and comes from a universe where the majority of people's time is spent in virtual reality. She's all about stopping cybercrime. You might recognize her voice as Stenberg also played Rue in The Hunger Games. Number 62. The Scarlet Spider is voiced by none other than Andy Samberg of The Lonely Island, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and more. His secret identity is Ben Riley, the clone of Peter Parker from the controversial Clone Saga arc of the 90s. Number 63. Donald Glover makes a cameo in the film as a live-action version of The Prowler. Glover previously had a small role in Spider-Man Homecoming as the Prowler's alter ego, but this is the first time he's appeared in full costume. Number 64. The film includes footage from different Spider-Man universes during a scene explaining the concept of canon events. These are occurrences that happen in every Spider-Man's timeline, like loved ones dying. Footage from The Amazing Spider-Man is shown, with Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker witnessing the death of Captain George Stacy. Number 65. In addition to Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire's Web Slinger from Sony's original trilogy also appears. In the same canon event, Maguire's Peter Parker loses his Uncle Ben in the tragic scene from the first Spider-Man. Number 66. The Spectacular Spider-Man, a beloved yet short-lived animated series that ran on Kids WB on CW and Disney XD for two seasons makes a return in Across the Spider-Verse. Josh Keaton reprises his voice role briefly in the Spider Society headquarters. Number 67. The adorable wild child of Peter B. Parker, Mayday Parker, is an early version of Spider-Girl from the comics. However, she's just a baby for now, who for some reason has her own web shooters. Thanks, Peter. Number 68. A couple of villainous plushes can be spotted in Mayday's crib. Cartoony, cozy versions of the Green Goblin and a masked octopus, probably referencing Olivia Octavius, are there to comfort the tiny hero when it's time for bed. Number 69. Marvel and Sony have hinted that Mayday Parker may eventually get developed into her own Spider-Girl film series probably focused on when she's no longer a baby, but who knows? I'd watch a spider baby movie just to see what happens. Number 70. Want some more? One of these Spider Society members is Metro Spider-Man, a version of Spider-Man voiced by record producer Metro Boomin. Metro Boomin also produced the soundtrack for Across the Spider-Verse. Number 71. Penny Parker, having been a major Spider-Verse character in Into the Spider-Verse, briefly returns. Number 72. Penny comes back with a brand new Spider-Bot, which looks almost exactly like the version of SPDR seen in the original Marvel comics. Number 73. Spider-Cop makes an appearance in Across the Universe 2. You might recognize him from the Insomniac Spider-Man game where Spider-Man often pretends to be a grizzled detective while talking to police captain Yuri Watanabe. Number 74. We also meet Spider-Cat. This feline hero attacks Miles, shooting webs like hairballs. This could be the Spider-Cat of Earth-999 from the original comics, but it could also be the masked Spider-Cat featured in Insomniac Spider-Man Miles Morales game. Somebody double check with Genke, he probably knows. Number 75. Where would any Spider-Man be without some villains though? Across the Spider-Verse showcases a wide variety of well-known and lesser-known ne'er-do-wells from all across the multiverse, most of whom are shown in the Spider Society jail. The spot was elevated to arch-nemesis status in this movie, but others like Grizzly are still shown to be as ineffectual as ever. Number 76. Miles runs into a classic villain of the week, Armadillo, on his way home on the subway. Number 77. Craven the Hunter, one of Spidey's most legendary foes, is locked up here, no doubt waiting for an opportunity opportunity to pursue the most dangerous game once again. Number 78. Mysterio, a rival of Peter Porker's, is also in jail here, but definitely doesn't inspire the same kind of awe that Craven does. Number 79. Even harder to place are Video Man and Typeface, both so silly that it's hard to believe that they made it into the movie at all. But hey, if you're gonna go for a deep cut, you might as well make it deep. Number 80. 
every new version of Spider-Man was introduced with a personal origin narration beginning with, let's do this one last time. However, Across the Spider-Verse shifts gears with a deeper dive into Spider-Gwen's history with the opener, let's do things differently. Number 81. The directors, Joaquim Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson have a rich history in animation. Dos Santos is known for his work on Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. Powers co-directed and co-wrote Soul, and Thompson was the production designer for the first Spider-Verse film. Number 82. The directors wanted to push the boundaries of animation even further in Across the Spider-Verse. They aimed to create a unique visual experience that would stand out from other animated films. Number 83. The film blends both 2D and 3D elements. This hybrid approach is part of what gives Spider-Verse films their distinctive look. Number 84. The animation team used an old-school animation technique called smearing, which involves stretching an object or character along the direction of movement to create the illusion of motion. Number 85. Unsurprisingly, Across the Spider-Verse was inspired by the work of comic book artists. The directors wanted to make the film feel like a comic book come to life, complete with panel-like framing and text boxes. Number 86. Each universe has its own distinct color scheme, helping to differentiate them visually. Which universe is your favorite? Number 87. The film's soundtrack features a mix of genres, reflecting the diverse range of characters and universes in the Spider-Verse. Number 88. The film's sound design plays a crucial role, too. From the sounds of web-slinging to the unique noises of each universe, the sound team worked hard to create an immersive auditory experience. Number 89. The film's production was a global effort, with animators and artists working from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This remote collaboration was a new experience for many on the team. Number 90. The film's script went through numerous drafts before settling on a final version. The writers wanted to ensure that the story was engaging and that each character had their own chance to shine. I'd say they were successful. Number 91. The movie also broke the record for largest animated movie crew, with over 1,000 artists working to bring it to big screens around the world. Number 92. Foam Party, a one-off coffee shop joke from Into the Spider-Verse, makes a return. Miles' dad, Jefferson, decries this cafe for sounding like a disco, and lo and behold, it's still around in the sequel, and is a set piece for a fight between Spider-Man and the Spot. Number 93. In the first Spider-Verse movie, someone comments, I think it's a Banksy, while looking at a multiversal lamppost, referring to the work of the iconic street artist. This line was delivered by Post Malone, and it's heard again in Across the Spider-Verse. Pay attention after the battle with the Da Vinci Vulture at the Guggenheim Art Museum, and you'll hear the exact same line. Number 94. The film features a pointing Spider-Man meme, but taken to its absolute limit. The original meme is from the 1967 Spider-Man animated series, where Spider-Man encounters a villain who impersonates him, leading to a scene where they both point at each other in confusion. Tom Holland, Andrew Garfield, and Tobey Maguire did a similar bit during the production of No Way Home, but this time around we get countless Spider-Man pointing at each other during the movie itself. Number 95. Across the Spider-Verse is the longest American animated film ever made, coming in at 2 hours and 20 minutes. It beat out the previous title holder by just 4 minutes. Number 96. Of course, you can also catch a glimpse of the black-suited symbiote Spider-Man. Number 97. Stan Lee does not have a cameo appearance in Across the Spider-Verse. He played a part in the prequel where he hands Miles his first costume. However, the directors said that they decided it would be macabre and exploitative to include someone who couldn't offer permission anymore. Number 98. Everything Everywhere All at Once is referenced on a billboard too, with the spider vs version of it being titled All of It Always All Over the Place. It even features a bagel. Number 99. There's also a Spider-Man Homecoming reference. In one scene, a billboard can be seen advertising Vulture's Salvage, a nod to the villain Vulture, who was played by Michael Keaton in that film. Number 100. Oscar Isaac plays a whole bunch of different Marvel characters, from Moon Knight to Apocalypse and, of course, 2099. Number 101. Miles is tied to a punching bag at the end of the movie, which could be a reference to Spider-Man's never-ending role as a punching bag for the world around him. Something's gotta go wrong, and he's gotta get punished by something. Number 102. The supporting cast of Into the Spider-Verse makes a triumphant return at the very end of Across the Spider-Verse. Gwen assembles a rescue team to save Miles from Earth-42, which includes Spider-Ham, Spider-Man Noir, and Penny Parker. Number 103. 
After dying in Into the Spider-Verse, a version of Mahershala Ali's Aaron Davis returns near the end of Across the Spider-Verse. But in this Aaron's universe, there was never a spider to bite Miles, and the world has plunged into crime without a Spider-Man. Number 104. Across the Spider-Verse is a critical darling. It currently holds a 96% tomato meter rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Number 105. Audiences are going wild for it too. The audience score is also at a dazzling 96%. Number 106. Of course, the movie has been a major box office success, collecting $120 million in its box office debut. Those numbers are only going up from there. Number 107. After ending on a massive cliffhanger, people are clamoring for more. Across the Spider-Verse will be succeeded by Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, which is currently slated to release on March 29th, 2024. Less than a year, folks. We can do it. And that's a wrap. We swung through the city, jumped into the multiverse, and uncovered 107 amazing facts about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Which 2023 movie features masked crime fighters defending New York City while using comic book style animation and frame rates? Wait, we already talked about Spider-Verse. All right, it's turtle time. Get ready for 107 facts about Mutant Mayhem. Number 1. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem is a reboot of the classic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. That's right, we are starting fresh in the movie theaters after whatever happened in 2013. Number 2. The film is directed by Jeff Rowe, who also co-directed The Mitchells vs. The Machines. If you haven't seen that one, check it out right away. Number 3. The film takes the broad strokes of turtle lore largely for granted, opting for a streamlined introduction to Splinter and his adopted sons. Number 4. Over 550 artists from Micro's animation worked on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Number 5. This massive team was split between Paris and Montreal, with 320 artists in Paris and 230 in Montreal. Number 6. The movie was met with high praise during its work-in-progress screening at the Annecy Festival 2023. The audience's applause was so strong that director Jeff Rowe was brought back into the theater after a six-minute standing ovation. Number 7. Mutant Mayhem stands out for its unique illustrative comic book style of CG animation. The distinct visual approach adds a fresh layer to the iconic franchise. Number 8. Writer-producer Seth Rogen promised that Mutant Mayhem wouldn't have any boring scenes. He describes the movie as crackling with teenage energy, reflecting the youthful spirit of the Turtles. Number 9. In order to capture that sort of teenage energy, the filmmakers drew inspiration from coming-of-age films, one of which we'll talk about in a little bit. Number 10. Ice Cube agreed to voice Superfly because A, he liked the name, and B, because he and his son watch TMNT cartoons. Aww. Number 11. In a departure from the norm of animation, the cast of Mutant Mayhem recorded their voice roles together in groups rather than independently from one another. A single recording session could include up to seven actors. Number 12. This approach allowed the cast to play off each other and employ a lot of improvisation in their performances. Number 13. Seth Rogen compared the film's soundtrack to that of the video game Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. But I didn't hear any Goldfinger. Seth, what's up with that? Number 14. The soundtrack mixes classic hip-hop and other genres, reflecting the Turtles' history and their New York City setting. It includes tracks from artists like DMX, A Tribe Called Quest, and even some Vanilla Ice. Number 15. You heard me right. As the Turtles knock around the Gang of Thieves, the radio of one of the cars begins to play a familiar tune. That song would be the Ninja Rap by Vanilla Ice, which was the infectiously catchy hit song that was created for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, all the way back in 1991. Number 16. The song Anti Up, Robin Hood's Theory by M.O.P. plays during the introduction sequence for the Turtles and makes a triumphant return at the start of the third act as the Turtles, Splinter, April, and other mutants arrive in New York to fight Superfly's bigger mutated form. Number 17. 
The song I Know by De La Soul and Otis Redding is part of the soundtrack and kicks off the beginning of a montage that shows Splinter and the Turtles growing up together. It plays shortly after the new Splinter origin story is featured as the Rat and Turtles dance together. Number 18. The song No Diggity by Blackstreet, Dr. Dre, and Queen Penn is among the most recognizable songs on the soundtrack. The 1996 hip-hop song plays as part of a fighting montage. It can be heard as the Turtles fight various crime families across New York who work for Superfly as they try to get more information about the powerful villain. Number 19. The song Wake Up the Sky by Gucci Mane, Bruno Mars, and Kodak Black begins to play as Superfly's gang shows up for the first time. Bebop and Rocksteady step out of a car and begin playing it on a huge stereo as Superfly's full form is unveiled for the first time. Number 20. The song Shimmy Shimmy Ya yeah by Old Dirty Bastard is heard as the Turtles go to Quantum Lanes with Superfly and the other mutants to hang out. It plays throughout the scene as the characters play games, bowl, and more. Number 21. The song Can I Kick It by A Tribe Called Quest is the last song in the movie. It plays during the very end of the movie as the turtles all go to school for the first time. The song continues to play over the beginning of the credits to close out the movie's soundtrack before Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's score plays over the rest. Number 22. The song Unwritten by Natasha Bedingfield begins to play during a flashback to April puking while doing school announcements. This is a very different song from the majority of the other music featured, but what happens while it plays is also kind of unexpected. Number 23. The song Butter by BTS is performed by Ralph, Leo, and Mikey in an attempt to cheer up Donnie while they're connected to TCRI's milking machine. Unfortunately for Donnie and also other BTS fans, the other turtles don't quite know all the words to the song. Number 24. Speaking of... Uh, milking, that's one of the movie's recurring, perhaps more adult jokes. There is plenty to enjoy for folks who are not teenage, nor mutant, nor ninjas, nor turtles. For example, number 25. Remember He-Man singing What's Going On? What's going on? Yeah, that gets a reference here too. The song What's Up by Four Non Blondes makes a couple of appearances. Number 26. In addition to the soundtrack, the absolute vibe fest of a score was put together by the Oscar-winning Nine Inch Nails team of Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Number 27. The official TMNT Mutant Mayhem soundtrack is not available to stream on music streaming services at the moment. However, Paramount did release an official playlist on Spotify that features 19 songs that either appear on the soundtrack or inspired the movie. Number 28. The visual style of Mutant Mayhem was influenced by a diverse range of films and cinematographers. The filmmakers cited Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, of course. Animation is undergoing some big changes. Number 29. The animation style of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem was a deliberate choice to look less than perfect, reminiscent of doodles a teenager might have done in a notebook during a boring class. The creators wanted the animation to feel distinctly human and not computer generated, which meant it had to be sketchy, imperfect, and misshapen. Just like me. Number 30. The animation style was also a reaction to a 30-year trend in 3D CG animation pushing towards photorealism and hyper-realistic lighting and texturing. Number 31. Production designer Yashar Kasai found working out the sketchy, unfinished style one of the most difficult parts of production. He had to instruct his highly trained artists to peel away all those years they spent in art school learning their craft and draw like their 15 year old selves. Number 32. The emotionally authentic style of animation fell in line with the story they wanted to tell. A coming of age story about teenagers who experience feelings of isolation, loneliness, and awkwardness as they try to find themselves. Plus, they're mutants and also turtles. Number 33. The animation team spent a lot of time diversifying what New York at nighttime looks like and giving it a variety of different color schemes. Number 34. The animation team was also heavily inspired by the late 80s cartoon, the original series, and that really wacky toy line that came out during the early 90s. They were looking back to the time when sophomoric gross-out humor was the comedic style of the day. Number 35. It wasn't just animated flicks that got the turtles where they are. Mutant Madness pulls from Jackie Chan martial arts films like Police Story and Rumble in the Bronx. 
the crime drama Chunking Express, the period film Boogie Nights, and the works of cinematographers Emmanuel Lebesky and Spike Jones as influences. Number 36. Fight scenes in Mutant Mayhem take clear inspiration from the style used in Jackie Chan's movies. For one thing, the fight scenes are incredibly funny and slapstick, and for another, the characters don't stick to just using weapons, but instead rely on found objects to become weapons. Splinter even uses a rolling desk chair to give him an advantage during a fight at TCRI. Number 37. Shredder, a classic villain in the TMNT universe, was originally in the film but was written out. Writer Jeff Rowe wanted the film's villain to be a mutant that shared empathy with the turtles and could easily tempt and corrupt them. Number 38. Nicholas Cantu, known for voicing Gumball Watterson in The Amazing World of Gumball, lends his voice to Leonardo. As the leader of the turtles, Leonardo often has to guide his brothers and keep them out of trouble. Number 39. Raphael, the hot-headed member of the group, is voiced by Brady Noon from the Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Raphael's impulsive nature often lands the turtles in trouble, but his street smarts also help them out of sticky situations. Number 40. Michelangelo, the comic relief of the turtles, is voiced by Shimon Brown Jr. from The Chai. Michelangelo is known for his humor, love of pizza, and his nunchucks. Number 41. Donatello, the brains of the turtles, is voiced by Micah Abbey from Cousins for Life. Donatello prefers to handle things from behind a computer screen, inventing new gadgets to assist the turtles in their crime-fighting endeavors. Number 42. The voice actors for the turtles are actually teenagers themselves. Number 43. Donatello and his voice actor Micah have plenty in common. Donatello is known for his technical genius and inventiveness, which are traits shared with Mr. Abbey, who enjoys cooking, a hobby that requires creativity and precision. Number 44. Micah is not just an actor, but also an athlete. He plays water polo for his high school and has been the captain of his team for two years. Number 45. Micah has a toy poodle who is not only a therapy dog, but also an actress. It seems that talent runs in the family. Number 46. All of the Turtles voice actors are set to reprise their roles as the Turtles in a spin-off Mutant Madness TV series and sequel. Number 47. The Turtles voice actors have their own culinary preferences, not unlike the Turtles' penchant for pizza. Nicholas Cantu enjoys peanut butter sandwiches, Micah Abbey loves pasta alfredo, Shimon Brown Jr. is a fan of spicy chicken sandwiches, and Brady Noon has a penchant for wings. Number 48. Cantu, who voices Leonardo, was recognized by his fellow cast members as being most like his character in real life. They described him as a great role model and a great big brother, much like Leonardo in the film. Number 49. The Turtles' father figure and mentor, Master Splinter, is voiced by action movie icon Jackie Chan. Splinter, once an average rat, was transformed by the ooze and became a master of ninjutsu, passing on his knowledge to the Turtles. Number 50. April O'Neil, a human reporter and longtime ally of the Turtles, is voiced by Ayo Edebiri, known for her performance in The Bear. April assists the Turtles in navigating the world above the New York City sewers. Number 51. The role of Dr. Baxter Stockman, the epitome of a mad scientist, is played by Giancarlo Esposito, known for his villain roles in Breaking Bad and The Mandalorian. Number 52. The iconic henchmen duo, Bebop and Rocksteady, are voiced by Seth Rogen and John Cena, respectively. Bebop, a half-man, half-warthog punk rocker, and Rocksteady, a hulking half-man, half-rhino enforcer, are regulars in the Turtles rogues gallery. Number 53. Bebop's design remains quite faithful to the original, sporting purple punk rock styled hair and shades, piercings, and similar clothing. However, the CG Bebop has a large beer belly and additional piercings not present in the 1987 design. Number 54. Rocksteady's design is also similar to the original, especially his paramilitary inspired outfit. The new design is more animalistic and less humanoid, with a larger and more imposing build. Number 55. Paul Rudd, known for his role as Ant Man, voices Mondo Gecko, a rambunctious skater and occasional henchman. Number 57. 
1996, Mondo Gecko's design updates the 90s skater aesthetic to a more modern influencer aesthetic. The new design is also more gecko-like than the old one. Number 57. Natasia Dimitru, known for her role as Nadia in What We Do in the Shadows, voices a gender-swapped version of the bat mutant wingnut. Number 58. Rose Byrne voices Leatherhead, a mutant crocodile who has both been an enemy and an ally to the turtles. Number 59. Post Malone voices Ray Filet, an aquatic mutant who prefers wet and submerged environments. Posty's getting all up on this new animation trend, especially after being a funny one-off joke in not one, but two Spider-Verse movies. Number 60. Ray Filet's new design is more distinct than the original, with one sewn-up eye and another bulging one concealed by a scuba mask. Number 61. Comedian Hannibal Burress voices Genghis Frog, one of the punk frogs created by Shredder. Number 62. Genghis Frog's new design definitely seems a little more frog-like and less human than the original. Number 63. Ice Cube voices Superfly, who is a seemingly original character for Mutant Mayhem. Number 64. Maya Rudolph voices Cynthia Utrom, a character whose surname hints at the alien species from the Ninja Turtle universe. Number 65. The Utroms are a race of aliens that use TCRI as a front for their activities on Earth. Depending on the continuity, the Utroms are sometimes seeking a way back to their planet, while other times they're looking to take over Earth. Mutant Mayhem doesn't reveal Cynthia Utrom as an alien, but it does seem likely considering her name and her company. Number 66. TCRI, which we learn stands for Techno Cosmic Research Institute at the end of the movie, is an organization that was first seen in motion in the 2003 TMNT animated series. Number 67. When the Turtles make their on-screen debut, they're designed to look a bit more intense than usual. The intro ensemble shot shows the Turtles with no pupils and permanent frowns, before comically revealing them normally as their intense mission is shown to be just getting groceries. Number 68. This intro is a reference to their comic book origins. Their first appearance features a comic accurate design, with their masks having completely whited out eyes. On top of that, the turtles are portrayed as grounded and gritty when first introduced, mocking the tone of the original comics. Number 69. Mutant Mayhem is packed with references and more. For instance, Mikey mocks Leo's serious voice by calling him Batman. It's funny, but the turtles have actually faced Batman in another timeline. How many reptiles can say that? Well, actually, now that I think about it, there's quite a few. Number 70. The most famous crossover has to be the Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic series, as well as the 2019 film Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Number 71. The Turtles decide to catch a movie in the park, and the movie they watch is none other than Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The mutant outcasts are fascinated by Matthew Broderick's lovable and popular teenage hero. Number 72. When the Turtles visit Times Square, they see a cheesy SpongeBob SquarePants mascot. Shoutouts Nickelodeon. Number 73. Massively popular YouTube star Jimmy Donaldson, aka Mr. Beast, makes a surprise cameo appearance. Shortly after audiences spot the SpongeBob costume, a bystander come up to Splinter and thinks he's wearing a bad Mickey Mouse costume. Yup, that's Mr. Beast voicing that character. He's even wearing a sweater with his logo on it. Number 74. When the turtles are blowing off steam by destroying some watermelons, Donnie points out that his brother looks like a cross between Stewie from Family Guy and Arnold from Hey Arnold. Now which football shaped dome is more iconic? Number 75. We get another dual reference when the turtles go to get April's bike back from the thieves. The leaders of the gang think that their group of four looks like a strange cross between the Geico Gecko and Shrek. But where's the love for my favorite computer-generated gecko? Gex. Number 76. Though they may be superheroes themselves, the Turtles also seem to be big fans of superhero cinema. Mikey, in particular, is a big fan of Avengers Endgame and relates with how Mark Ruffalo's Hulk is treated in the film. Number 77. Donnie is a big anime fan, and one of his favorites turns out to be Attack on Titan. The acclaimed anime series is certainly a lot more violent than what the target demographic of this movie may be into, but Donnie uses his knowledge of the show to defeat Superfly when he turns into a giant monster at the end of the film. Number 78. When April explains what she knows about Superfly to the Turtles, she compares the villain to Gru and Megamind, alluding to Despicable Me and Megamind, respectively. Number 79. In a vain attempt to get his kids to confide in him, Splinter throws a surprise party and offers a unique solution for the kids. He gets cardboard cutouts of 
of Chris Pine, Chris Pratt, and Chris Evans, saying that they can function as their imaginary human friends. Number 80. Splinter calls one of the cutouts the best Chris, and it's likely in reference to Chris Evans, who previously voiced Casey Jones, a vigilante and friend of the Turtles in another animated project. Number 81. The mid credit sequence confirms something that fans have been expecting since the film's first announcement. The Turtles' arch nemesis, Shredder, is coming. The Joker to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Batman, no villain in the franchise has been more prolific than the evil samurai leader of the dreaded Foot Clan. Number 82. Seth Rogen played a large part in the writing of the film's screenplay. He's been a comic book aficionado for as long as anyone can remember, also helping along projects like Ugh, The Green Hornet, Preacher, The Boys, and Invincible. This man loves ink and paper. Number 83. Throughout the flick, several trucks can be seen that feature orange triceratops on the side. This is actually a reference to the Triceratons, a creation of Mirage Studio that actually predates TMNT. However, the Triceratons have been folded into the franchise, being portrayed as villains in several TV shows and comic series. Number 84. Throughout the film, the turtles can be seen eating pizza, with the boxes sporting the Pizza Hut logo. Of course, Pizza Hut advertised TMNT Mutant Mayhem in real life, but this wasn't the first time that the two brands have teamed up. Pizza Hut actually released a Mutagen Ranch pizza in 2021, which, if you ask me, doesn't sound that delicious. Number 85. The Turtle Van, also called the Party Wagon, is the Turtle's iconic vehicle. While the Turtle Van doesn't appear in the film, it's actually teased at two different points. The Turtles are first in a van when they're escaping from Superfly's gang, with Donatello driving. The tease gets even more obvious later in the film when the Turtles drive a yellow pizza van that is similar in appearance to the classic Turtle Van. Number 86. After Superfly finally catches the Turtles, he strangely says, six in the morning police at my door. While this may seem random to some viewers, Superfly is actually reciting the opening lyrics to Ice Cube's 1987 song, Six in the Morning. Ice Cube, as we've mentioned, voices Superfly, with this quote being a nod to the real life actor. Number 87. Cowabunga gets its time in the sun, don't you worry. While dropping the anti-mutagen canister into Superfly's blowhole, we get to hear the iconic Kawabonga in slow motion. Number 88. The credits for TMNT Mutant Mayhem are full of drawings of the film's characters. However, many of these are actually stylized drawings of old TMNT designs. References to past versions of all four turtles, Splinter, Mondo Gecko, and more can be seen all throughout the credits. Number 89. The film opened in UK cinemas on July 31st, 2023, and in US theaters on August 2nd, 2023. I wonder how all the New Yorkers out there felt about coming in second for a movie based in their city. Number 90. The Nickelodeon logo, typically bright orange, is shown in slime green at the start of the movie, the same color as the ooze that mutates Splinter and the Turtles. Number 91. The high school that April attends is Eastman High. That's a reference to Kevin Eastman, one of the original creators of the Ninja Turtles comic book series. Number 92. Likewise, when April and the Turtles meet up to talk, they do it on the roof of a building that has a large lit sign over it that says Laird. Peter Laird is also one of the original creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics. Number 93. The news channel most often seen in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem is Channel 6. That's also the channel that the Turtles' usual ally, April O'Neil, ends up on in the movie. She walks into a live broadcast to tell the truth about the Turtles and that they are incorrectly reported to be the villains. Channel 6 is the same news network that April O'Neil works for in the early animated series for the franchise. Number 94. The swears in Mutant Mayhem are relatively tame. The word damn is used more than once and another curse word is used, but it's cut off before the entire word is heard. The phrase hell is spelled out using H-E double hockey sticks, perhaps another Casey Jones reference. Number 95. At the time of writing, Mutant Madness is sitting at a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the audience score almost matching it at 91%. Holy moly, folks folks are loving the turtles. Number 96. This critical success ties it with Across the Spider-Verse as the best-reviewed animated feature of 2023. Number 97. The film had a strong start at the box office, grossing over $95 million worldwide. Number 98. The film's budget was $70 million, and it has a running time of 100 minutes. Number 99. The film's merchandise, like the Ninja Turtle lunchboxes, is expected to be popular among the new generation of fans, continuing the legacy of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in pop 
pop culture. Number 100. Even before TMNT Mutant Mayhem hit theaters, Paramount announced both a sequel film and a spin-off TV series for Paramount+. Plus. Number 101. The sequel will continue the story of the Turtles, while the spin-off series will explore new narratives and characters in the TMNT universe. Number 102. Mutant Mayhem is the seventh theatrical Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Lucky number, eh? Number 103. The popular Pixar film Ratatouille gets a quick reference. One of the goons mockingly calls Splinter Ratatouille, which is enough to provoke him into action. Number 104. The legendary, constantly sequeled series Fast and Furious is referenced as well. The young turtle lads love this adrenaline-fueled franchise, enough so that the turtles scream out about a Tokyo Drift when a car starts doing donuts. Number 105. Superfly does his best Super Shredder impression when he's doused with ooze and emerges from fallen rubble and debris. 90s turtle fans definitely had flashbacks when that happened. Number 106. Street Sharks, another toy-focused anthropomorphic cartoon from the 90s, is mentioned as well. Well, sort of. When the turtles are first seen by April, she thinks they're all in costume. This prompts her to list off some cooler animals to dress up as, specifically sharks. I wonder if Battletoads ever got a nod in the writer's room. Number 107. Even 90s crime dramas got their time in the sun. An early heist directly references a classic sequence from the De Niro-led classic, Heat. And there you have it. 107 facts about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. I mentioned Disney not exactly doing as hot as they had hoped earlier, but that doesn't mean that everything fell flat. Elemental released to a moderate amount of fanfare, but some middling box office numbers. But eventually, word of mouth got out and it picked right back up. Kinda hot and cold, don't you think? If you're curious about how this movie was made, or simply want a deeper look at its fascinating world, you've come to the right place. Here's 107 facts about Elemental. Number 1. Elemental is a film that hits close to home for its director, Peter Song. The story is based on his life, with his parents immigrating to the USA from Korea, not speaking a word of English, and settling into the Bronx. They even opened up a grocery store named Son's Fruits and Vegetables, similar to Ember's family opening up their store in the film. Number 2. The opening of the film really celebrates immigration. Son hadn't thought about it that way initially. He was very naive as a kid and a bit of a jerk to his parents, because growing up in that world, he didn't realize how hard it was to be a new immigrant. Number 3. The movie really and truly relates to Son's own experiences, like assimilating into a new culture at a young age, but also marrying outside of his community, causing a bit of a culture clash. Number 4. Producer Denise Reem also relates to this, as her grandparents came to America from Ireland. Number 5. The film is meant to be universal, as everyone comes from somewhere. Number 6. Every member of the crew was encouraged to bring their own personal stories to the table. One scene in particular that came as a result was when Ember's parents looked for an apartment only to have doors shut in their faces. This story came from a story artist named Bolhem Buchiba, who actually ended up storyboarding the scene. Number 7. Son's parents passed away during the production of the movie, making it even more emotionally resonant. Number 8. He dedicated the movie to his parents, and wants the movie to encourage everyone to go home and hug their parents if they can. Number 9. The creation of Elemental required Pixar to upgrade and buy more computers. The film used over 151,000 cores spread across three large rooms on the Pixar campus. For comparison, Toy Story had 294 cores, Monsters Inc. had 672 cores, and Finding Nemo had 923. So yeah, 151,000. Number 10. The final frame of Elemental was approved on Friday, March 24th, 2023. Son was moved to tears when wrapping up the project. Number 11. And speaking of tears, Son says that he'd be a water elemental if he lived in Element City because he's a big crybaby. Number 12. The film's plot revolves around Ember, a fire element who loves working at her family's convenience store but struggles with her fiery temper. When a plumbing accident at the store summons Wade, a water element health inspector, the two meet and fall in love. The story explores their journey as they navigate the differences and challenges posed by their elemental natures. Number 13. The movie was pitched based on the idea of fire and water connecting, and if this was even possible. Number 14. The movie started with Ember. 
Son wanted to build a city that would support Ember's journey of identity and belonging, which led to many design choices being made that would support the plot in unique ways. Number 15. Element City consists of key districts designed for the various elements who settled there. The city evolved as each element arrived. Number 16. Water was there first, establishing the canal system among other foundational aspects of the city. Number 17. Earth followed. The city is built on a delta where earth and water meet. Number 18. Air was next, and much later, fire. The city isn't well suited to fire as a result. This approach underscores the fact that Ember is forced out of her comfort zone into a city that she's never before explored. Number 19. You might think that creating fire or air characters would be the most challenging task for the animation team. However, it was the water characters that proved to be the hardest obstacle. Water required the use of reflection and refraction, so the team used some cheats to make the characters both realistic and cartoony. The water characters have an outline that helps define the character's body and expressions, along with an always flowing exterior so they feel and look like water and not glass. Number 20. The lighting for Wade changed in every shot, and he could look like anything from jelly to a ghost with just a minor adjustment. Number 21. Elemental took seven years to make, both in the studio and at home. Number 22. The pairing of fire and water people as the main characters was Elemental. The immediate tension and conflict between these two elements created a visual punch of opposites. Designing the characters to embody this idea was a challenge. Number 23. The team had to create new software and overcome technical hurdles to bring the characters of Ember and Wade to life. Number 24. The concept required the team to understand that each character literally embodies their element. Character supervisor Jeremy Talbot said that Ember is fire, she's not something on fire. Wade is water, he's not something wet. Number 25. This made walk cycles particularly challenging as each element would have to move in completely unique ways. Number 26. The singular nature of the characters in Elemental forced Pixar to rethink when the effects department would get involved. On a typical Pixar project, the effects team wouldn't start working until after the characters had been designed and animation had been completed. Number 27. Of course, the technical aspects of these characters have to support the personalities and characteristics of the elements as well. When developing Elemental, Son had to think about what water and fire really were and how that would play out in a story. Number 28. Son said that fire is often seen as temper and passion, but that you have to look deeper and see what it really means to burn bright. Number 29. Contrasting this, water is transparent, so Wade, described as a go-with-the-flow guy, is prone to tears at unexpected moments, an emotional trait that director Peter Sohn admits he shares. Number 30. Taking these opposites and finding the Venn diagram where they overlap was the basis of everything that would come to be an elemental. Number 31. The screenplay was written by Brenda Sue, who was a creative consultant for Turning Red. Number 32. The portrayal of Element City was inspired by many earlier live-action films. The Pixar creative team turned to the great filmmakers of the past for inspiration on inventing an entire big city and making it appear lush and attractive. They looked at how cities were shot in classic films like Roman Holiday and were inspired by the work of the late cinematographer Gordon Willis. Number 33. Despite the film's rich backstory and sweeping visuals, the theme of Elemental is simple and personal. It's about wanting to thank our parents for the sacrifices they've made and connecting to something that feels real and truthful. This personal journey is at the heart of the film, making it relatable to kids, adults, and families alike. Number 34. Ember Lumen is voiced by Leah Lewis, who's best known for her roles as Ellie Chu in The Half of It and Georgia Fawn in CW's Nancy Drew series. Number 35. Her performance in The Half of It showcased her voice, which really stood out to Son. He heard how raspy and smoky it was, but she also had great vocal control. This is what made her perfect for the role of Ember. Number 36. Wade Ripple is voiced by Mamadou Athi, who starred in Netflix's Uncorked and the show Oh Jerome No. Number 37. He was a shoe in for the role after Son saw his performance in Oh Jerome No. His ability to cry realistically and humorously is what really sold his performance. Number 38. 
The film features several celebrity voice actors in its international dubs. In the European French dub, actors Adele Exarchopoulos and Vincent Lacoste play Ember and Wade, respectively. Number 39. Pixar regular Ronnie Del Carmen provided the voice of Bernie, Ember's father. Number 40. Kai Ava Hauser, a non-binary voice actor, plays Wade's non-binary sibling, Lake. It's nice to see casting that aligns with the identity of the character. Number 41. Lake also has a girlfriend, and the girlfriend's name will surely perk up the ears of animation lovers. Her name is Ghibli, a clear reference to the beloved anime production studio, Studio Ghibli. Number 42. There are a few less big names than one would expect in this Pixar flick. One cast member who may stand out to some is Joe Para, a comedian best known for his Adult Swim series, Joe Para Talks With You. Para voices Fern Grouchwood, an overgrown earth elemental. Number 43. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the talents of Catherine O'Hara, Canadian superstar and Schitt's Creek alum who voices Wade's widowed mother. Number 44. There's also a cute little mascot-like character named Claude, played by Mason Wertheimer. He's been described as a Jiminy Cricket type, seeing something in Ember that she doesn't see yet herself. Number 45. The film was announced in May of 2022, with the general themes being introduced, and Son was announced as the director. Number 46. In September of that very same year, during the D23 Expo, a first look at the film was shown, featuring a scene where Ember and Wade are walking through the park. Wade tries to impress Ember by making a rainbow across the water. Number 47. The film debuted at the 76th Con Film Festival on May 27, 2023, and received praise for its animation, musical score, and emotional depth. However, some critics found its storytelling underwhelming. Number 48. The film was released in the United States on June 16, 2023. Number 49. The film's release was delayed in the United Kingdom and Ireland to July 7, 2023 making it one of the few modern American films to be delayed from a UK release. Number 50. This is Pixar's first true rom-com, and it takes cues from romantic films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Moonstruck, and Emily. Number 51. Beyond just being a love story about two individuals, Elemental is also a family love story. The relationship between Ember and her father is particularly important, as it shows what a parent will sacrifice to allow their kids to pursue their dreams. Number 52. Following in this genre vein, Elemental does not have a villain. Instead, the film focuses on life, family, and relationships. This unique approach adds depth to the story and makes it more relatable to audiences. Number 53. As of July 5th, Elemental has grossed over $195 million worldwide, against a budget of $200 million. Number 54. Elemental had the lowest three-day weekend debut for a Pixar film since Toy Story, which premiered in 1995 in far fewer theaters than Elemental and earned $29.1 million without adjusting for inflation. Number 55. Element City, the setting for Elemental, is a thriving, colorful metropolis home to interconnected communities of people made of the four elements of classical lore. Water, fire, air, and earth. The city is designed to reflect the diversity and vibrancy of a real-world immigrant neighborhood, much like the Bronx, where director Peter Son grew up. Number 56. The design of Element City was inspired by cities and architecture all over the world, including Venice and Amsterdam. The team researched port cities to understand how a country welcomes people in, and other immigration hubs around the world. They also looked at buildings in Brazil with earth designs and buildings in the Middle East with watery shapes. Number 57. The production team spent many hours watching point-of-view city tours on YouTube to get inspiration for Element City as they were unable to travel to cities like Venice and Amsterdam for research due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Number 58. Ember's parents, Bernie and Cinder, voiced by Ronnie Del Carmen and Sheila Omi, run a bodega-like shop in Element City. The shop specializes in imports from Fireland and other fire-friendly products, reflecting the immigrant experience of establishing businesses that cater to their home country's needs in a new land. Number 59. Some examples of fire products at the store are kids' juice boxes, which are actually small kerosene cans with metal straws, and lighter fluid baby formula. 
Ember delivers bags of wood chips, not potato chips, and Fireplace sells sparklers. Buy two, get one free by the cash register. Number 60. Director Peter Son used to imagine the periodic table as a series of apartment buildings with individual apartments in which Cobalt would live next door to Nickel. This childhood imagination influenced the creation of Elemental. For example, the Wetro schedule features a similar shape, and a park in the film called Periodic Park has a grassy grid that's reminiscent of the periodic table. Number 61. Filmmakers used color to help convey Ember's emotions. When she loses her temper, the color of her flames goes from yellow, orange, red hues to purple and nearly white. Number 62. Filmmakers working to frame each sequence allowed for up to a 15% growth of a fire character's flames, ensuring the whole character would be visible without completely filling the frame. Number 63. Animators referenced footage of water balloons to inspire how Wade's internal water volume might flow between poses. His form breaks on occasion with water droplets and he has the ability to flow into and out of external water sources. Number 64. Pixar is known for hiding easter eggs in their films that represent past projects, future ones, and even outside influences. In Elemental, director Peter Sohn and producer Denise Reem's favorite easter eggs come not from other movies, but from their personal lives. For instance, there's a chair from the university that Reem attended in Fireish. Number 65. Sohn also included a tribute to Ralph Eggleston, the person who hired him at Pixar 23 years ago and who passed away the previous year. This hidden tribute to Eggleston comes in the form of a sign reading Eat at Ralph's, two cents. Number 66. Of course, Pixar got an A113 easter egg in here, a classic reference to a CalArts classroom that many staff once learned in. Elemental's reference to A113 comes in a unique form, as the movie uses the periodic table to help pull it off. The Wetco Transit sign for Element City includes three symbols for different train lines, A, H, and AL with the first in a circle and the latter two in squares. H is the atomic symbol for hydrogen, which has an atomic number of 1 on the periodic table. AL is the symbol for aluminum, which has the atomic number 13. Therefore, the sign is coded A113. Number 67. Elemental includes another classic Pixar Easter egg by showing the Pizza Planet truck. The iconic vehicle debuted in Toy Story and has become the studio's signature hidden detail, as a version of it has appeared in every movie. Number 68. The planet on the Science Club poster during a flashback of Wade's past is an easter egg referring to Pixar's next film, Ilio. It closely resembles the concept art revealed at the D23 Expo. Number 69. There's also a secret Ilio character included as one of Elemental's easter eggs. Producer Denise Reem confirmed in an interview that there is a character from the upcoming movie hidden somewhere in this movie. Number 70. There are plenty of elemental pun easter eggs as well. This comes naturally since much of the film takes place in a bodega-like store and the majority of these puns are themed around fire or wood-themed products. Number 71. The air elemental characters at play in Elemental might seem somewhat familiar to Pixar aficionados, as the air people in many ways resemble the look of Gus, the main cloud featured in Son's short Partly Cloudy. Number 72. At the movie theater in Element City, there's a poster for a movie called The Good Elephant, a parody of Peter Son's movie The Good Dinosaur. Number 73. Of course, Wade and Ember are at the theater to see something currently playing. The marquee reveals that they're attending a screening of Tide and Prejudice, a water-themed version of the Jane Austen romance novel Pride and Prejudice. Number 74. There's also a comic at the fireplace, which seemingly features the character Arlo on the cover. Number 75. The Cars franchise gets a special shout-out from Pixar through the inclusion of Flagstone Tires. An ad for Flagstone Tires is shown on the signs at the stadium during the Windbreakers and Crop Dusters game. How about those team names, though? Number 76. The characters Ember and Wade were inspired by the personalities of Son and his wife. Ember's hot temper reflects Son's wife's passionate nature, while Wade's emotional nature mirrors Son's own personality. Number 77. Another personal tie-in comes in the form of Ember's struggle. She's torn between being with Wade or following in her parents' footsteps and running the family business, reflecting not only Son's personal experience, but that of many of the animators and storytellers. Number 78. Elemental is the fourth animated film scored by Thomas Newman, following Finding Nemo, Wally, -E, and Finding Dory. Number 79. 
Carl's Date, a Pixar short featuring characters from Up, yes, that includes Doug, played before the movie, marking the first time in five years that a short was played before a Pixar film. The last time this happened was before The Incredibles 2 in 2018. Number 80. Speaking of Up, Peterson just so happens to be the inspiration for the young and energetic Boy Scout Russell. Number 81. Some of the promotional posters for Elemental were parodies of previous Pixar films and were posted online. However, Ember's poster, which parodied Turning Red, was quickly taken down due to the Canadian wildfires that were happening at the time. Number 82. Elemental was first hinted in the Pixar film Lightyear on a drink called Wade Water. I wonder if something like that's in bad taste in Element City. Number 83. The language of the fire people known as Firish was based on the sounds fire makes. David J. Peterson of Game of Thrones and Dune fame created this language. Number 84. Peterson has named Jesse Sams as a co-creator of Firish and has criticized the lack of credit she's received for her work on this language. Number 85. Leah Lewis went through a long three-step audition process. This process included two auditions on Zoom and a six-hour in-person audition. Number 86. Mamadou Athi found the recording studio work to be shockingly exhausting. He described the process as draining but exhilarating as he had to put every bit of himself into the performance, creating images in his mind and doing take after take. Number 87. Leah Lewis also shared her thoughts on the pressures of playing a character who will soon populate store shelves in the form of Pixar merchandise. She described the experience as crazy and unreal, especially considering she used to buy such merchandise as a child. Number 88. Both Lewis and Athi highlighted the importance of director Peter Sohn's guidance during the recording process. His direction helped them understand their characters better and deliver performances that would resonate with audiences. Number 89. Despite the physical separation of the recording booth, Lewis and Athi managed to form a strong emotional connection with their characters. Number 90. The design challenges that came with injecting soul into fire and water elements were immense. He drew two hands, one of water, one of fire, coming together. They didn't touch, but the temperature from one hand would heat the water to its boiling point, and then there'd be a cooling down effect. It was kind of like goosebumps when you were about to touch someone for the first time. Number 91. During the early stages of character design, Ember looked terrifying, sort of like a monster out of the Lord of the Rings. The team had to work hard to control the flame and make Ember look less intimidating and more appealing. Number 92. The filmmakers interviewed over 100 first and second generation immigrants at Pixar about their personal experiences to develop the story. Building from this variety of experiences, the Fire People, the latest group of elemental beings to immigrate to Element City, are depicted via a range of cultural signifiers. Number 93. The city's also pretty accurate when it comes to how immigrants got there. The filmmakers researched various ports and entryways used all across the world. Number 94. Of course, the boiling point of water was well researched as well, to make sure nobody could come in and hit them with an um, actually. Number 95. During pre-production, it was suggested that Wade and Ember have a baby made of steam. A fun idea for sure, and one that opens up a lot of possibilities for other elemental hybrids, but it didn't end up making it into the movie. Number 96. With all of the talk of the four elements, some folks might assume that Elemental was partially inspired by Avatar The Last Airbender. Fans of Aang and the gang would be a little disappointed though, as Son has dismissed any such connection. He loves the show and watched it with his kids, but feels the two worlds are very different. No martial arts in Elemental. Number 97. There are sports though. The most popular yet fictional game in Element City is called Airball. Number 98. Lots of different technology was designed to make Element City feel even more complete. Production designer Don Shank says design elements inspired new technology which inspired new design. Gotta love when inspiration gives way to more inspiration. Number 99. The look for the movie ended up landing on a delicate balance between physics logic and cartoony appeal, says Shank. Number 100. As the way each one developed over time would shape their world. That's how the fire people ended up making things like glass and ceramics. Number 101. This idea extended out into the world at large, with things like cooking pots, stove burners, and more being incorporated into fire people architecture. Number 102. Elemental features an original song performed by Love called Steal the Show. It plays during Ember and Wade's first date, as well as during the end credits. 
Number 103. When the movie was first announced, a lot of people pointed out similarities to Fireboy and Watergirl, a series of cooperative puzzle platforming video games developed by Oslo Albed. The similarities are striking, but the idea of a fire-water duo is definitely not novel. Shark Boy and Lava Girl, anyone? Number 104. Early concept art shows a family of fire elementals having a super hot dinner of burning logs. Son said he thought it would be fun if the fire elementals loved to eat hot food. Number 105. At first, Son considered letting Ember do superhero-like things, shooting fire from her hands and the like. However, this didn't match the emotional tone of the movie. Number 106. Elemental was made from the ground up to be seen in 3D. It was always supposed to be seen on the big screen in that format and wasn't simply a post-conversion job. Number 107. Interestingly enough, Star Wars had a big impact on this movie. The idea of immaculate reality was often referred to during production, where the team would design things knowing that they had a fictional history. Even if that lore never played out on screen, the world would feel more real to audiences because of it. Son first heard about this idea from George Lucas on the making of Star Wars. And that's a wrap on our elemental journey. The elements can be found anywhere. You know, fire, ice, candy, slime, lumps. Wait, that's just an ooh. Good thing we have two fully fledged videos breaking down all the facts you need to know about the latest Adventure Time adventure, Fiona and Cake. Enjoy. Number one. Adventure Time, Fiona and Cake is an animated series that serves as a spin-off to the iconic Adventure Time created by Pendleton Ward. This new series takes viewers on a fresh journey, focusing on the alternate gender-swapped characters Fiona and her cat Cake. Number 2. Adam Muto, who had been deeply involved with the original Adventure Time series, took the reins to develop this spin-off. Number 3. Fiona and Cake is produced by Cartoon Network Studios and Frederator Studios. Hmm, one of those sounds mighty familiar, and may even be the best company ever. No bias, no bias. Number 4. The series boasts a talented voice cast that breathes life into the characters. Madeline Martin returns to lend her voice to Fiona, while Roz Ryan voices Cake. Number 5. The series clocks in at 10 episodes, with episodes 1 through 8 being released at the time of writing this. Hopefully those last two don't introduce too much mind-blowing stuff all at once. Number 6. The alarm clock that wakes Fiona up from her rat bus dream bears a striking resemblance to Bemo, the fan-favorite video game Mo first seen in Adventure Time. It even has Bemo's voice. Snooze. 10 minutes. Number 7. The rat bus is modeled after the cat bus from Studio Ghibli's My Neighbor Totoro. Number 8. Fiona's outfit in her dream is heavily inspired by Sailor Moon. Interestingly, in her debut episode in the original series, Fiona wore a dress reminiscent of Sailor Moon's Princess Serenity during her date with the fake Prince Gumball. Number 9. When Fiona gets a boost from her skates in the dream, she exclaims, Hans Brinker action go! This is a nod to the children's novel Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates, a story about life in Holland written by Mary Mapes Dodge in 1865. The book introduced Dutch speed skating to America and even inspired the Disney Channel original movie Brink. Number 10. The opening tune in the first episode, also known as Not Myself, is performed by Zuzu, a no-nonsense scouse indie rocker who has also been behind a couple other Adventure Time tunes like Woke Up and Eternity With You. Number 11. You probably recognize the song. It was prominently featured in promotional material for Fiona and Cake as early as July of 2023. Number 12. The introductory sequence shows off a whole bunch of characters that also appear to be gender-bent versions of Adventure Time classics. Heck, even Flame Princess shows up as DJ Flame, who also breaks Fiona's heart. Number 13. Fiona tries to watch something on TV when she first wakes up and is treated to every single channel playing the classic sitcom Cheers. This show debuted in 1982 and ran for over a decade. Number 14. Fiona's apartment is covered in posters, featuring stuff like Toyed Force, Swamp Champ 2, Lost Sword, Alien Game, and more. What's your favorite poster from her apartment? Number 15. Starchy, the Candy Kingdom's number one gravedigger, makes a couple of multiversal appearances, his human one first appearing on the bus tour. 
He claims to be from the graveyard or next to it and even sports his classic mustache. Number 16. The bus is actually packed with Adventure Time references. One passenger sports Abraka Daniel's rainbow headband and funky haircut combo. There's a gender-bent version of Fern, human equivalents of Hot Dog Princess and a Banana Guard, and of course, Marshall Lee makes an appearance. Number 17. Marshall Lee's guitar, which he uses ever so wonderfully while busking, has a bat sticker on it, a reference to his alternate self, Marceline the Vampire Queen. Kinda funny how he uses a six-string guitar now as opposed to Marceline's bass. Number 18. Marshall Lee has a mole on his neck with very similar placement to Marceline's vampire bite. It's kinda like a half bite, which is sorta cute. Number 19. This musical miscreant is once again voiced by Donald Glover, aka Childish Gambino. Number 20. Outside of the city aquarium, there's a statue of penguins that looks suspiciously similar to Ice King's right-hand man, er, bird. It's a Gunther look-alike. Heck, they might even be gender-bent too, it's just hard to tell with penguins from so far away. Number 21. After getting fired, Fiona walks by a store called Numbered Facets, complete with giant D20 sign rolling a nat 1. In the store's window, there are many fantasy board games and accessories, including one small box with a prominently featured lemon. Lemon grab anyone? Number 22. Speaking of lemon people, there's a young man handing out mixtapes on the street who looks to be a pretty one-to-one -one humanoid version of young Lemon Hope. Number 23. Plus, there's a duo of inept dog walkers raising their voices and moving in very exaggerated ways in the park. If that's not the lemon grabs, I'll eat my hat. You know, if I was wearing one. You can't tell. Number 24. This duo is actually known as the Lemon Carbs, and they're big money investors with their very fancy dog. Gary P wants to meet with them for their moolah. Who would have thought? Number 25. The new versions of classic characters just keep coming. At Butler's Buttery Buns, we meet a barista named Gary, who looks a whole lot like a particularly pink royal from a bygone era. Number 26. Gary is voiced by Andrew Rannells, which is a bit of a change. Prince Gumball was voiced by Neil Patrick Harris in Adventure Time. Number 27. The pink barista puts together an order for a customer known only as CB, but we all know that this is just an elderly lady version of Cinnamon Bun, the lovably clumsy citizen of the Candy Kingdom. Number 28. Even Lumpy Space Princess makes a comeback, this time as Ellis P, the local animal whisperer. Pendleton Ward himself voices this particularly purple person. Number 29. Those bees at the city park look pretty familiar, and for good reason. They're basically the bee that shows up for the end credits of every episode of Adventure Time, minus the cute smiley face, of course. Number 30. Interestingly enough, our other main character, Simon, also seems to watch Cheers quite a bit. This is likely programming meant to keep his 20th century man habitat as legitimate as possible. If this is the case, that could be a hint as to what era Fiona and Cake in their world live in. Number 31. Cheers has some deep roots in Adventure Time, seeing as Simon can be heard singing the theme song as he makes his decline into Ice Kingdom, while fighting the goo monsters in the before times. Number 32. Fiona's old school phone that can play Pixelated Snake or The Worm Game also hints at their era. Number 33. The cocktail that Simon orders at the candy bar is full of olives and cocktail onions, and it sounds kinda nasty, right? Well, it's actually pretty close to a real martini recipe, known as a gin salad dry martini. I guess the base liquid is darker than gin in this case, but who knows what's actually in there? Root beer, I guess, which somehow makes it way worse. Number 34. Dirt Beer Guy stays ready for anything. You can see that he keeps a baseball bat close by behind the bar. Smart. Number 35. Simon isn't just being weird by adding eggshells to his coffee. Cowboy coffee is a real thing. The broken up eggshells help the ground settle at the bottom and they're also alkaline, meaning they can help reduce the acidity of the brew. The more you know. Number 36. The song that plays near the end of episode 2, Part of the Madness, was composed by Rebecca Sugar. Sugar is known for her contributions to Adventure Time throughout the years, which eventually led to her creating the very popular and very musical Steven Universe. Number 37. 
You can see someone that looks like Boney fishing by the river as Simon walks along. However, it seems that Boney has upgraded. He no longer just uses his arm as a fishing pole. Instead, he's got a more dedicated but equally bone-based fishing rod. Number 38. When Simon dials up Marcy on his super cool flip phone, you can see some of his other contacts. These include Island Lady, Gunter, Abraka Daniel, and even Animal Control. Number 39. Simon continues to be voiced by Tom Kenny, who played the Ice King in Adventure Time. Kenny is also famous for voicing SpongeBob SquarePants. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Number 40. Inside Simon's brain, a gold charm can be seen dangling from an electric cliff. This suggests that Simon, despite being normified, remains connected to Golb, the chaotic deity. Number 41. This also hints at Simon's yearning to reunite with Betty, who became fused with Golb. His sneaky rituals in the back room of his enclosure definitely show his desire to do so. Number 42. Chew's Goose is back, but he's strangely maniacal this time around. Simon keeps him around as a spell battery, but he's gonna get some good rhyming burns in. He also gets a good electrical burn in. Number 43. Two ducks steal money from Marsha Lee's guitar case in the opening sequence, a quick reference to the two-headed duck from the original Adventure Time opening. Number 44. The two-headed duck makes a comeback in episode 3. When Cake is falling down from the city in the sky, the double-domed creature quickly bites her. Number 45. The squirrel with the cursed apples is voiced by Mark Maron. He's played this role before, but is also known for his stand-up comedy, TV roles, and even a part in Joker. Number 46. The marketplace that sells magic strawberries sells a whole lot more than just that. Taking a closer look at the signage reveals such wonderful ateliers as stuff I found in old wells, fermented pinecone juice, have you seen my bones, yesterday's prophecies, and knives. Honestly, nicer than my local farmer's market. Number 47. The phone number that Fiona puts on her Have You Seen This Portal posters is 5550145. Unsurprisingly, this is a fake number, and calling it will get you nowhere. Sorry. Number 48. Some old school Adventure Time slang makes its way into the show. Fiona lets Lou say, Holy schmauzow, when she first gets on Astrid's flying bike thing. Number 49. As Astrid and Fiona soar through the sky, citizens of the Fire Kingdom can be seen hanging out on the fields below. Number 50. Speaking of Astrid, she's voiced by Audrey Bennett. Number 51. Fiona and Cake returns us to a relatively new Adventure Time location, the Drift. This decrepit space station has housed aliens, humans, and more throughout history, and was first introduced to fans in the first episode of Distant Lands, BMO. This time, we see a bounty hunter of sorts take down a wayward cosmic entity. Number 52. The bounty hunter turns out to be Scarab, a god auditor. He's got a whole list of cosmic entities that need to be taken care of. While scrolling towards Prismo, we catch a glimpse of some of the other fugitives, including Voidcaster, Caged Dude, and Martin Mertens, aka Finn's dad. His violation? Desertion. So classic. Number 53. When Wyatt accidentally misuses his wish for some peace and quiet, he ends up tied to some train tracks with his ex-wife tree trunks barreling towards him on a train. This is a reference to an old trope of damsels in distress being tied to tracks in silent films. Interestingly enough though, this trope is misremembered. It didn't really happen all that often in silent films. There was the case of Snidely Whiplash pulling this stunt, but that was from a full-color and voice-acted cartoon. Number 54. They commit to the gag regardless. There's even silent film title cards to give us dialogue, complete with ooh film at the bottom of each. Number 55. Peppermint Butler makes a triumphant return, flying in on a plane and lassoing the runaway train before it can smush Wyatt. Number 56. Prismo reveals a lot of quick updates as he checks up on Ooh from his magical TV. Huntress Wizard is still doing her thing, Princess Bubblegum is opening up a candy orphanage, Peppermint Butler is sharing a milkshake with Blaine, and Susan Strong is still really strong. Number 57. He also reveals some other universes, like Farm World and the world of Flapjack. Good shout out. Number 58. Throughout the series, there's a recurring motif of golden eyes. They appear in Fiona's bedroom, the spider's tattoo parlor, and prominently on the floating chicken dragon island. Or I guess they're cockatrices. Number 59. 
Looks like Jake is getting older, as evidenced by Prismo's channel surfing. While fighting off cockatrices on the floating island, Finn has to remind Jake to use his powers, and also Jake's looking pretty scrungly. Number 60. Simon Petrikov is all sorts of caked up. Just saying. This is a fact that cannot be denied, and cannot be avoided. Number 61. Lemon Grab and his Lemon People sound a bit different this time around. Justin Roiland is no longer the voice of Lemon Grab. That role is now played by Jinx Monsoon. Number 62. Turns out the Ice King didn't come up with Fiona and Cake himself, as was implied in some earlier episodes of Adventure Time. Instead, Prismo made them up and then hid the universe inside of Ice King's big crazy brain. Number 63. Prismo brings back some old Prismo gems as well, including his mortal self and Prismo's pickles. Looks like he's even expanded production on those briny little cukes. Number 64. While in a huge field of corn, Cake takes the form of a UFO and starts knocking over stalks, an action akin to creating crop circles, the flattening of crops often attributed to supernatural forces, usually extraterrestrials. Crop Circles is also a song by Odie Lay. Check it out. Number 65. The corn world turns out to be more than just corn. It's actually farm world. These days, it's given off a real Mad Max vibe. Post-apocalyptic road loot for the win. Number 66. I'm not kidding when I say there's a Mad Max vibe either. Fiona's looted costume includes a right shoulder pad, just like Mel Gibson's titular character in 1979. Number 67. The designer bag Fiona finds amidst the wreckage is a Vespucci. Not a real brand, but probably a play on Gucci. Amerigo Vespucci was an Italian explorer whose name actually serves as the basis of America. Number 68. In Farm World, everyone seems to be repurposing what's left over from the before times. This is especially true when it comes to clothing. People are wearing floppy disks. People are wearing tires. People are wearing fenders and stripped computer monitors. It's very fashion forward and a nice nod to post-apocalyptic tales. There's no sheen in the future. Number 69. By the tire yard, there's a flower growing out of a basement window. Written on the leaves are the words, me help. One can only assume that this was supposed to be help me and there was somebody trapped down there. They're probably beyond saving now as the flower has since grown to full height. Tragic. Number 70. Destiny isn't just the name of the fifth episode, it's also the name of a character you probably forgot about. No, not you, I know you remember Big Destiny. Big Destiny is back in charge of Farm World as leader of the Big Destiny gang. Doesn't look like he's changed much either. Destiny gang rules! Number 71. Fiona's backpack has Finn's busted up flute in it. She shows it off while trying to bargain for a crown with Farm World's human Choose Goose, aka Choose Bruce. Number 72. Ever notice how Fiona doesn't have a nose? Yeah, well, you're not alone, but Big Destiny's son does notice. Farm World folks have noses and other people seem to not. Number 73. Farm World Finn seems to have done quite well for himself. He's got a litter of kids and lives separate from the chaos of the Mad Max side of things. Number 74. Simon refers to the soup served up at supper time as a soup of Theseus. This is a reference to the ship of Theseus, a thought experiment that asks if you keep replacing parts to a ship over time, and if you eventually completely replace each original part, does it still remain that original ship? Or is it something new? So is this soup really the same one that their mother started on the day she died? Number 75. When Jay Mertens and Young Destiny explain their secret romance, Cake gets excited when she hears that their tale is one of enemies to lovers. This is a common trope in romance and, by extension, fanfiction. Number 76. Farm World's Finn still has his mule, Bartram, first introduced in the Adventure Time episode Finn the Human. He's just as stoic and radical as ever, still going by Barbar. -Bar. Good thing he didn't get sold way back when. Number 77. At the end of each episode, Fiona and Cake both dream the same dream. Fiona's is just a little bit bigger than Cake's. Aw, oh, how sweet. Number 78. As Cake glides through the ice palace, she swings by a room featuring a little girl playing an axe base. It looks like Marceline, but she appears to be made from ice, akin to the Ice Scouts. Hmm. Number 79. Bubblegum Princess is the candy queen in Winter King's world, and she's just as loony, if not loonier, than the Ice King himself. Just look at those awful, awful banana guards. Good lord. 
Number 80. Her song, Baked With Love, is written by Brian David Gilbert. Number 81. The creepy little lick she plays after letting Simon know that the whole blender thing isn't a metaphor is Toccata and Fugue in D minor, organ, by Bach. It's been heard in many different places and always accompanies some chaotic evil. Number 82. There's a horrifically disfigured version of Gary P's pastry mention hanging out in Candy Queen's blender room. All the details are there, all the way down to the raspberry scarf. Number 83, Gary P's baking experiments go beyond just biscuit dudes. There's also a little donut man, a strawberry friend, a cinnamon bun fella, and more. Number 84, in fact, all of his baked goods are forms of Candy Kingdom citizens from Adventure Time. Cupcake Man, the Marshmallow Kids, the works. Number 85, Gary also starts to explain the origins of Mr. Cupcake's romance with Choco Berry, which appears to be an exact retelling of the very first episode of Adventure Time, Slumber Party Panic. Number 86. In the Baby Universe, Baby Finn joins in on a classic Adventure Time fist bump between Simon and Fiona. Of course, this is a shout out to all of the great fist bumps throughout the series, but it can also be seen as a little throwback to Finn's buff baby song and dance. He can punch your buns and he'll do it for fun. Number 87. Cake transforms a very funky hat onto her head while talking about slaying vampires. This particular design is very similar to that in many depictions of Van Helsing, vampire slayer of lore. Number 88. Speaking of specialty vampire slaying, Bonnie's got a wall full of steak-based weapons inside of her peppermint butler tank. We're talking steak shuriken, double steaks, sword steaks, curved steaks, ring steaks, and even hammer steaks. They take this steak stuff seriously. Number 89. And you better take this stuff seriously. Finn's hero and all-around awesome dude, Billy, couldn't hack it in this world. His desiccated body can be found next to a rock reading Turn Back absolutely perforated with vampire bites. Number 90. At Ms. Abadir's blood drive back in the human world, there's plenty of vampire imagery. Just look around that stained glass monstrosity. Number 91. But the big reference at the blood drive charity event comes in the form of a Riccardio mascot character. Remember that scoundrel from the episode of the same name? Number 92. In the same shot that you get a good look at Riccardio, there's also the Magic Man's hat hanging from a candlestick slash coat hook. Number 93. In a flashback, Simon discusses some antique items in a presentation. He didn't actually find any of these items in his adventures as an antiquarian, but is excited about them nonetheless. These pieces are all things that Adventure Time fans will recognize. First off, there's the armor of Zeldron, the hilarious and heavy impervious armor that allows the user to fly. Finn found this armor after seeing Sir Slicer and all of his armored compatriots in sweet sets and feeling a little jealous. Number 94. Next up on Simon's presentation is the Wand of Disbursement. This is a magical item used by Grob Gob Globgrod to take someone's soul and send it across the cosmos. Either that or the 37th Dead World. Number 95. Then there's the Porcelain Lamb Relic. This has a cursed gem in the center of it and stole Finn's and Ice King's faces for a bit. That's a fun throwback. Number 96. Of course, the Enchiridion is also mentioned in his presentation, but nobody takes it seriously. The Lich would have taken it seriously. Number 97. In the Dead World, Bimo wears a mask that is very similar to the face of the Cosmic Owl. Number 98. The Cosmic Owl also pops up on the Scarab's Bounty Hunter board, but he ignores the call to keep hunting down Fiona and Cake. Number 99. If you look closely during the Good Times tape that Bimo puts in their butt, you can see that the Ice King becomes a skeleton for a couple of frames after attempting to kick Gunther. Number 100. In the piles left behind the Melted Ice Kingdom, there is a whole bunch of ninja stuff. From books like Cool Jutsu and Ninja Guidebook, to weapons like Size and Katana. This takes us right back to the Adventure Time episode, The Chamber of Frozen Blades, where Jake, Finn, and the Ice King engage in ninja combat. Number 101. As the squad leaves the Melted Ice Kingdom, Fiona looks toward the Ice King's busted up drum set. Inside the kick drum, what appears to be the tip of the Ice King's crown can be seen, but it's not immediately confirmed. However, the Ice King does specifically mention his crown being inside of the kick drum during the tape, and then for the rest of it, he isn't wearing it. Number 102. Betty's student ID is YCP5547. If you know what that means, let me know down in the comments. 
Number 103, Simon and Betty's song is called Everything in You by Half Shy. Number 104, Cake can be heard humming this tune throughout her adventure in Ooh, which makes sense since she used to live inside of Simon's head. Number 105, Orbo's voice actor is recognizably Australian. In fact, it belongs to an Australian cattle dog, or maybe a blue healer. Yep, Orbo is voiced by David McCormack, best known as Bandit on the hit show Bluey. Number 106, Fiona and Cake seem to have some anti-magic properties. Cake accidentally transforms one of the hot dog nights into a regular hot dog. This transformation is accompanied by a rainbow of colors reminiscent of Prismo's transportation magic. There's also that whole thing with the Winter King. Awkward. Number 107. The world they visit in the episode Jerry is very, very similar to the Ooh from Adventure Time, but in this universe, the Lich won. The consequences are about as dire as you would expect. It's nice to see that BMO can still stay positive through it all. Football, however, is nowhere to be found. Holy schmauzow. That is a lot of facts. Number one. During the intro sequence, you can see a gold charm getting shocked with electricity and then breaking apart. This is mirrored when Simon actually pulls off his ritual to see Gold Betty again, but it can also be seen as foreshadowing to their final meeting. Number two. Speaking of foreshadowing, did you notice that the camera flies right into the back of Simon's head? This lets the audience know that Fiona and Cake's world exists inside of his dome from the very get-go, although you would have to wait until episode 2 to really see this confirmed. Number 3. Three different versions of Finn are showcased during the intro. We first see Fiona in her bus tour uniform, seemingly in her boring world. Then there's baby Finn running through the vampire world. Last up is adult Finn, all bearded and muscular, complete with Jake tattoo, hustling in the forest he took Simon adventuring in. This serves as a reminder that these are all the same person connected but from different universes. Number 4. Simon flies towards the screen screaming at the end of the intro. He's holding on to what appears to be a big old tetromino. These are the pieces that Golbetty crunches unworthy beings into and can be seen floating around the gigantic chaos entity. If you look closely, you can also see that the Ice King crown is flying along with them. I wonder which poor sucker ended up as this particular shape. Number 5. The God Auditor and all-around vengeful lunatic Scarab is voiced by Kaylee McKee. McKee also voices my secondary main in Guilty Gear Strive, Testament. Number 6. McKee even voices all the little scarabs that result from Gold Betty's protection of Simon. What range? Number 7. Prismo is voiced by Sean Rohani, who can be heard in all sorts of other animated shows and video games, from the English dub of Record of Ragnarok to the latest Bethesda game Starfield. Number 8. The candy shop Gary and Marsha Lee visit is run by Lord Monochromicorn and has never actually talked. Number 9. The candy shop also has a capsule dispenser that looks like a gumball guardian and a poster with the phrase, Dentists will try to stop you printed on it. Nice. Number 10. The Lich makes a comeback at the end of episode 8, Jerry. And what would the Lich be without a terrifying voice? Yes, he is still voiced by Hellboy himself, Ron Perlman. Number 11. The Lich straight up tears Billy's skin off, leaving nothing but his skeleton behind. Even his floppy, unsocketed eye goes up in flames. Number 12. Fiona and Cake were originally designed by Natasha Allegri, a crew member who worked on Adventure Time. Allegri designed characters for the first two seasons and eventually became a storyboard revisionist. Number 13. Allegri first created Fiona and Cake just for fun. She would post doodles and art on the 4chan image board known as Co and made the gender swapped version of Finn and Jake for a Rule 63 thread. You know, for every male character there's a female version and vice versa. People liked these doodles a lot and they blew up online. Eventually, in Season 3 of Adventure Time, these characters got their own episode and the rest is history. Number 14. Pendleton Ward and Natasha Allegri also worked together on a silly little project called Peekapoo Poop Chew back in 2011. It's a fart joke with Pokemon. Just thought you should know. Number 15. While on the bus tour in episode 1, Fiona mentions the city park while a fountain is featured prominently. The statue in the middle of this fountain appears to be a version of Betty, which makes sense when you realize that this is inside of Simon's head. Number 16. 
A much less detailed version of this statue can be seen in the background when Fiona first wakes up in her magical dream world. Just look to the left of Mr. Cupcake and Chocoberry. Number 17. The classic Adventure Time dragon makes a comeback too. It circles an enormous cyclops, leaving a little goo trail behind. Seeing that the dragon has a butt and teeth, I'm not so sure if the cyclops should be comfortable with that. Dragons are pretty weird in Adventure Time, not actually resembling any other mythology's interpretation. This particular dragon first appeared in the 10th episode of Season 1 of Adventure Time, Memories of Boom Boom Mountain. Number 18. I mentioned in the last video that in the end credits of each episode, Fiona and Cake share their dreams. This is just as true in the actual events of the show as shown by when they both have the same dream after returning to their world. Simon in the fridge and all. Number 19. Queenie of Queenie's Bus Tours is voiced by comedian Chelsea Peretti. You might recognize her as Gina from Brooklyn Nine-Nine or from her stand-up. Number 20. When Simon gets zapped by Golbetty, he ends up in the body of Shermie, a little gray cat person in the far-off future of Ooh. We've met Shermie before in the episode Come Along With Me in Season 10. It's heavily implied that Shermie is a descendant or possibly the actual reincarnation of Finn the Human. Just look at that pose. Number 21. Shermie was based on a cat belonging to storyboard artist and now supervising director of Fiona and Cake, Steve Wolfhard. The cat's name is Shortcut, just so you know. Number 22. Shermie is accompanied by Beth, a far-off descendant of Jake the Dog. Number 23. Beth is also known as Pup number 38,000. Jake and Lady Rainicorn's bloodline seems to be going strong. Number 24. Beth has a middle name and a last name, making her full name Beth Burrito Jackson. The burrito likely originates with Jake's love of this food, and Jackson might be a portmanteau of Jake and son, or Jake's son. Number 25. Beth's portal powers take notes from the classic Valve puzzle game, Portal. By letting someone fall from height into one, they can carry their momentum and get launched long distances. Shermie is really good at this. Number 26. Beth also has a storage room of sorts inside of her portal, big enough to hold a multi-story ladder, books like The Great Picnics, and a whole whack of stuffed animals. Number 27. There's also a mug inside of Beth's portal room, and it's almost identical to Jake's favorite cup that he throws away in the Adventure Time episode Puhoy. Number 28. There's also a snow globe in there, and inside that globe is a miniature model of Tree Trunks' house. Number 29. Gibbon, another pup Rainicorn shapeshifter descendant, is also still ruling over his kingdom. One of the pups chasing Shermie and Beth shouts out after them, Gibbon doesn't forgive! Gibbon being the unmerciful ruler of the pup kingdom, who has one of the Ice Thing's gems as an eyeball. Number 30. Beth and Shermie's checklist towards the revolution paints a picture that can only tell us that they're revolutionary communists. Onwards, comrade. Number 31. When Beth and Shermie visit the library, it's in a state of disrepair, but you can still see that there are turtle decorations adorning the outside. Turtle Princess was in charge of the library in Adventure Time, and one can only assume that she held the same role here. Number 32. There's a robot endoskeleton of sorts inside of a turtle shell at the library as well. It dual wields book guns and is pretty darn cool. Number 33. Even Fiona and Cake's shared dream at the end of the episode features a realistic turtle with long blonde hair atop a pile of books reading another book. Man, Turtle Princess getting a lot of representation here. Number 34. We learn that Scarab really is immortal, as Golbetty can't actually stop or kill him, only divide him up into little funky Scarab Juniors. Number 35. This immortality is compounded upon at the very end, where we see Scarab on cleaning duty at Prismo's place. What's an eternity between buddies, right? Number 36. When Simon, in Shermie's body, finds a book about the Magic Crown, he exclaims, Euripides! Euripides! Euripides was an ancient Greek tragedian, famous for such works as Medea and the Trojan Women. Number 37. The library is full of pagelings, but not as we already knew them. Back in the episode Paper Pete, Finn's yawn was stronger than the pagelings attacks. The pagelings in the future library seem much more feral and dangerous, and it must be from either too many hollow books or not enough. Number 38. Huntress Wizard's human counterpart, Hunter, is likely Latino, as evidenced by his saying of Kalinda as the dandelion petals float around in the episode Cheers. Number 39. 
Hunter is voiced by Vico Ortiz, a Puerto Rican drag king, activist, and actor. Number 40. In the episode Casper and Nova, Marsha Lee is wearing a t-shirt that looks a lot like the one Marceline gifted Peabubs when they started dating. Number 41. Ancient Artifacts, the book telling the story of Casper and Nova, is almost identical to the books Simon wrote and showed off to the 20th Century Man exhibit visitors. You know, except for like the gun features. Number 42. Casper and Nova are stand-ins for Simon and Betty, from their chosen quest all the way down to how they make decisions. They want to discover and document important talismans similar to Simon and Betty's antiquarian pursuits, with Casper being very single-minded and Nova wanting to see what else is out there. Number 43. Choose Goose's counterpart in Shermie and Beth's world is known as Pond Swan. Also, all the geese are long gone, implying that some sort of goose extinction event occurred. Very sad for all the Goose fans out there. Number 44. Pon Swan's rhyming cadence extends into his technology as well. He appears to be a cyborg of sorts, and when he flies away using his UFO-like skirt, it leaves behind exhaust letters that spell Eat Feet. Number 45. With Simon taking over, Shermie gets to live inside of his own mind for a while. It's a pretty sweet setup with video games, snacks, and even a little itty bitty statuette of Beth on top of the TV. Number 46. For whatever reason, there are two Hansburg restaurants within a block of each other in Fiona and Cake's world. Is this because Simon can only imagine so many different restaurants, or is it an animation error? Who knows? You can see this in the episode Cheers right after the Scarab kills all of the released egg prisoners. Number 47. There's also a karate dojo called Kick to Win that you can see in the background, which could have been very helpful in fighting off the Scarab. Heck, it would have been very specifically helpful. The ad on the window says that Dan will teach you. Learn to kick, plate, him, her, and bug. Number 48. The fountain we saw on the bus tour has changed thanks to Simon's interactions with Gold Betty. It's no longer a statue of Betty there, but now a statue of gold. Well, it was until the scarab zapped it. Number 49. This statue stays around after the scarab's rampage, too. When Fiona and Hunter are planting weeds in the park, you can see it as the sun rises. Number 50. There's a little bumblebee person outside of the post office as it gets zapped. Check out that yellow and black striped outfit. You always gotta have a bumblebee in here. Number 51. When Cake goes big mode, she takes on the form of Godzilla and even gets a musical cue to boot. This motif is very similar to those from classic kaiju movies. Number 52. Remember that kick to win dojo? Well, apparently Cake did learn. The first thing she does in the fight against the Scarab is kick him through a wall. Kick bug. Number 53. In order to blow the dandelion petals out to all the people in her world, Fiona climbs atop an ice truck. So in a way, Simon slash the Ice King is supporting her in this endeavor. Number 54. After getting blown away by Gold Betty, Simon drifts along, touching down on different shapes. Each time he steps down, he catches a glimpse of a different world. Number 55. The first world he sees is the extinct world, all barren and sunbleached. Number 56. Next up is the vampire world. Flesh, mushrooms, and desperate graffiti as far as the eye can see. Number 57. The third world he steps on is inhabited by really tiny creatures, and he accidentally crushes a fruit cart in the middle of town. I guess it could be worse. Number 58. He briefly touches upon Baby World when a shape brushes up against his arm, but no babies can be seen, just the plush and colorful landscape. Number 59. There's a Water World, Water Park Prank World, a super hardcore capitalist hellscape, a brief visit to Farm World, a Jake World that's mostly just Magic Dog, and a Lava World. Number 60. When Simon finally lands on what appears to be Ooh, there's a little snail to the right of his foot. This is the same snail that has appeared in every episode of Adventure Time, save the pilot, food chain, the wand, Bemo, obsidian, and the frog season's shorts. He's also possessed by the lich at some point. Eh, probably wasn't that big of a deal, right? Number 61. In case you were on the fence about the Scarab, you can go right ahead and consider him a pretty bad dude. The building he destroyed after Fiona World went legit was called Homeless Hamsters. Come on, man. Let those little dudes find their own incredibly creative way to die. Number 62. Fiona and Finn scream pretty much the same way. Finn! <laughs> Number 63. The blue butterfly seen throughout this season might be a facet of Betty looking through all the different worlds. 
Number 64. Cake turning into a hammer is actually sort of foreshadowed by the adventures of Casper and Nova. In the UI around the interactive book, you can see their inventory, and at one point, a hammer very similar in shape to Cake's hammer form is seen in one of the bubbles. This hammer fight is also foreshadowed by Fiona's hammer in her dream in the very first episode. Number 65. Wildberry Princess does have a humanoid form in this world. They can be seen walking their little dog around and cowering from the scarab's attacks. What a cute jacket. Number 66. The ice thing. I mean, Gunther. I mean, Orgolorg. I mean, uh, forget it. The bearded, bird-footed creature with gems for eyes can be spotted at Dirtbeer Guy's place, and he's still missing a gem. Number 67. Jay and Destiny Jr. go on a date at the aquarium, and you can see the penguin room behind them. I'm not saying that's a Chainsaw Man reference, but it could be a Chainsaw Man reference. Number 68. Fiona's roller derby team name, Snarla Gortelli, is a reference to the Cheers waitress, Carla Tortelli. The Cheers influence lives on. Number 69. Somebody's looking for a pet worm in Fiona Land, and that just makes me sad. The poor worm. Number 70. Also, a Daddy Issues themed stand-up night is on a poster. That just sounds perfect for a certain vampire queen. Number 71. In Simon's new 90s themed exhibit, there are a few mannequins on display, representing a valley girl, a skater, and a grandma. The valley girl is wearing an outfit that's very similar to the iconic yellow tartan of Alicia Silverstone's character Cher in the movie Clueless. The skater looks like a skater, and the grandma is very grandma. Number 72. There's also what appears to be a Tamagotchi knockoff on one of the display screens behind Simon. Number 73. The tune that plays at the end of Cheers is called Blue Shift by Kendall Colon 3. She's described as a rabbit girl virtual idol AI born to entertain you on her band camp. Check out some more of her music. Number 74. Every episode of Fiona and Cake is named after a character from the show. You've got the obvious ones like Fiona Campbell and Simon Petrikov, and some more abstract ones like Destiny and The Star. The funny thing about this is that it implies that Cheers is actually a character, not just a sitcom that keeps popping up. Number 75. Sammy and Normulon from the episode Prismo the Wishmaster are yet another reference to Cheers, which has two characters named Sam and Norm. Number 76. The episode The Star shares its name with a tarot card, which represents new hope and revelation, but inverted represents loss and despair. This mirrors the situation of Ooh and Marcy drastically changing with Simon gone. Number 77. Fiona's last name being Campbell is a fun discovery. Finn's biological mother, Minerva, also has the last name Campbell. Number 78. Marshall Lee's mother, Hannah Abadir, runs a vacuum company called Abadir's Vacuums. Get it? You know, because she sucks, <laughs> like a vampire, but also as a person. Number 79. Abadir's home very closely resembles the Nidosphere, just with less demons and killing. Well, on the surface anyway. Number 80. When Gary is first seen making a latte, he puts in a swan design, referencing Princess Bubblegum's winged mode of transportation. Number 81. It's impossible for Marceline to get a tattoo. While attempting to get a matching one with Princess Bubblegum, Marceline continues to heal her skin as soon as the design's put down. Number 82. Peabubs also cannot be tattooed, as her skin is just too darn sticky. It gums up that tattoo machine. Number 83. The magazine MLE, pulled out of Fiona's backpack in Farmworld, is her universe's counterpart to the recurring BLE magazine that appears throughout Adventure Time. The counterparts run deep. Even the magazines get one. Number 84. The Cosmic Owl is also wanted by Scarab, but for a reason you might not expect. Profiteering. Owl? Come on! Number 85. The stickers on Marshall Lee's guitar case are references to real punk bands. An example of this is Daikini Kill, paying tribute to Bikini Kill. Number 86. The cell phone Fiona uses is very similar to a Nokia 3000. Indestructible. Number 87. When scrolling through the Scarab's list of wanted individuals, everybody but Prismo has two mugshots, showing them head-on and in profile. Prismo has only one, because he's literally two-dimensional and could not give you a profile if he wanted. Number 88. Two of Finn's children in Farmworld, Jay and Bonnie, share names with his children from his adventures in Pillow World. I guess Finn likes those names. Number 89. According to Steve Wolfhard, Bimo's wish to Prismo was the one behind Baby World, although Bimo ended up being turned into a baby monitor. 
Number 90. The Ice Scouts in the Winter King's World Look Like the Servant Pearls from Steven Universe. Number 91. The Winter King musical sequence was animated by Small Boo, the husband-wife animation duo known for stuff like Batman, Spider-Man, the game Later Alligator, and my personal favorite, voicing a clown-themed food truck worker in Big Top Burger. Number 92. In Marshall Lee's van, there's a pendant that resembles Marceline's childhood toy, Hambo. Number 93. The suits Marshall Lee and Simon wear to the Blood Drive party are basically the same ones they wore in the comics Adventure Time 2017 Spooktacular. Number 94. When Bimo dies trying to get the remote working again, Cake picks him up. When she does this, her normal powers activate and turn Bimo into the alarm clock we saw at the beginning of the show. Number 95. Fiona has three top fantasies and starts letting people know when Cake starts talking. It's later revealed that her second fantasy is a world made of candy, and her number one fantasy is being turned into a kaiju-sized version of herself. Number 96. In the episode Jerry, there are a few notable errors. The first one is that Bimo's green button appears to be red for a shot. Number 97. Another error appears when Simon is in the library and gets shushed by a patron. The note from Betty that he's holding becomes a book for a moment. Number 98. The last one is that Simon's white streak is missing for a bit during the time that the Lich has Fiona, Cake, and Simon in a trance. Number 99. Dan Mintz voices Jake's offspring, TV. Mintz is best known for voicing Tina Belcher on Bob's Burgers. Number 100. When Simon is in the presence of Golb, the clouds in Fiona World change shape to match the shapes that Golb makes. Number 101. The buildings in Fiona World, even when totally normal at the beginning, have all sorts of strange glitches and anomalies. Doors lead to nowhere, stairs climb where they shouldn't, and architectural oddities are abound. This is likely thanks to being inside of Simon's mind. Number 102. There's a drink called Super Porp advertised next to the slush machines in Casper and Nova, but this isn't the first time that we've seen this. This stuff was first introduced in the Adventure Time episode, Dark Purple. Number 103. Right as Prismo pulls up his laptop to show Scarab how to make stuff, his face glitches out. What's up with that? Could it be foreshadowing to more Adventure Time series? Number 104. Right now, Fiona and Cake sits at a 100% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 98% audience score. Number 105. No new news when it comes to a second season or any other spin-off, however. Executive producer Adam Muto said that it's out of the team's control. Number 106. There are lots of possibilities for a follow-up, though. There are many universes explored during Fiona and Cake that had some loose ends left untied. And there's also the prospect of finding out who Prismo's boss actually is. Number 107. The official soundtrack to the show is labeled Season 1, which does leave room for additional seasons. That's no guarantee, but it is an interesting discovery. Don't you wish we had some more facts for you? Oh yeah, we do. If you caught my drift, you know exactly what movie we're talking about next. Yep, 107 facts about Wish. Number 1. Wish came out during Disney's 100th anniversary celebration, and acts as an origin story to the wishing star featured in other Disney films such as Pinocchio, Peter Pan, and The Princess and the Frog. The stars serve as one of Disney's most iconic symbols, and have been used in the very first shot of the Disney Castle logo since 2006. Number 2. Wish can be considered a celebration for the company's centennial and possibly a spiritual prequel to Pinocchio. In reference to Disney's 100th anniversary, trailers for the film refer to it as a story a century in the making. Number 3. Unlike past fairy tale movies from Disney, Wish is entirely an original idea. This is not an adaptation of a classic tale like Snow White, Cinderella, or Sleeping Beauty. Wish is a story created entirely by Disney, about Disney. Number 4. This is the first Disney animated film to be released in Cinemascope since Lady and the Tramp and Sleeping Beauty. Number 5. It's also the fifth Walt Disney Studios animated film to be released on November 22nd after Beauty and the Beast, Toy Story, Coco, and Frozen 2. I wonder what it is about that day. Number 6. The film is intended to be a celebration of Disney's centennial anniversary, with wishes coming true being its main theme, which was an integral part of the company's history. Number 7. This is Walt Disney Animation Studios' 62nd animated feature film. Number 8. 
Directors Chris Buck and Fawn Vera Sunthorn represent two generations of Disney being brought together. Buck, who started at the studio in the late 1970s, was the mentee of Eric Larson, who was one of the few main animators known as the Nine Old Men during Disney's formative years. Vera Sunthorn joined during Disney's CGI era. Number 9. Wish began development in 2018, but was not publicly disclosed until January 21st, 2022, when it was reported that Jennifer Lee was writing an original film at Walt Disney Animation Studios. Number 10. Wish is the third collaboration between director Chris Buck, writer and executive producer Jennifer Lee, and producer Peter Del Vecho, following Frozen and Frozen 2, where Lee served alongside Buck as director. Number 11. Julia Michaels was announced to write lyrics and music to original songs for Wish alongside Benjamin Rice at D23 Expo in September 2022. By April 2023, Dave Metzger was confirmed to be composing the film's score. Number 12. The score was influenced by the film's original songs penned by Julia Michaels and Benjamin Rice. Since the songs were written long before, Metzger had to look at how to tie his music into the songs. Number 13. As for his toolbox, Metzger used castanets and finger symbols because they had been used in the song instrumentation. He utilized different types of percussion and Mediterranean instruments to bring color to the score. Number 14. Although Julia Michaels had contributed backing vocals to the pop version of Let It Go from Frozen and performed In This Place from Ralph Breaks the Internet, Wish was a three-year endeavor that was the culmination of a lifetime of wanting to write songs for a Disney film. Number 15. The movie's third song, This Wish, was actually the first song written. Michael said in an interview that it was based off a very short paragraph which was the synopsis of the film. And because this film is honoring the 100th anniversary of Disney Animation, she wanted the song to feel classic, yet modern. Number 16. According to Benjamin Rice, I'm a Star was one of the most challenging songs they had to tackle. They're trying to give a 7th grade science lesson in the middle of a pop song, while also incorporating multiple characters, making it catchy, and giving the audience the most positive and inclusive message possible. It's based on the idea that we're all made of stars, and towards the end of the film, the song serves a very direct purpose. Number 17. For the song This Is The Thanks I Get, the composers wanted to capture Magnifico's entire character. They had to show how likable and caring he appeared in public, while also highlighting a dark side that he's good at masking. The more that you hear this song, the darker, deeper, and scarier he gets. In the middle of it, he has to convince himself that he's still a good guy, and no matter what he does, it trickles in that he's not what he seems to be. Also, this is the only song that Asha doesn't sing in. Number 18. This film is dedicated to Bernie Mattinson, a Disney legend who died on February 27th, 2023, and had worked at Walt Disney Animation Studios for over 70 years. Number 19. In July of 2023, it was reported that Disney was considering postponing some of their 2023 releases, including Wish, due to the 2023 Hollywood labor disputes. Number 20. The crew who worked on the movie watched all the previous 61 animated films while working on Wish. Number 21. There are many deliberate references to the movie Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, largely in the opening credits. Instead of saying Disney Presents, they say a Walt Disney feature production in the same font as the opening credits for Snow White. Number 22. Keeping the trend of classic movie references, Wish begins with a fairy tale book opening to tell the prologue before getting into the main story, just like Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and other Disney titles. Number 23. Wish is set in the fictional kingdom of Rosas, a fantastical place where wishes can come true when they're relinquished by the citizens to its ruler, King Magnifico. Number 24. The kingdom is a melting pot of cultures, from those of the Iberian Peninsula to North Africa and even people from the Silk Road. All have influences on the cultural aspect of Rosas. Number 25. King Magnifico's castle is inspired by a military watchtower in Spain. According to the Art of Wish, Seville's 12-sided Torre del Oro, which translates to the Gold Tower, served as inspiration for Magnifico's 12-sided castle. Number 26. The origin of Rosas is similar to that of Corona in Tangled. Both are small islands that did not exist as kingdoms at the start of the story's history, but ultimately were founded and built up over time prior to the start of the story. However, Rosas was founded by King Magnifico. Number 27. 
Speaking of whom, King Magnifico, played by Chris Pine, is a powerful and charismatic sorcerer who rules over and grants the wishes of his people. However, he only grants wishes that are seemingly beneficial to him under the pretense of them being good for his kingdom. Number 28. The name Magnifico means magnificent in Spanish and Italian, which alludes to his narcissistic personality. Number 29. Before the release of the film, King Magnifico had already become beloved by fans due to his cool design and sinister power-hungry character, with many saying he gives off the vibes of traditional villains in Disney's past movies. Number 30. The similarities with classic Disney villains don't end there. His clothing silhouette resembles that of Jafar from Aladdin. He's obsessed with his beauty, reminding many of Disney's first villain, the Evil Queen. Number 31. After absorbing the wishes, Magnifico appeared on every reflective surface on Rosas while saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the handsomest of them all? Another reference to Snow White's evil queen. Number 32. Magnifico's lair features elements from the lair of the evil queen, including the skull with a candle and a poison apple. The way he forges his staff is even evocative of how the evil queen crafted her disguise, and the Book of Dark Magic was based off the queen's spellbook. Number 33. Despite King Magnifico having other apprentices in the past, only Asha seems to care that there are wishes that will never be granted. This implies that all of his previous apprentices kept quiet about the ungranted wishes, so as to not get on Magnifico's bad side. Number 34. While Magnifico is probably one of the most narcissistic of Disney's villains, he's possibly the most sociopathic as well. Since he chooses what wishes to grant and to decline, it's possible that some wishes he rejected from his subjects include asking for their loved ones to be healed of a terminal illness, only for him to reject the wish because it did not benefit him. As a result, he probably has an outrageously high body count simply because he can't be bothered. Number 35. During the climax, Magnifico summons a spiral storm cloud above his castle, in much the same way that Maleficent and Jafar did in their respective films. Number 36. The image of the magic mirror's face flashes for a split second when Magnifico becomes trapped in his staff, implying that he becomes the character in Snow White. Trapping Magnifico inside his staff is also reminiscent of Jafar becoming trapped within the genie lamp in Aladdin. Number 37. According to the Art of Wish, early drafts for Wish had Magnifico as an alchemist and astrologer, in addition to being the evil king, and his lair was originally a glass altar. Later drafts had him sharing the villain role with his queen as an evil couple. Number 38. Yes, Queen Amaya was originally going to be a villain in Unholy Matrimony with King Magnifico, running the Kingdom of Rosas. She was also going to have a sphinx cat called Charo as her pet. However, this idea was scrubbed, and while her personality changed, her design actually stayed the same. Number 39. Amaya is similar to Alidor Blight from The Owl House, as they both had spouses who were evil and cruel, and both grew to be intimidated by them when they started showing their true natures. Yet, in the end, both managed to stand up for themselves, side with the heroes, and cut ties with their spouses for good. Number 40. According to rumors, the design for Star was modeled on Mickey Mouse's face. We can kinda see a resemblance, but both have pretty simple faces. Star is literally just two eyes and a mouth. They do have the same cheerful mood, but we might need to see some proof on this one. Number 41. When Star attempts to enter the King's study, wildly throwing magic around to try and unlock the dumbwaiter, it enchants a quill to start drawing a familiar pair of ears before some scissors go after it. Although the finished drawing is never seen, the intent is clear. Number 42. The macaron tower in the kitchen also features hidden Mickeys. Number 43. Fireworks towards the end of the movie display Mickey ears above the castle. Number 44. The name of the lead character, Asha, is of Arabic origin, meaning alive and well. But it has several meanings depending on which language you're looking at. For example, in Hindi, it means desire, or perhaps more appropriately, wish. Number 45. During her designing stage, Asha was rumored to be a princess. In an interview with Animation Scoop, director Chris Buck confirmed that Asha was not descended from royalty. Number 46. One of the more subtle nods to earlier Disney films is the fact that in the first act, Asha aspires to be a sorcerer's apprentice just like Mickey Mouse in 1940s Fantasia. Number 47. Wish is supposed to take place in the 1200s. 
While everyone else wears period piece shoes, interestingly enough, Asha's are more modern. They appear to be a reference to Princess Diana's wedding slippers. Number 48. When Asha faces off with Magnifico, she wears a blue hood with a pink bow that looks very much like the dress of Cinderella's fairy godmother. This makes sense when you consider Asha's ending as she becomes something of a wish-granting fairy godmother herself. Number 49. Asha is the only character featured in the short Once Upon a Studio before the release of her own movie. Number 50. Asha's grandfather, Sabino, is celebrating his 100th birthday, just like Disney at the time of Wish's release. Number 51. The word Sabino is of Spanish and Latin origin, meaning wise. He's also called Saba by Asha, which is Hebrew for grandfather. Number 52. The character design for Sabino was inspired by Georges Hautcor of the Aristocats, which was the work of one of Disney's legendary nine old men, Milt Call. Number 53. Sabino is wearing the same color scheme as Prince Charming from Cinderella, and his outfit matches that of the prince, also known as Prince Florian, in Snow White. Number 54. At the end of the film, Star recreates the Disney Studios logo, complete with the Mickey Mouse-shaped fireworks and the magical arch over the castle. Number 55. In Magnifico's library, the Book of Forbidden Magic has a serpent eating its own tail on the cover. This is the symbol of the Ouroboros, the world serpent who represents the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Number 56. Magnifico sends out green vines to cover the kingdom, which could be a nod to the thorns Maleficent uses in Sleeping Beauty. Number 57. This is the first Disney animated film to receive a rotten rating on Rotten Tomatoes since 2005's Chicken Little. Number 58. On October 4th, 2023, Disney announced a Wish Together campaign in partnership with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, in which Disney would donate 10% of the sale price of each individual item of merchandise from the film up to $1 million to the foundation. Number 59. Wish was released alongside Napoleon and the wide expansion of Saltburn, and was initially projected to gross 45 to 50 million from 3,900 theaters over its five-day Thanksgiving opening weekend. The film made $8.3 million on its first day and a total of $31.7 million over the five-day period. Number 60 Wish premiered at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, Los Angeles on November 8, 2023 and was theatrically released in the United States on November 22nd. Number 61 Usually in animated Disney films, the good guys wear white and or blue while the bad guys wear purple and or red. In a twist on the trope, King Magnifico, the villain, wears white and blue, while Asha, the protagonist, wears purple and red. Number 62. The opening song, Welcome to Rosas, provides the introduction of the film, similarly to the family Madrigal from Encanto. Asha greets new people and sings about a wishing ceremony and King Magnifico. Number 63. The musical number I'm a Star is full of singing animals in the style of Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid. Number 64. After Asha's wish results in the arrival of Star, she and Valentino chase Star through the woods. During the chase sequence, Asha briefly leans against a well. This well bears a striking resemblance to the wishing well from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Number 65. When Asha looks at a clutch of sentient mushrooms, she calls it crazy, and they respond, We love crazy, a line from Frozen. Number 66. There's also a squirrel in this number that looks an awful lot like the one from The Sword in the Stone. Number 67. At the end of the song, a deer says to a bear, Thanks for not eating me, John, which is an obvious reference to Little John from Robin Hood. Number 68. While in response, the bear says, Don't mention it, Bambi, another nod to a Disney classic. Number 69. One of the rabbits in the woods even thumps his foot like Thumper. Number 70. Pocahontas may get its own shout out too, with sentient trees a la Grandmother Willow and a singing raccoon, a nod to Miko. Number 71. While Asha is standing on the cliff as she makes her wish, the wind blows her hair. This visual is reminiscent of the famous image of Pocahontas in the Colors of the Wind sequence from her movie. Number 72. According to Asha, her father used to tell her that the stars are there to guide us, which is a reference to one of Mufasa's famous speeches to Simba in The Lion King. While Mufasa's advice for Simba is more metaphorical, Asha is inspired by her father's words to wish upon a star. Number 73. 
Asha's seven teenage friends, known as the Teens, are inspired by the seven dwarfs, each sharing the first letter of their respective names. Dahlia is Doc, Simon is Sleepy, Gabo is Grumpy, Safi is Sneezy, Hal is Happy, Bazima is Bashful, and finally, Dario is based on Dopey. Number 74. Harvey Guillen, who usually plays a more optimistic or comedic character, as seen previously in Puss in Boots The Last Wish, plays the cynical deadpan snarker Gabo. Number 75. Guillen is probably best known for his role as Guillermo de la Cruz in the hit Hulu series What We Do in the Shadows. He's also a talented singer, infamously proving his skills by singing the entirety of Sentimental Man from the musical Wicked in Japanese. Number 76. Asha's silly and awkward friend, Dario, is voiced by John Rudnitsky, who is best known as a brief cast member on SNL and for his roles in the 2019 miniseries Catch-22. Moreover, Rudnitsky is an experienced stand-up comedian who made a notable appearance on Conan in 2019. Number 77. Hal is a constantly upbeat friend to Asha. She is voiced by actor, music artist, and voice actor Nico Vargas, best known for their roles in Monkey Wrench and Craig of the Creek. Vargas is also known for their Japanese music covers on YouTube under the name Nico the Piero. Number 78. Another one of Asha's friends, Simon, is a big-hearted and strong ally who always has his head in the clouds. Seasoned actor Evan Peters plays the role of Simon. Evan Peters debuted in 2004 in the drama Clipping Adam, but would gain wide recognition playing multiple roles in American Horror Story from 2011 to 2021. Number 79. The comical character constantly struggling with allergies, Safi, is voiced by American stand-up comedian, screenwriter, and director Rami Youssef. Youssef is best known for his starring role in the Hulu series Rami, for which he won a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor. Number 80. Bazima is the quieter and softer spoken friend of Asha and is voiced by actress Della Saba, best known for her role as Bunny in the Apple TV Plus series Physical. Number 81. Asha's best friend Dahlia uses a crutch to walk. Her voice actor, Jennifer Kumiyama, has arthrogryposis and uses a wheelchair. Number 82. Kumiyama gained recognition after appearing on Warner Brothers reality TV show Pop Stars 2 and subsequently made history as becoming the first performer in a wheelchair for her part in Aladdin, a musical spectacular, at Disney California Adventure Theme Park. Number 83. Asha's pet goat Valentino is also a throwback to Jolly, from the Hunchback of Notre Dame, who is Esmeralda's pet goat. Number 84. Valentino is voiced by the talented Alan Tudyk, who has played various other roles in Disney animated films, notably Turbo from Wreck-It Ralph, Duke of Wesselton from Frozen, Alastair Cree from Big Hero 6, and Hey Hey from Moana. Number 85. Near the end of the film, Valentino wishes for a utopia where all mammals are treated equally and wear clothes, leaving the audience to speculate that this might be how Zootopia got started. Number 86. Amaya introduces a girl whose wish is to fly to a man named Peter who is working on a flying machine. Peter is pretty much dressed exactly like Disney's version of Peter Pan and the girl's clothes and hair are the same color scheme as Wendy. Number 87. During the ceremony where King Magnifico declares Asha a wanted enemy of Rosas, Asha and Star employ some unorthodox help to get Queen Amaya's attention from a creature in a nod to Cinderella. Star enchants a mouse to deliver a message from Asha to Amaya, which is similar to the role of the mice in Cinderella. Number 88. Another direct reference to older Disney movies is the appearance of a familiar outfit. When Asha takes a glimpse of several people's wishes, she sees a woman aspiring to be a dressmaker. The dress she makes is very similar to the one Princess Aurora wore in Sleeping Beauty. Number 89. While Asha attempts to draw Magnifico away, her friends and Queen Amaya attempt to free the wishes from the castle by opening up the roof. In doing this, they're aided by some flying books. These flying books reference the movie The Sword in the Stone, in which Merlin similarly bewitched books to levitate. Number 90. In one scene, Asha can be seen blowing the seeds off a dandelion, much like the memorable image of Belle from her eponymous song in Beauty and the Beast. Number 91. 
Like Tinkerbell, Star floats into the story to provide a bit of magic, and both characters do so by sprinkling dust over others. There's one major difference between Pixie Dust and Stardust. While Pixie Dust gives the ability to fly, Stardust is more diverse in its magic, making animals talk, float, and so much more. Number 92. Near the climax of the movie, after several failed attempts to pull the roof open, the Wish characters come to the conclusion that they just aren't strong enough. A suggestion from Star and Gabo leads them to jump over the railing of Magnifico's study, using gravity to help open up the roof. As they jump, one of the characters lets out a loud yell, which sounds a whole lot like that of Tarzan. Number 93. The credits display a drawing of each animated Disney film over the last 100 years, starting with Snow White and ending with Strange World. Although, not every film is represented. Number 94. Although its success led Disney to keep its animation division running, The Rescuers was excluded from the ending credits, along with The Black Cauldron and Meet the Robinsons. Number 95. If you stay until the end of the credits, Asha's grandfather Sabino uses his mandolin to play the tune of When You Wish Upon a Star from Pinocchio. Number 96. The wishing tree that Asha sits in is a nod to Walt Disney himself. According to the Art of Wish, Walt Disney spent hours on his family's Missouri farm lying under a giant tree. He called it the Dreaming Tree, and there he came up with some of his early ideas. Number 97. Apart from being the voice for Asha, Ariana DeBose had already established herself as a unique and accomplished talent, winning multiple awards including an Oscar, a BAFTA, and a Golden Globe. Number 98. DeBose is a trained dancer, having taken dance at CC & Co Dance Company in Raleigh. This diverse set of talents has led to DeBose being featured in various films and TV, including Hamilton, Schmigadoon, and Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Number 99. Like many popular animated films in recent years, think Spider-Verse, The Bad Guys, and Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, the art style of Wish resembles 2D artwork through computer-generated animation. Number 100. There are some differences between Wish and other films using the same style. Wish combines traditional hand-drawn animation, Disney's original art style, and CG animation, while other films might combine comic style or oil painting style with CG instead. Number 101. The filmmakers had considered making the film traditionally animated at one point. However, they decided against it due to the limitations of traditional animation compared to CGI. Number 102. In order to represent Disney's legacy in a modern aesthetic, production designer Michael Giaimo dug into Disney's first two animated features, Snow White and Pinocchio, and took interest in their watercolor-styled backgrounds and wanted to honor that art in Wish. Number 103. Giaimo has stated that the creative team had to find the right balance, so they leveraged the look for Wish by taking a background from Pinocchio and putting a CG Asha in it. Apparently, it melded quite well. Number 104. The VFX team was given a rule book for these magic effects of Magnifico and Star that were traditionally animated in Harmony Software. These effects, evocative of the sorcery in Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and The Little Mermaid, were translated from their 2D design language into finished CG shots. Number 105. Another effect was the Torchfire volumetric simulation, where they use Neutral Style Transfer, an AI machine learning process developed by Disney Research that calculates how the volume would be represented in terms of a particular style of whatever image you give it. Disney's Raya and the Last Dragon used Neutral Style Transfer for the trippy light effects, and Pixar's Elemental employed it for the look of the fiery ember. Number 106. While far from universal, the painterly, watercolor-like style quickly received praise from certain people, with many quickly comparing it to the Oscar-winning Disney short Paper Man for how it blends Disney's classic 2D animation style and their modern CGI style together. Number 107. Wish still uses the standard 24 frames per second to render characters' movements, but the films we mentioned a little earlier might tend to use fewer frames per second for stylistic reasons. And with that, we've made it to the end of our list. With all of the high-profile movies that came out this year, it was easy to miss some of the ones that made a bit of a smaller splash. But that's okay, they're still here and you can still watch them, and we still have 107 facts about them. Here's 107 facts about Blue Beetle and Haunted Mansion. Number 1. 
Blue Beetle was directed by Angel Manuel Soto, a talented filmmaker known for his unique storytelling approach. Number 2. The movie was produced by Warner Brothers Pictures. Number 3. Blue Beetle is based on the DC Comics character of the same name, which has seen various incarnations since its inception in 1939. Number 4. Jaime Reyes, the person who becomes the Blue Beetle in the 2023 movie, is the third incarnation of the superhero. Number 5. The original Blue Beetle was named Dan Garrett. He was a police officer who took something called Vitamin 2X, which gave him superpowers. Number 6. Dan Garrett's Blue Beetle was published by Fox Comics and, as I mentioned previously, began fighting crime in 1939. Number 7. A second Dan Garrett became the eponymous Blue Beetle in 1964. This version of Garrett was an archaeologist who gained his abilities from an ancient Egyptian scarab, so this time around they were a little closer to who the Blue Beetle is today. Number 8. Charlton Comics was behind this new archaeologist superhero. Number 9. Later on, DC gained control of the Blue Beetle, and soon after, a new Beetle was invented. Ted Cord, a student of Dan Garrett, took on the mantle and continued to fight crime, although he didn't have any superpowers of his own. Number 10. The latest incarnation of the Blue Beetle arrived in 2006, this time in the form of teenager Jaime Reyes. This retconned some info about the Scarab that gives Blue Beetle powers, now revealing that the Superbug is alien in origin. Number 11. The screenplay for the film was penned by Gareth Dunnett Alcocer, showcasing his flair for blending action with deep character development. Number 12. Dunnett Alcocer also wrote Miss Bala, the Catherine Hardwick-directed Gina Rodriguez vehicle and is the writer for Sony's upcoming Spider-Man spin-off, El Muerto. Number 13. This film marks the first time a Latino superhero leads a standalone DCEU movie. Number 14. In the movie, Jaime Reyes is a teenager from El Paso, Texas. Number 15. The movie's plot revolves around Jaime Reyes discovering the Blue Beetle Scarab, which attaches itself to his spine and grants him incredible powers. Number 16. The film takes a specific angle, capturing the essence of family, friendship, and the struggles of growing up. Number 17. The Blue Beetle Scarab, central to the story, is of alien origin and has a rich history intertwined with the fate of the universe. Number 18. In the comic run of Infinite Crisis, Jaime gets recruited by Booster Gold to help attack the Brother Eye satellite, as the Scarab seem to be the only thing that could see it. Number 19. The Scarab also does its best to avoid Green Lanterns in the comics, which could hint at more development in the DCEU. In the DC comics, the Scarab hails from a planet within the Green Lantern Corps Sector 2, home to the Reach, the creators of the Blue Beetle Scarab. Number 20. Sholo Maridueña, who plays the titular hero Jaime Reyes, described his character as more than just relatable. He empathized that Jaime represents many real-life situations, especially the challenges faced by immigrants in pursuit of the American dream. Number 21. You might recognize Meridueña from Cobra Kai, where he plays the role of Miguel Diaz. I'm sure all that karate helped him step into the role of superhero a little easier. Number 22. Sholo wasn't initially a big comic book reader, but became familiar with Blue Beetle through the animated series Young Justice, where the character has a significant arc. Number 23. Sholo didn't audition for the role of Blue Beetle. Instead, he had developed a relationship with the director over the years. Soto felt that Sholo's real-life family dynamics matched the family-centric nature of Jaime Reyes' character. Number 24. Sholo felt a personal connection to the character, especially in terms of navigating his identity as a Latino. He appreciated how the movie celebrated various types of Latinos, emphasizing the diversity within the community. Number 25. Bruna Marquezine plays Jenny Cord, the daughter of the original Blue Beetle, Ted Cord. Jenny is against Cord Industries' shift into weapons and is the one who gives Jaime the mystical scarab. Number 26. Damien Alcazar plays Alberto Reyes. Jaime's father. He's depicted as an eternal optimist, always supportive and full of wisdom. Number 27. Alcazar is a well-known actor in Mexico and is probably best known in the States as Lord Sopespian from The Chronicles of Narnia. Number 28. George Lopez brings to life Rudy Reyes, Jaime's eccentric uncle. 
Despite his quirky appearance, Rudy is a hidden genius who never truly realized his potential. Number 29. Of course, if you've ever been randomly roused from your slumber at 2.30 a.m., you'll probably recognize Lopez from his self-titled television program, among plenty of other comedic ventures. Number 30. Adriana Barraza plays Nana Reyes, a warm-hearted grandmother with a mysterious past. Number 31. Belissa Escobedo plays Milagro Reyes, Jaime's sister. Their relationship is highlighted by their contrasting personalities, Jaime's optimism versus Milagro's realism. Number 32. Elpidia Carillo takes on the role of Rocio Reyes, Jaime's loving mother who dreams of her family's success. Number 33. Susan Sarandon plays the film's main antagonist, Victoria Cord. She's the current owner of Cord Industries and is on a mission to develop deadly new prototypes. Number 34. Sarandon is a well-known Hollywood actor, probably best known for her role in Selma and Louise. Number 35. Harvey Guillen portrays Dr. Sanchez, a scientist working under Victoria Cord at Cord Industries. He is deeply involved in harnessing the Scarab's alien technology for weaponization, so yeah, a lot less cute than his role as Perito in Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Number 36. Raul Max Trujillo plays Carapax, a formidable foe for Jaime. Although he doesn't possess the Scarab, he has a powerful mech suit from Cord Industries. Number 37. As the film's main antagonist, Carapax merges two distinct DC characters. In the comics, Conrad Carapax is the indestructible man, an archaeologist who worked on projects similar to Dan Garrett. Number 38. The film references Carapax's connection to Dan Garrett through the archaeological search for the Scarab. Number 39. Becky G lends her voice to Kaji Da, the alien entity of the Blue Beetle. She communicates with Jaime when he dons his superhero suit. Number 40. Becky G isn't just an actor, just in case you didn't know. She's also a successful Latin pop singer, with quite a few hits under her belt. Number 41. Initially, Blue Beetle was set to be an exclusive for Max, formerly HBO Max. However, due to its potential and the buzz it created, it was granted a theatrical release. Number 42. DC Studios CEO James Gunn, who joined after the film's production, mentioned that while Blue Beetle is a part of the DC Extended Universe, it stands somewhat disconnected from it. Number 43. Gunn also expressed intentions to incorporate Blue Beetle into his upcoming rebooted DC Universe, with Shola Maridueña reprising his role. Number 44. Blue Beetle holds the distinct honor of being the first DC movie based on a character who debuted in comics in the 21st century. Specifically, Jaime Reyes made his first appearance in Infinite Crisis No. 3 in February of 2006. Number 45. In a nod to the legacy of the Blue Beetle, two costumes seen in a facility in the movie resemble those worn by Dan Garrett and Ted Kord, the Blue Beetles preceding Jaime. Number 46. Bruna Marquezini, who plays Jenny Cord, had previously auditioned for the role of Supergirl. This role eventually went to Sasha Kaye in The Flash. Number 47. The opening credits of Blue Beetle are filled with nods to the DC Universe. One particular frame hints at the Green Lantern, showcasing the Scarab coming into contact with a green light in space. This suggests that a Green Lantern may have encountered the Scarab at some point in the vast cosmos. Number 48. Blue Beetle's primary setting is Palermo City. While Superhero has Metropolis and The Flash has Central City, Blue Beetle gets Palermo City. This location, typically set in Texas in the comics, is depicted more like Miami, Florida in the film, giving it a tropical coastal vibe. Number 49. Even though Palermo City is miles from Metropolis, the movie doesn't shy away from referencing Superman's world. Ads for LexCorp, the corporation run by Lex Luthor, and the Daily Planet, where Clark Kent works, can be spotted among the city's skyscrapers. Number 50. DC has its fair share of tech giants, and in Blue Beetle, Cord Industries takes the spotlight. Named after Ted Cord, the original Blue Beetle, it stands as a rival to Wayne Tech and Queen Consolidated. Number 51. Victoria Cord mentions the mining of Prometheum, a rare and powerful alloy. This element is crucial in the DC Universe, used in the creation of heroes like Cyborg and gear for villains like Deathstroke. Just don't mention Vibranium, okay? Number 52. A scene from the 1992 film Kronos is briefly shown on TV. This film, directed by Guillermo del Toro, also revolves around a man who gains powers from a scarab-like device. Hmm, sounds familiar. 
Number 53. A Spanish newscast in the background mentions Bruce Wayne's acquisition of a popular dating app, hinting at the larger DC universe. Even superheroes can't resist a swipe or two. Number 54. Jaime compares his first flight experience to Superman's. Uncle Rudy mentions the Flash, and when Jaime brings up Batman, Rudy calls the Dark Knight a fascist. Number 55. The film acknowledges the legacy of the Blue Beetle. Dan Garrett, the first Blue Beetle, is mentioned as the initial bearer of the Scarab. Ted Cord, the second Blue Beetle and former CEO of Cord Industries, is also referenced. Both of their costumes are displayed in the Blue Beetle base. Number 56. Ted Cord's quirky inventions are showcased, with Milagro Reyes taking a liking to a tech-upgraded gaming glove. This glove is a nod to the Power Glove, a retro accessory from Nintendo. It's so bad. Number 57. The film's opening credits also showcase what transpired after the Scarab landed on Earth. Archaeologist Dan Garrett discovered the Scarab during one of his expeditions. In the comics, Dan Garrett, the original Blue Beetle, first appeared in 1939's Mystery Men Comics No. 1. Number 58. The film's opening montage introduces Ted Kord, the second Blue Beetle in DC Comics history. He was a brilliant scientist who helmed Kord Industries and drew inspiration from the alien Scarab to become the superhero, Blue Beetle. The film establishes that Ted Kord was a known public superhero. Number 59. Ted Kord's Blue Beetle costume is briefly showcased in the film's opening credits. The film ensures not to reveal Kord's face, but presents a comic-accurate costume. Number 60. Unlike Jaime, who utilizes the Scarab's symbiotic armor, Ted Kord crafted his own costume. Number 61. Pago Island, where Victoria Kord takes Jaime to extract the Scarab, and which serves as the base for her OMAC project, originates from Ted Kord's DC Comics history. This island first appeared in Blue Beetle Volume 5, Number 2 from 1967, which also unveiled Ted Kord's origin story. Number 62. Jenny Cord hides the scarab she took from Dr. Sanchez's lab in a burger box from Big Belly Burger, a fictional fast food chain from the DC Universe. Number 63. Big Belly Burger originates from Coast City, home to Green Lantern Hal Jordan. Number 64. When Jaime converses with his father outside their home, he mentions how everything he desires feels out of reach. This could be a subtle nod to the alien society known as The Reach, creators of the Scarab in the comics. Number 65. The film cleverly incorporates Jaime Reyes' original city from the comics. While this movie is set in Palermo City, Jaime's home address includes El Paso Street, referencing his original hometown of El Paso, Texas. Number 66. During a scene where Jaime and Jenny are trying to infiltrate Cord Industries, Uncle Rudy hacks into their security system and replaces the surveillance feed with an animated episode of El Chapulín Colorado, a classic Mexican TV show. This show, created by legendary comedian Roberto Bolaños, parodied popular superheroes. Number 67. The film humorously compares Jaime's relationship with Jenny to the events of Maria La Del Barrio a renowned Mexican telenovela from 1995. This telenovela narrates the story of Maria, who transitions from poverty to wealth after being welcomed by a rich family. Number 68. Blue Beetle's director, Angel Manuel Soto, revealed that the film would pay tribute to Zack Snyder's Man of Steel. The film visually references Man of Steel in two scenes, particularly during Jaime Reyes' first transformation into Blue Beetle. Number 69. Early in the movie, Jaime Reyes is seen wearing a Gotham Law University shirt, indicating that he attended college in Gotham City. This connection to Batman is further emphasized as Jaime's first major appearance outside of the comics was in Batman the Brave and the Bold. Number 70. Victoria Cord's brainchild, the OMAX, One Man Army Corps, are introduced early in Blue Beetle. These are humans augmented with cyborg enhancements. In DC's comics, OMAX prominently appear in the Infinite Crisis crossover series. The most notable OMAX is Buddy Blank, a creation of Jack Kirby from the mid-70s. Number 71. The Palermo City skyline showcases various signs, including one for Ace Chemicals. This company is infamously tied to the Joker's origin, where the clown prince of crime fell into a vat of chemicals at the Gotham facility. Number 72. The supermarket near the Reyes residence is named Mercadito Soto. Given that the director of Blue Beetle's last name is Soto, this could be a subtle nod to his family name. Number 73. 
The post credit scene of Blue Beetle reveals that Ted Kord is alive and may soon become part of the DCEU. Number 74. The scene revisits Ted Kord's secret base, specifically his computer desk. A Polaroid from a test for Kabloom gum and a book on Egyptian archaeology are present, hinting at Dan Garrett's career and Kord's research scientist past. Number 75. Ted Kord's Blue Beetle ship, known as the Bug, makes an appearance. The Reyes family uses it to infiltrate the compound where Victoria Cord has imprisoned Jaime during the movie's climax. The bug first appeared in Captain Adam No. 86 in 1967. Number 76. The OMAC project in the movie is a nod to the Infinite Crisis storyline in the comics, where Batman created the satellite Brother Eye and OMAC. Number 77. The movie showcases a transformation in Jenny Cord, who becomes the new CEO of Cord Industries after Victoria Cord's death. She pivots the company's focus from weapon making to helping the world, reminiscent of Stark Industries in the Iron Man series. Number 78. Blue Beetle and Jenny Cord hint at a budding superhero partnership, with Jenny using her father's tech to aid Blue Beetle. Number 79. The movie pays homage to the 80s, with the tech inside Ted Cord's cave resembling that era. Every time characters enter the cave, a song from the 80s plays. Number 80. As Jaime, Jenny, and Uncle Rudy infiltrate the Cord Estate building, Jaime dubs Rudy as their family's Doc Brown. This is a nod to the Back to the Future trilogy, drawing parallels between Uncle Rudy's inventive nature and the iconic character played by Christopher Lloyd. Wonder if he likes Rick and Morty, too. Number 81. During a confrontation with Carapax, Kajita informs Jaime that she can manifest any weapon he envisions. Being a gamer, Jaime visualizes a sword resembling Cloud Strife's Buster Sword from Final Fantasy VII. Some fans might also see similarities with Titus's Brotherhood from Final Fantasy X or Nero's Red Queen from Devil May Cry. Number 82. In a high-octane battle sequence, Blue Beetle shows off more gaming love while fighting multiple enemies. Before defeating his last opponent, he exclaims, Get over here! I wonder if the Scarab sees Scorpion as a cousin of sorts. Number 83. Observant viewers might recognize some of Blue Beetle's combat moves from the game Injustice 2. Angel Manuel Soto drew inspiration from NetherRealm Studios' 2017 fighting game to bring Blue Beetle's action sequences to life. Number 84. The article mentions a unique Blue Beetle merchandising item, a backpack popcorn vessel. This could be a collectible or promotional item related to the movie's release in the future. Number 85. GBS, which stands for Galaxy Broadcasting System, is the go-to news network in the DC Universe. It's part of the Galaxy Communications Company owned by Morgan Edge in the comics. This network has made appearances in several DC movies, including Man of Steel, Aquaman, The Suicide Squad, and the Shazam films. Number 86. The transformation scene where the Scarab bonds with Jaime was one of the first scenes shot for the movie. Number 87. During the transformation scene, the cast was encouraged to go all out and even improvise. Soto wanted them to react naturally, even if it felt slapstick. Number 88. The director allowed the actors to improvise during some scenes, leading to genuine reactions and moments. Number 89. He emphasized the importance of family in the movie as well, viewing them as unsung heroes who make sacrifices for the betterment of their loved ones. Number 90. Soto's vision for Blue Beetle was not just about introducing a new superhero, but also about paying tribute to families and the sacrifices they make. Number 91. Soto's passion for music played a significant role in shaping the movie's sound. He curated a playlist that reflected the diverse musical tastes of each family member. Number 92. The soundtrack of Blue Beetle includes a mix of traditional music, reggaeton, cumbia, salsa, rock, punk, and even tracks from Cypress Hill and Motley Crue. Number 93. Soto wanted the film's sound to evoke nostalgia, drawing from music that resonated with various Latin American communities. Number 94. Music always played a part in Soto's life. In fact, he formed a punk band known as Los Chaveres, which in part influenced his approach to the film's sound. He said he wanted the audience to feel the music, not just hear it. Number 95. Blue Beetle has been a part of various superhero teams. Ted Kord was a founding member of the Justice League International and was also part of teams like Extreme Justice and LAW. Number 96. Jaime Reyes, on the other hand, has been a member of teams like Teen Titans, Justice League, Young Justice, and Secret Six. Number 97. 
The Blue Beetle's origins have oscillated between magic and science. While the original Dan Garrett's powers were magical, Ted Kord's version was more science-based. Jaime's version initially portrayed the Scarab as a creation of an alien species called the Reach. However, during the DC Rebirth era, it was revealed that the Scarab's origins were magical. Number 98. Ted Kord's Blue Beetle had a close friendship with another hero, Booster Gold. They were known for their prankster antics and had their own series titled Blue and Gold. After Kord's death, Booster Gold mentored Jaime Reyes. Number 99. Blue Beetle's first live-action appearance was on the CW series Smallville. Jaime Reyes was portrayed by Jaron Brant Bartlett. Number 100. The original Blue Beetle, Dan Garrett with one T, is now part of the public domain, so go nuts. Number 101. Angel Manuel Soto always knew that Blue Beetle deserved the IMAX experience. He wanted to provide the best immersive experience possible for this particular movie. Number 102. Ted Kord's Blue Beetle inspired the character Night Owl in Alan Moore's Watchmen. Number 103. The color purple is associated with Victoria Cord and Cord Industries. Victoria frequently wears purple and many elements within the company, including lighting and employee attire, feature the color. Number 104. The WB and DC Studio logos at the beginning of the Blue Beetle movie are designed as extensions of the Scarab's abilities. Number 105. The Scarab has a specific objective on each planet it visits. On Earth, it doesn't follow its usual orders, making its bond with Jaime unique. The Scarab is initially resistant to Jaime's righteousness and is ready to destroy the world. However, as the story progresses, both the Scarab and Jaime undergo significant character development. Number 106. Watching Blue Beetle in IMAX provides a unique experience because of the expanded view. Soto mentioned how the IMAX view almost covers one's peripherals, making viewers feel like they're part of the action, story, and family. Number 107. One of Soto's favorite scenes, shot with the IMAX expanded aspect ratio, is a dinner scene at a Marisco's place in Puerto Rico. This scene, which isn't an action sequence, captures the beauty of the location. And there you have it, 107 facts about DC's Blue Beetle. Number 1. The 2023 version of Haunted Mansion, like its cinematic predecessor in 2003 and the Muppet TV special in 2021, is loaded with easter eggs and references to the classic Disneyland ride. This is a testament to the enduring popularity of the original attraction, which has been thrilling visitors since 1969. Number 2. The director, Justin Simeon, is a former Disneyland employee, so he knows a thing or two about mansions that just so happen to be haunted. Number 3. Simeon also has experience in the world of scary movies, as he previously directed the Weave-themed horror Bad Hair. Number 4. Writer Katie Dippold is no stranger to family-friendly paranormal experiences either. She wrote the 2016 remake of Ghostbusters. Number 5. This duo has crafted a film that not only pays homage to the ride, but also expands upon its lore. Number 6. Their narrative follows a paranormal tour guide as he helps a single mother and her son navigate the newly inherited haunted mansion. Man, when do I get to inherit something cool? Number 7. The film's opening sequence is a direct nod to the Disneyland ride. The first angle at which the audience sees the mansion is the same they would see at the park. Simeon was meticulous about capturing this angle, wanting to evoke the same sense of awe and anticipation that riders feel when they first glimpse the mansion through the park's gates. Fun fact about me, when I went to Disneyland as a kid, the anticipation for the ride made me cry and ask if I could go back to Epcot. Ah, uh, but I liked it in the end. Number 8. The attention to detail extends to the mansion's exterior as well. Fans will recognize the floating candelabra in the endless looking hallway. The 13 hour clock makes an appearance as well. I could use that extra hour in the day. Number 10. The film faithfully recreates the ride's most memorable elements. Even the wallpaper is accurate. Don't taste it though, it doesn't taste like snozberries. Number 11. Originally, Walt Disney asked artist Ken Anderson to develop a haunted house experience for Disneyland. Anderson's rendering of a dilapidated mansion in an overgrown New Orleans bayou was originally rejected by the boss. The ghost house drawing, based on the Shipley Lydecker house in Baltimore, Maryland, eventually became the design used for the Haunted Mansion attraction. Number 12. While the titular Haunted Mansion in the movie is based on the original Disneyland Haunted Mansion, 
Crump Manor, the other mansion the characters must visit, is actually based upon Magic Kingdom's Haunted Mansion at Walt Disney World. Double the haunts. Number 13. The Crump Velvet Rope and Stanchion is pretty much identical to those in the Haunted Mansion ride queue. The bat on top and all. Number 14. The film opens with classic character Madame Leota greeting us with the ride's familiar opening. Welcome, foolish mortals. Number 15. The architecture of the Haunted Mansion in the film is inspired by historical New Orleans design, including the tall entry columns and the emblem and insignia on the brick perimeter gate at the entryway. Number 16. One of the first supernatural encounters in the film is with a menacing knight, who chases the main characters out of the mansion on their first evening. This is a nod to the Haunted Knight figure that riders first see when entering the spooky hallway at the start of the ride. Number 17. One of the most notable ghosts on the ride, The Bride, makes an appearance in the film. Her attic, complete with photos of her ex-husbands whose heads disappear as you pass by, is recreated. Number 18. This effect, which suggests the grim fate of the bride's former spouses, is achieved with CG in the film, but is a clever use of lighting and perspective on the ride. Number 19. Of course, The Bride's name is Constance Hatchaway. Number 20. The Doom Buggy, the ride's unique vehicle, also features in the film. In the movie, it's depicted as the largest chair from the seance room, propelled through the house by supernatural forces to expel unwanted guests. Finally, we know why a bunch of two-seaters are cruising through the house. Number 21. The film's soundtrack includes numerous instrumental versions of the song Grim Grinning Ghosts, which is sung on the ride by animated busts in the graveyard. Number 22. The grim grinning ghost leitmotif played on an organ is subtly woven throughout the film's score. Number 23. The film also includes a nod to another Disney property, The Nightmare Before Christmas. At the end of the movie, the house is decorated for Halloween, a reference to the holiday edition of the ride at Disneyland, which features decorations by Jack Skellington. Anyone else watch Nightmare every October? Number 24. The carved pumpkins outside on Halloween bear the same images of Medusa and a ghostly pair of eyes that appear on the wallpaper in the ride's corridors. Number 25. The Haunted Mansion's official name, Gracie Manor, is a tribute to Yale Gracie, one of the Disney Imagineers responsible for the ride's supernatural illusions. Number 26. Gracie made a modern version of Pepper's Ghost Illusion, which involves reflecting a subject off stage so it appears to be in front of the audience. And Walt Disney liked it so much that he named the mansion after Gracie. Number 27. In the movie, William Gracie, a ghost who inherited the mansion, has his lore expanded upon. It changes a bit from his ride lore and sneaks in some stories from the Hatchet Man. Number 28. In the movie, Gracie is the reason behind many ghosts that inhabit the mansion. He desperately tried to contact his deceased wife with the help of Madame Leota, and every time he failed, more ghosts were released into the house. Number 29. Some Haunted Mansion ride lore combines the stories of Gracie and the Hatchet Man, though the attraction itself presents them as two different people. Number 30. In the film, the evil hatbox ghost's name is revealed to be Alistair Crump, a nod to Rolly Crump, the other Imagineer behind the ride. Number 31. Crump's goal is to reach 1,000 ghosts within the walls of the mansion. His line in the film, there's always room for one more, is a direct reference to one of the attraction's fan favorite lines. Number 32. The Hatbox Ghost was part of the original 1969 installation, but was removed shortly after the ride's debut due to technical issues. In 2015, after decades of absence, the Hatbox Ghost was reintroduced, where it has remained since. Number 33. The film's climax includes a reference to the ride's stretching room. In the movie, the characters use the gargoyles to climb to the ceiling and escape through the rafters, literally going my way as the ghost host on the ride suggests. Number 34. The singing busts, a fan favorite feature of the ride, don't actually make an appearance in the movie. They did shoot a scene featuring the haunted quartet, but it didn't make it into the final cut. Maybe there's room for them in a spin-off. Number 35. The film includes a scene where the characters are chased by a horde of ghostly hitchhikers, a clear reference to the ride's hitchhiking ghosts. Number 36. Gracie Manor is filled with haunted portraits that change appearance, just like on the ride. One of the portraits in the film is Medusa, who transforms into a gorgon when viewed from a different angle. 
Number 37. Director Justin Simeon discussed at San Diego Comic-Con how he included a lot of lore from the Disneyland ride in his film. Number 38. Simeon also hinted at the possibility of the Nightmare Before Christmas version of the Haunted Mansion looping back to become a movie all over again. This suggests that the Haunted Mansion universe could continue to expand in future films. Number 39. Lakeith Stanfield, who I always remember as the lead in the weirdly horse-filled Sorry to Bother You, stars as Ben Matthias, astrophysicist and widower to a ghost tour aficionado. Number 40. Owen Wilson, wow, plays Father Kent, a priest and exorcist who wants Ben to use his funky camera to snap pictures of ghosts at Gracie Manor. Number 41. The last time Owen Wilson starred in a haunted house movie was in 1999, when he played Luke Sanderson in The Haunting. Number 42. Wilson does not utter the magic word wow in this movie. Come on, Owen, say the line. Number 43. Tiffany Haddish is a psychic with some legit powers. Number 44. Danny DeVito plays historian Bruce Davis, a more wholesome throwback to the days before It's Always Sunny. Number 45. Rosario Dawson plays Gabby, the woman who wants to make the haunted mansion into a bed and breakfast. I wonder if you have to disclose that your Airbnb is haunted to get it on the market. Maybe that helps. Number 46. Chase W. Dillon plays Gabby's son, Travis. Number 47. And of course, the Hatbox Ghost, aka Alistair Crump, is played by the famous, infamous, Morbius, Jared Leto. Number 48. Jamie Lee Curtis appears as Madame Leota. Number 49. The original Madame Leota is actually played by Leota Toombs, a Disney Imagineer. That's just her face though. Her voice belongs to Eleanor Audley, better known for her role in Disney classics. She plays Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty and Lady Tremaine, aka the Wicked Stepmother in Cinderella. Number 50. Interestingly enough, this is the second movie that Jamie Lee Curtis and Lakeith Stanfield have appeared in together, the other being Knives Out in 2019. Number 51. Haunted Mansion is also Jamie Lee's second Disney movie remake. The last time she appeared in such a film, she was Tess Coleman in Freaky Friday. Number 52. The film features a scene of astral projection, where the main character, Ben, finds the ghost of a high-pitched opera singing woman who can also be found in the graveyard scene of the ride. Number 53. Ben also encounters a recurring pair of ghost brothers who shot each other in a standoff, echoing the duelist's dual deaths when they first appeared in portrait form on the ride. Number 54. During that astral projecting trip, Ben meets Crump, who summons his own head into the hatbox in his hand, just like he does on the California version of the ride. Number 55. The film features the iconic stretching room that can be found in most iterations of the Haunted Mansion ride. The room includes recreations of the same paintings on the wall that stretch to reveal sinister fates for the image's subjects, including an alligator waiting beneath a ballerina on a tightrope and dynamite underneath another man. Number 56. The man above the keg of dynamite's name is Alexander Nitrikov. Very subtle. Number 57. The ballerina above the alligator is Sally Slater. Hey, that rhymes. Number 58. It seems that the men above the quicksand are named Hobbs, Big Hobbs, and Skinny Hobbs. Which nickname would you choose? Number 59. The film includes a scene where Ben races through the mansion's twisting hallways to find Gracie, but Crump turns the corridors into an indecipherable maze. One of the doors Ben opens in search of a way out leads to a room peppered with staircases, some upside down, some right side up, mimicking the endless staircase scene that was added to the Magic Kingdom's ride in 2007. Also, shoutouts MC Escher. Number 60. When Gabby and Travis are moving to the Haunted Mansion, they rent a U-Haul with a spooky super graphic on the side. The super graphic depicts the Hatbox Ghost, foreshadowing the main antagonist. Number 61. The ghost host, the narrator of the Haunted Mansion ride, appears in the film as an apparition chasing Ben from room to room. Number 62. The ghost host even tries to possess Ben, but thanks to Harriet, he isn't successful. Number 63. The incantation that Harriet performs pulls directly from the ride's narration. When hinges creak in doorless chambers, and strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls, etc, etc. Number 64. As the paintings in 
the stretching room come to life and try to grab Ben and Travis, they spot the ghost host in a hidden room and follow him to escape. Number 65. The scene where Travis stumbles upon a series of tombstones featuring rhyming epitaphs pays homage to some very similar tombstones that greet visitors in line as they wait to board the ride. Many feature the names of Disney Imagineers who built the ride, including Yale Gracie. Number 66. The film features a grand ballroom scene where the ghosts come out to socialize, recreating one of the most beautiful scenes in the ride achieved through hologram technology. Number 67. In the scene where Vic, the over-the-top tour guide, is entertaining guests at the piano, he's playing a version of It's a Small World After All. Number 68. The seance room is another feature from the ride that's included in the film. In the ride, the doom buggies travel in a circular motion to face the center of the room, where riders are greeted by Madame Leota who begins her chants to bring up the spirits. The film includes a similar scene, complete with supernatural objects and lights appearing out of nowhere to add to the creep factor. Number 69. Haunted Mansion boasts 999 ghosts, a number that's a direct reference to the ride's famous tagline, 999 happy haunts, but there's room for a thousand. There are 999 souls that reside here. But there's always room for one more. Number 70. The film also includes a scene where the characters encounter a ghostly tea party, a nod to the mad tea party ride at Disneyland. This scene is a fun crossover between the beloved Disney attractions. Number 71. The film includes a scene where the characters encounter a ghostly raven, a nod to the raven seen throughout the Haunted Mansion ride. Number 72. There's also a scene with a ghostly library, also found on the Haunted Mansion ride. Number 73. The Grand Hall serves as a central location location in the film during a fight scene. Riders on the Disneyland attraction travel along a balcony overlooking the marquee ballroom scene where ghosts waltz in endless circles. Number 74. Keep an eye out. Portraits change from shot to shot, and a pair of busts follow the movements of the living in the film. What might look normal in one shot can change in an instant. Number 75. Returning a mariner ghost to the sea serves as a central plot point in the film. An early script for the Haunted Mansion attraction at Disneyland created by Anderson ultimately went unused used, but it featured a character known as Captain Gore or Captain Blood, whose family met their demise in the mansion. Number 76. Actor and comedian Joe Coy makes an appearance as the bartender. Number 77. Guillermo del Toro was attached to a Haunted Mansion movie that never quite came to fruition. He was supposed to write and produce as part of a plan that dates back to 2010, but by 2013, he was no longer going to direct. He did stay on for a while as producer and co-writer. Number 78. Del Toro had plans to use the Hatbox Ghost from the start. He mentioned they already had concept artwork and maquettes of the Hatbox Ghost, which likely would be played by Doug Jones. Number 79. Del Toro's version would have been a lot scarier than what made it to theaters, taking place in a heightened reality. However, his script was deemed too scary for family audiences, even at a PG-13 rating. Number 80. Guillermo del Toro would have had an absolute blast directing a version of Haunted Mansion, as he himself is a super fan. His personal horror museum features a hidden hallway behind a bookcase that leads to a Haunted Mansion wonderland. Number 81. Ryan Gosling was also attached to this doomed version of Disney's Haunted Mansion, and was even seen on some rides with del Toro at Disneyland. However, nothing ever seemed to materialize. Number 82. The 2023 Haunted Mansion movie was set for release 20 years after the first Haunted Mansion film adaptation. Number 83. As of January 2022, the film was being shot in the French Quarter and Lafayette Cemetery Number 2 under the name Joyride. Number 84. The film has received mixed reviews from critics. Some praised its humor and performances, while others criticized its lack of scares and over-reliance on CGI. Number 85. The film's production was a major undertaking, with a large cast and crew working to bring the iconic Disney attraction to life. The film's sets were designed to be as close to the original attraction as possible, and the film features many of the same characters and scenes. Number 86. The film's special effects were also a major focus of the production, with a team of artists working to create the film's many ghostly apparitions. Number 87. The film's soundtrack was composed by Michael Abels who previously worked with Simeon on his film Bad Hair. Number 88. Stranger Things fans got a fun surprise when they saw Winona Ryder in a cameo role. 
She's definitely used to odd houses and haunted happenings, given her experience with Beetlejuice. I guess Beetlejuice was only the beginning, as Hawkins tends to host lots of paranormal activity too. Bet you thought I was gonna say Beetlejuice a third time, eh? Well, I'm not that stupid. Number 89, another fan favorite TV star makes an appearance too, Dan Levy. Although his rundown house experience is limited to a crappy motel in rural Canada. Number 90, Dan Levy has less than 30 seconds of screen time in the film. Number 91, Disney characters from theme parks and other movies attended the red carpet premiere for Haunted Mansion. Usually this wouldn't happen, but no actors could show up to promote the movie due to to the ongoing strike. Number 92, every Disney flick has to have some Mickey ears somewhere, Travis can be seen wearing a watch adorned with the image of Disney's number one mouse. Number 93, Travis also shows some Marvel love as he's got a Black Panther action figure. Number 94, Disney hopes that Haunted Mansion can cash in to the same degree as Pirates of the Caribbean. There's something about that theme park ride magic that puts people in seats. I wonder how they're gonna make something even half as epic as the Pirates of the Caribbean theme music though. Number 95, the Hatbox Ghost's original design was based on on Lon Chaney in his role in the film London After Midnight. Number 96, Haunted Mansion premiered at Disneyland in Anaheim, California on July 15th, 2023. Number 97, this means that the movie's release landed just before the 54th anniversary of the ride's opening on August 19th, 1969. Number 98, the cast of the movie appeared on Celebrity Family Feud ahead of its release. Number 99, the movie was advertised on the back of pedicabs in San Diego. Number 100, as of August 8th, the movie had grossed 63.2 million. It did not top either Barbie or Oppenheimer. Number 101, Haunted Mansion cost around 150 million to make, which potentially lands it in the box office flop category. We'll see how it does over the coming weeks. Number 102, critics seem to share the same opinion, a pretty middle of the road showing across the board. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 40%, a 6.3 on IMDb, and 40 8 out of 100 on Metacritic. Number 103, Eddie Murphy, the star of the first Haunted Mansion movie, unfortunately is not part of the new one. Number 104, however, it's probably for the best. After all, the original scored quite low with critics and only really started to make serious cash once it was released internationally. Number 105, that Haunted Mansion had singing busts though, so who can say what works and what doesn't? Number 106, there are a grand total of five Haunted mansion rides around the world, but two have different tales to tell. Paris's Haunted Mansion spins a yarn about a bride who's doomed. Hong Kong doesn't have a haunted mansion per se, but instead has a mystic mansion, which is more magical and less ghostly. Number 107, there is no official sequel in the works yet, but director Justin Simeon has mentioned that there is potential. And that's it folks, we've journeyed through the eerie corridors of the haunted mansion, uncovering secrets and easter eggs along the way. I can't walk up concrete stairs anymore without thinking about that one fight from John Wick 4. So much tumbling, so much climbing. What's your most memorable assassin-fueled moment? Think about it and get back to me once you've watched 107 Facts about John Wick Chapter 4. Number 1. Just like the first three chapters of the John Wick series, John Wick Chapter 4 is helmed and directed by Chad Stahelski. Number 2. Before hopping into the director's chair with John Wick, Stahelski was originally a stuntman. He actually worked with Keanu Reeves as Keanu's stuntman in the Matrix movies. Number 3. John Wick Chapter 4 was first announced by Lionsgate on May 20th, 2019, just three days after John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum was released. Number 4. Die-hard John Wick fans received the announcement through an opt-in texting update service for the series. The message read, You have served, you will be of service. The message also gave an original release date of May 21st, 2021. Number 5. John Wick 4 was planned to be the same release day as the fourth Matrix movie, The Matrix Resurrections. The latest Matrix also shares DNA with John Wick, of course, from Keanu Reeves as Neo to Chad Stahelski's Matrix history. He even has a cameo in the movie. Number 6. Due to the pandemic, in May 2020, that initial release date was pushed back by a whole year. From there, the new release date was May 27th, 2022. Number 7. Right around the time of the delay, John Wick 4's writers were brought onto the project. This time, however, Lionsgate didn't go for Derek Kolstad, creator and writer of the first three John Wick movies. 
Number 8. When Kolstad originally wrote John Wick, he pitched the screenplay as a story called Scorn. Of course, he pitched it to Thunder Road Pictures, the production company behind John Wick. Number 9. Thunder Road Pictures signed Keanu Reeves to the movie in 2013, and he suggested the title of the movie be simply changed to the main character of Scorn, John Wick. Number 10. John Wick was actually named after Kolstad's maternal grandfather of the same name. Number 11. With Kolstad out, the studio brought in Shea Hatton as the main writer instead. Hatton already had experience with John Wick, as co-writer with Kolstad on John Wick Chapter 3, Parabellum. He also wrote the story for the upcoming John Wick spin-off, Ballerina. Number 12. Later, Stahelski himself brought writers Ricky Staub and Dan Walzer on board to write Chapter 4. He was thoroughly impressed by their film Concrete Cowboy. Number 13. However, within a month's time, Staub and Walzer were out and were replaced as Hatton's co-writers by Predators writer Michael Finch. Number 14. Principal filming for John Wick Chapter 4 began June 28, 2021. Number 15. The movie was filmed on location all over the world, including New York City, Germany, Japan, and Paris, France. Number 16. Towards the beginning of the movie, there's a scene that actually takes place in a desert. Not only was that filmed in a real desert, it was actually filmed at the same rock where Lawrence of Arabia was filmed. Number 17. Filming in Paris was particularly difficult. The team had filmed in Germany first, but filming got stalled there, delaying the Paris filming by about two weeks. Number 18. Time was slipping away and the film crew was already under the gun. Even worse, Stahelski would often cancel planned Paris filming locations while improvising others, with little notice for Parisian film staff and authorities. Number 19. Stahelski's on-the-fly process became frustrating for staff like Pascal Ricourt, the general manager of John Wick 4's Parisian team. According to Ricourt, when Stahelski noticed his concerned face, Stahelski simply told him we were born to suffer. Number 20. Stahelski wanted to shoot at a number of locations featured in the Jean-Pierre Jeunet movie, Amelie. While that movie is decidedly not John Wick, Stahelski was eager to shoot action scenes in the same places. Number 21. Specific Parisian locations featured in the movie included the Arc de Triomphe, as well as a sunken cathedral known as La Défense Cathedral. Number 22. The subway station where John Wick meets Winston and the Bowery King is a little-used real Parisian subway stop called Porte de Lila. The station is regularly rented to film crews so they can film in a genuine Paris subway without stopping the more major lines on the network. Number 23. The stairs fight scene was filmed on the 222 stairs going up to the Sacré-Cœur Basilica. Number 24. When Stahelski came to fight coordinator Jeremy Marinus with the stair fight concept, Marinus' first concept was, my quads and hammies are gonna kill me. And yet, he described it as just another day at work. Number 25. Scouting the location, Stahelski first saw the stairs directly facing the basilica and was underwhelmed by how intimidating they didn't look. So he shopped around a little more and found the much more harrowing stairs on the left side of the building. Once he saw those, he and his stunt team knew it was perfect. Number 26. Stahelski and his team filmed this scene over the course of seven different nights. Occasionally, the crew would have to wait for the cable car to carry tourists up the stairs. Number 27. 35 different stunt people were involved in the scene. By fight coordinator Scott Rogers' count, one particular stuntman was killed by John Wick at least five or six different times. Number 28. For some shots, padded stairs were added as a hidden way to soften the blow. However, the stuntmen often had to take the brunt of the actual stairs during the shoot. Thankfully, aside from some bruises, no one suffered a concussion. Number 29. Even John Wick himself was daunted by the stairs. For the moment where John Wick exasperatedly looks at the stairs, Stahelski felt that the shot was 50% the character and 50% Keanu Reeves himself. Number 30. Among all the stuntmen killed, Keanu Reeves actually kept count. When filming was over, Reeves gifted each of the stuntmen a t-shirt featuring the number of times they were killed on screen. Some stuntmen's death count climbed higher than 20. Number 31. For his personal five-man team of stuntmen, Keanu Reeves gave each of them a $10,000 Rolex Submariner watch, each one with a personalized message on the back. Number 32. Keanu, of course, did a number of stunts himself. When you see John Wick on the stairs, it's all him. Except for the really big stair fall, as Stahelski put it. Number 33. That fall was performed by Vincent Bullion, Keanu Reeves' stunt double throughout the film. That particular fall actually needed two takes because Bullion got stuck on a railing during the first take. Number 34. Bullion was offered the job through his connection with Laurent Demianoff, 
the stunt choreographer for John Wick Chapter 4. The two had worked together on a different film, and Demianov threw Bullion's name out there as a possibility for Keanu's stunt double when it came time to make John Wick. Number 35. To prepare for the stunts he did himself, Keanu Reeves went through 12 weeks of martial arts and stunt driving training. Number 36. Of course, given the nature of a movie like John Wick, accidents can happen. According to Vincent Bouillon, during one shoot, Reeves was supposed to punch someone. Well, he said Reeves thought he accidentally hit the guy too hard, even though the stuntman was fine. Number 37. From there, even just thinking he hurt the stuntman, Reeves profusely apologized. Reeves had even described the incident as cutting a gentleman's head open, even though he hadn't done any actual harm. Number 38. Bullion also mentioned that Reeves would go out of his way to ensure the stunt team had the best catering possible on set. Number 39. Of course, Keanu Reeves was nice to everybody on set too, not just the stuntmen. For every new filming location, he would make a personal introduction to the new crew that he was meeting, thanking them for being there. Number 40. Keanu even invited Vincent Bullion to John Wick 4's Paris premiere. He personally texted him an invite a year and a half after filming had wrapped. Number 41. Stahelski has said that the top-down action scene with the Dragon's Breath shotgun was inspired by a 2019 video game called Hong Kong Massacre. Number 42. The set for this sequence was built in Studio Babelsberg in Potsdam, Germany, and overseen by production designer Kevin Kavanaugh. Number 43. To make the sequence work, the team spent a month building the seven-chamber structure with 12 to 14 foot high walls, and they just barely beat the buzzer. The set was finished on a Sunday night, with filming slated to begin Monday morning. Number 44. Even more impressively, the entire scene was shot in one continuous take. Almost. According to Stahelski, the only cut happens just before the guys in the kitchen are lit on fire. Number 45. As for making the scene look as good as possible on camera, that task fell to the cinematographer for John Wick Chapter 4, Dan Lostin. Number 46. To pull it off, Lostin used a spider cam, a special camera set up with four wires attached to the four corners of the set and operated with a joystick. This allowed the camera to move freely, tilting, panning, and zooming in on actors when it needed to. Number 47. Lostin even used a particular camera and lenses to capture as many details as possible. Compared to John Wick's 2 and 3, Lostin said that the camera for this scene had bigger formats and bigger sensor options. Number 48. One take meant no mistakes, so Laurent Damianov perfected the scene's choreography over the course of three weeks in preparation for the shoot. Number 49. When the scene was originally shot, the incendiary bullets from the Dragon's Breath weren't actually there. The flames were actually added in post-production as visual effects. Number 50. After the scene was first shot, watching it back, it didn't look nearly as impressive as they'd hoped. Apparently, it was so unimpressive that the whole scene was actually in danger of being cut from the film before temporary visual effects were added to show how it was supposed to look. With a more completed vision to see, the scene made the cut. Number 51. Filming that scene was difficult for sure, but the shootout at the Arc de Triomphe was the most dangerous, according to Chad Stahelski. Number 52. The shoot for that scene featured 20 to 30 stuntmen, all driving 40 miles per hour across four lanes of cars, all trying not to hit Keanu Reeves as he weaves between them. Stahelski knew how easy it was for things to go wrong. Number 53. While safety was the primary concern, this particular scene added an additional challenge, the clock. The team couldn't film with the actual Arc de Triomphe in the background, as they would only have been allowed four hours of filming per night, which wasn't enough. Number 54. So for the sake of time, the fight itself was actually filmed at Tegel Airport in Berlin. All of the background shots of the Arc de Triomphe were added in post-production. Number 55. It took eight months to put the Arc de Triomphe shots together using shots of the Arc itself from all sorts of angles. Eventually, the post-production team put the whole shot together with the stunts in front of the digitally added arc in the background. Number 56. Despite all of the delays and general difficulties, filming for John Wick Chapter 4 concluded on October 27th, 2021. Number 57. While John Wick has tons of influences behind it, for Chapter 4, Stahelski specifically pulled from the 1979 film The Warriors. Funny enough, Warriors alum David Patrick Kelly was actually in the first two John Wick movies as Charlie. Kelly played the villain Luther in The Warriors. Number 58. Aside from the general structure of the movie, there's even a direct Warriors reference, the DJ in Paris. Like the DJ in The Warriors, she keeps everyone updated on John Wick's location, and is even filmed from the eyes down in the exact same way. Number 59. 
If you can believe it, the John Wick series was actually intended to be a trilogy. The first film was a one-off, but after its massive success, there were initially only plans to expand the series into a trilogy. A fourth film was never planned. Number 60. While the first three John Wick films take place in one continuous sequence, there's actually a time skip for Chapter 4. It's set several months after Chapter 3, so John Wick has had some time to recover since the events of Parabellum. Number 61. Watching John Wick Chapter 4, you'll recognize plenty of familiar faces in the mix. Ian McShane is back as Winston Scott, Lawrence Fishburne is back as the Bowery King, and Lance Reddick is back as Sharon. Number 62. Tragically, Lance Reddick passed away from natural causes on March 17, 2023, a week before the film's theatrical debut. Number 63. At the movie's premiere, to pay respects to Lance Reddick, Keanu Reeves and the other stars wore blue ribbons, blue being Reddick's favorite color. Number 64. Reddick's untimely passing makes John Wick Chapter 4 his final completed film role, though he had filmed a number of scenes for Ballerina and is set to appear in that movie as well. Number 65. For all the returning characters, there are a number of new characters in Chapter 4. Perhaps one of the deadliest is Donnie Yen playing Kane, John Wick's old friend and the deadly high table assassin. Number 66. At first, Kane was a very different character to look at. In the original script, his name was Shang or Chang by Yen's account, and the character wore a Mandarin collar. Number 67. Yen felt the initial version of the character was too much of a stereotype, so he worked with Stahelski to rework the character into the cane we see in the film, complete with the slick suit the assassins in John Wick are known for. Number 68. Kane's distinct blindness was inspired by Zatoichi, the story of a blind wandering swordsman, first created by Kan Shimozawa in 1984. Number 69. Funny enough, this is not the first time Donnie Yen has played a blind martial arts master. Yen also played the blind yet force-sensitive monk Chirrut Imwe in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Number 70. Kane is hardly John Wick's only new adversary, though. There's also Bill Skarsgård as Marquis Vincent de Gramont. Number 71. When offered, Skarsgård was excited to take the role. He liked that it seemed to be intended for an older actor, and he's been a fan of Keanu Reeves since he first saw The Matrix when he was 8 years old. Number 72. Playing the character, Skarsgård was told the Marquis had no backstory. This was an exhilarating prospect for Skarsgård. He got to make the character's backstory up all on his own. Number 73. Writing the Marquis, Michael Finch described him as one of the most loathsome characters in the four movies, and they needed an actor who could express a fake formalism and politeness at the same time. Number 74. Things are bad enough between Kane and de Gramont, but there's still more gunning for John Wick. For instance, there's a new character, Mr. Nobody, aka The Tracker, played by Shamir Anderson. Number 75. For his performance, Anderson said he was inspired by Heath Ledger's version of the Joker in The Dark Knight. He said you knew, like the Joker, that the Tracker had a robust yet mysterious past. Number 76. Anderson put his own personal twists into the character, though we wouldn't see it just watching the movie. Anderson regularly wrote in Mr. Nobody's notebook at home and packed his backpack with dog toys, treats, and even lighters with the actor's name engraved on it. Number 77. At 2 hours and 49 minutes, John Wick Chapter 4 is the longest John Wick movie so far, and a full hour longer than the first. Number 78. Amazingly, the original cut was even longer, clocking in at 225 minutes, just a quarter shy of four hours long. Number 79. Despite the lengthy runtime of the movie, John Wick himself says very little the whole time. In fact, he only says 380 words throughout the movie, almost a third of which are monosyllabic responses like yeah. Number 80. Turns out this was Keanu Reeves' decision. He took a look at the original script and pared down a ton of John Wick's written dialogue. Number 81. John Wick's longest line in the movie is hardly a monologue either. At one point he says to Shimizu Koji, You and I left a good life behind a long time ago, my friend. That's it. Just 14 words. Number 82. Shimizu Koji is actually played by Hiroyuki Sanada. He and Keanu Reeves both starred in 47 Ronin together. Number 83. Chad Stahelski first created the role of Koji specifically with Hiroyuki Sanada in mind. Number 84. 
Sonata was approached to play Zero in John Wick Chapter 3, Parabellum, but he backed out to appear in Avengers Endgame instead. The role then went to Mark Dacascus. Number 85. However, Stahelski left the name of the character up to Sonata himself. Sonata decided to call the character Shimazu after a large name in the Kagoshima countryside, where Sonata's mother grew up. Number 86. The family name was set, but Keanu Reeves and Donnie Yen wanted their characters to call Shimazu by his first name as a sign of familiarity. They felt that the last name would be too distant, but the character didn't have a first name. Number 87. So, Sonata pulled the first name Koji from one of the choreographers on set. Koji Kawamoto. Sonata asked if he could use his name, and Kawamoto gave a delighted but surprised yes. Number 88. As for Koji's daughter, Akira, she's played by Rina Sawayama, a Japanese singer. John Wick Chapter 4 is actually her first feature-length film. Number 89. Stahelski offered her the role after randomly seeing the music videos for her songs XS and Bad Friend on YouTube. He was impressed by her choreography, so he felt she'd be a good fit and called her to offer the role within a day's time. Number 90. Rina Sawayama actually performs the song that plays during the credits, Eye for an Eye. Number 91. One character in John Wick Chapter 4 that particularly stands out is Klaus, a member of the Ruska Roma. He's played by Sven Marquard. Number 92. While not an actor, Marquard is famous all on his own, as the notoriously discerning bouncer of Berlin's hyper-exclusive techno club, Berghain. Number 93. Even the techno club that John Wick fights Klaus in is a reference to the Burkane where Marquardt works. Number 94. And you see all those tattoos and piercings on his face? That's not makeup to make the character look scarier. That's Sven Marquardt's normal day-to-day -day look. Number 95. John Wick doesn't say much in the movie, but Klaus says even less. All he says is, I am Klaus. If you were wondering, yes, that is a reference to Groot's now iconic I am Groot from the MCU. Number 96. The goof actually started out as a simple line placeholder in an early version of the script. Before the character was cast, the writers had the character simply say I am Klaus until they could give him proper dialogue. Well, the bit ended up being so funny that they just left it in. Number 97. Chapter 4 was initially intended to be filmed and released alongside Chapter 5 as a kind of double feature. However, Chapter 5 was dropped at some point for unknown reasons. Number 98. In some regions, the movie isn't simply called John Wick Chapter 4, but it has the additional subtitle of Baba Yaga. Number 99. According to an accidental leak from Shamir Anderson, the movie was originally going to be called John Wick Chapter 4, Hagakure. Number 100. The music for John Wick Chapter 4 was done by Tyler Bates and Joel J. Richard. They also did the score for the first three John Wicks. Number 101. Chapter 4 also features EDM music from famous EDM artists Gasafelstein and Justice. There's lots of French music because the third act largely takes place in Paris. Number 102. With all the stunts done, the filming wrapped, and the effects all tied together, John Wick Chapter 4 released on March 24th, 2023. Number 103. At one point, Point, the release date was pushed back from the revised release date of May 27th to avoid going up against Top Gun Maverick, which released the same day. Number 104. Worldwide, John Wick Chapter 4 has pulled in 251.8 million in gross as of April 5th, 2023. It garnered 29.4 million on its first day alone. Number 105. This makes it the best opening day of the whole John Wick series, and the best for an R-rated movie since the start of the pandemic in March 2020. Number 106. For the ending, while things look grim, Stahelski has said that he leaves it up to the fans to decide whether or not John Wick is truly dead. Number 107. As for Keanu Reeves, he says that he's down for John Wick 5, but only if Stahelski is involved. Beyond that, he said he hopes that John Wick has found his peace. In the meantime, you can find peace in the fact that Keanu Reeves will reappear as John Wick in Ballerina, at the very least. As for John Wick's future, if he has one, we'll just have to wait and see. Premiere TV's so funny, don't you think? They blow people's minds with a season full of twists, turns, and drama, and then everyone's gotta wait a few years before the follow-up. I know that's just the way that things work, and people behind the scenes are doing everything that they can to get us the next season, but it still kind of makes me chuckle. So while we wait for TLOU Season 2, why not enjoy a quick recap via 107 facts about The Last of Us. Number 1. As you might have guessed, The Last of Us on HBO is based on the 2013 video game of the same name developed by Naughty Dog. The events of the first season directly follow the events of the first game. Number 2. The Last of Us is actually the first show in HBO's history to be based on a video game. Number 3. 
The Last of Us video game was directed and written by Naughty Dog's Neil Druckmann, and he's also involved in the show. He's credited as creator, executive producer, writer, and even directed the second episode. Number 4. When talks started about a live action The Last of Us, the original plan was to develop it into a film. The Last of Us movie was in the works alongside the Uncharted movie. Number 5. At one point, the film was all set to be distributed by the Sony-owned Screen Gems. Anyone familiar with video game movies will recognize Screen Gems for distributing all of those live-action Resident Evil movies with Mila Jokovic. Number 6. Unlike those Resident Evil movies though, Paul W.S. Anderson was nowhere near The Last of Us. Actually, Sam Raimi of Evil Dead and Spider-Man fame was in line to produce and direct. Number 7. This would-be movie adaptation of The Last of Us was first announced back in March 2014. Number 8. However, by 2016, the whole project entered development hell. At the time, Druckmann said that the last work done on the movie was a table read with a second draft of the script, and that had been a year and a half earlier. Number 9. When making the movie, Druckmann was constantly fighting off executive meddling. He said that there was a lot of pressure to make The Last of Us feel bigger and sexier. Number 10. Before long, this potentially bigger, sexier Last of Us movie completely fell through. The rights to the IP ended up lapsing, and Screen Gems was officially out as distributor. Number 11. Here's where Craig Mazin gets involved. He's the co-creator and co-writer of The Last of Us alongside Neil Druckmann. Mazin is also known for his other successful HBO series, Chernobyl. Number 12. PlayStation first approached him in 2018. They showed him a list of their IP, asking him to pick one to adapt into a television series. Number 13. Well, Mazin was disappointed to see that The Last of Us was not on the list. He had been a fan of the game since it came out, and said he'd even played through it about 12 times. Number 14. Within the first 10 minutes of playing the game, Mazin said to himself that someone is going to adapt it into a show or movie, but he didn't think it would ever be him. Number 15. Once Mazin learned about PlayStation's plans for a Last of Us movie, he suggested that a TV show would be a better fit for adapting the game's narrative. Number 16. Sure enough, Druckmann agreed. When making the movie a few years prior, Druckmann was actually struggling to fit the 15-hour story into a 2-hour film. Number 17. Mazin and Druckmann had a meeting, decided to make it a show, and pitched The Last of Us to HBO only a week later. Number 18. Sure enough, HBO was optimistic about their pitch. HBO announced that The Last of Us was in the early planning stages in March 2020. Number 19. The Last of Us was announced as a co-production between Sony Pictures Television, Naughty Dog itself, as well as PlayStation Productions. Number 20. The Last of Us is actually PlayStation Productions' first TV show that they've ever produced. Number 21. Druckmann and Mazin were named executive producers, with a few other names thrown in too. First, Carolyn Strauss shares executive producer duties. She was also executive producer on other HBO properties like Game of Thrones and even Mazin's own Chernobyl. Even Naughty Dog got one of their guys in there. Naughty Dog's president, Evan Wells, also was brought on to The Last of Us as an executive producer. Number 22. The Last of Us was produced in Canada under the name of Bear and Pear Productions. Number 23. A lot of hands were changing behind the scenes during these early stages. In June 2020, Johan Rank, who directed a number of Chernobyl episodes, was brought on as the executive producer and director of the first episode of The Last of Us. Number 24. However, by November 2020, Rank dropped out of the project from COVID-relating schedule conflicts. Number 25. While Rank was out, HBO was now officially in. On November 20th, HBO formally greenlit The Last of Us TV series. Number 26. Also, two more executive producers were added to the roster. Asad Kizilbash and Carter Swan, both from PlayStation Productions. Even more companies were getting involved. Word Games jumped on as a production company with Mighty Mint joining the project a few months later. Number 27. With all of these executive producers and production companies, the pilot episode of The Last of Us still needed a director. Well, in January 2021, Kantemir Balagov was announced as the first episode's new director. Number 28. However, he would also end up leaving, but due to creative differences. Although Mazin himself took over directorial duties, about 40% of the first 40 minutes of Balagov's footage remained in the final cut of the episode. Number 29. Pre-production on The Last of Us started in Calgary, Alberta, Canada on March 15, 2021. 
Number 30. All this time, Druckmann and Mazen had been writing away. Up front, they needed to figure out just how far to deviate from the original source material. While a number of lines from the show are taken directly from the game, Druckmann looked forward to the opportunity to unplug from Joel and Ellie to tell the story. Number 31. For example, unlike the game, The Last of Us show takes opportunities to go into character backstories and better explain the origins of the Cordyceps outbreak. The video game doesn't leave Joel and Ellie's side, so these points couldn't be explored within that format. Number 32. When it came to changing things up, Druckmann followed one key rule of thumb. If they want to alter the original story, they need a damn good reason for doing so. Still, that doesn't mean that he wasn't open to new ideas. When Mazen would approach him with new ideas, sometimes Druckmann would be all in, saying Mazen's idea should have been in the game. Number 33. Druckmann wanted to de-emphasize the action and gameplay sections from the original story in favor of the character relationships. In his own words, he sought to keep the soul of the game's story. Structure-wise, The Last of Us show would follow the game's pacing, moving area to area, introducing new ensembles of characters instead of following the same group throughout the entire show. Joel and Ellie are the key focal point. Number 35. Mazin also wanted the live-action version's violence to feel heavier when compared to the game. He says that watching a person die carries more weight than watching pixels die, and that after reloading a checkpoint so many times, you start to think of the enemies as obstacles, not as people. Number 36. Plot changes are one thing, but The Last of Us also alters a few details of the world and setting. For one, the show takes place in a different year. While the original game takes place in 2033, 20 years after the outbreak in 2013, the show winds the clock back 10 years, with the story taking place in 2023, 20 years after a 2003 outbreak. Number 37. Even the infection itself has a major difference. In the game, the cordyceps spread through airborne spores. For the show, the producers wanted it switched up so that the cordyceps spread through tendrils. Number 38. Why the change? Well, the team felt that characters constantly wearing gas masks wouldn't play well for TV. They also felt that these spores didn't feel as dangerous and that tendrils created more dramatic tension. Number 39. In general, Druckmann and Mazen approached the world of The Last of Us with the new context of an audience that's more than familiar with a pandemic setting. Number 40. Actually, they based the tendrils of the cordyceps off the weaving root structure of mycelium. They also used jellyfish stings for visual inspiration. Number 41. Make no mistake though, this is not a zombie show. Just ask Evan Bolter. He's the cinematographer for The Last of Us. Number 42. According to Bolter, nobody, from the cast to the crew, nobody was allowed to say the Z word because it was being filmed in Calgary. The producers insisted on calling the monsters the infected, not zombies, because it is not a zombie show. Number 43. Whatever you call them, Mazen insisted that the infected not be created with visual effects for fear of them looking cheap. He was dead set on using practical effects while making them look as close to the in-game versions as possible. Number 44. So he brought in some old collaborators from his Chernobyl days, Barry and Sarah Goer. They were tasked with creating the real life infected. Number 45. To create the prosthetics, the Gowers also created and pulled from an entire reference library of everything from fuzzes, molds, slimes, and all different kinds of mushrooms of all different shapes and colors. Number 46. They also pulled some ideas from concept art of the game itself as reference. Number 47. In fact, original devs from The Last of Us were consulted on a number of the show's element. The game's art director, concept artists, and environmental artists all gave input on the show. Number 48. Even without getting the devs involved, The Last of Us already had a massive production team. The team consisted of five different art directors and hundreds of technicians, all determined to make The Last of Us look as good as possible. Number 49. While the vast majority of effects are practical, they did need to sprinkle a few visual effects in to pull the look together, particularly for the holes in the clicker's faces. Number 50. The fifth episode of The Last of Us actually features a mob of infected. The mob consisted of about 60 actors, with a team of 70 artists applying each of their prosthetics. Over the course of about 3 hours, the artists could apply prosthetics to about 30 actors. Number 51. As laborious as that sounds, this was only after the makeup team had become a well-oiled machine. 
Earlier in the production, sometimes makeup for the infected could take up to eight hours before they perfected the process. Number 52. As for the bloaters, the suits themselves weighed about 88 pounds. Each suit was coated in gel to give it that wet, repulsive appearance. Number 53. Of course, the infected don't just stand around. Each of the infected moves were choreographed by Paul Becker and Terry Notary. Number 54. Notary specified he wanted the movements of the infected to feel unified, like a school of fish. He actually set up a boot camp of sorts to prepare the infected actors for their performance. Number 55. While the infected are a key element of The Last of Us, the characters are the true meat and potatoes. While the game version of Joel needed to be resilient for gameplay purposes, Mazin and Druckmann sought to make the TV version feel more middle-aged as a reflection of his hard life. They added deficiencies to Joel, giving him knee pain when he stands up and gunfire-induced hearing loss in one of his ears. Number 56. With the characters written, casting director Victoria Thomas was charged with, you know, casting them. She wanted the cast to feel true to the game without being ruled by it. Number 57. Due to the COVID pandemic, all of the casting auditions for The Last of Us were held over Zoom. Number 58. Joel is played by the Mandalorian himself, Pedro Pascal. Number 59. Just before he auditioned for Joel, Pascal had just come off the second season release of The Mandalorian. He actually needed permission from The Mandalorian's producers to do The Last of Us. While Pascal received a ton of offers, he chose The Last of Us to work with Mazin. Number 60. Mazin and Druckmann had been eyeing Pascal to play Joel for a while. When they approached him with the role, Pascal signed on within the next 24 hours. Number 61. Pascal reportedly made $600,000 for each episode of The Last of Us, making him one of the highest paid American TV actors today. Number 62. As eager as he was to play Joel, Pascal is not a gamer. He said that he didn't have the skill to play The Last of Us himself, so he learned about the game by watching his nephew play. Number 63. While Pascal found Joel to be impressive, he ultimately chose to distance himself from Joel's in-game version. He wanted to go into the show with a blank slate and see what the showrunners wanted to do with the character. Number 64. When doing Joel's voice, Pascal uses a toned-down southern accent. Pascal is from San Antonio, Texas. Once he learned that Joel is from Austin, he decided to dial back the accent so he wouldn't sound too country. Number 65. Also, while writers wanted to lean into Joel's middle age, Pascal's a little younger. Joel in the show is 56 years old, while Pascal is only 46. Number 66. While he obviously doesn't play Joel, Joel's original voice actor, Troy Baker, is actually in the show. He plays a character named James, who's also in the game. Number 67. Druckmann and Mazin thought it was important that Baker appears somewhere in the show. When they approached Baker to play James, Baker didn't actually remember the character from the game. Number 68. Nonetheless, once he got to look at the script, Baker was surprised by how important his character was to the story. He once joked that when Druckmann and Mazin initially reached out to him, he thought they were going to make him a clicker. Number 69. On the subject of clickers, the actors who played them are actually fans of the game. Also, the clickers are voiced by the same two actors who played the male and female clickers in the game. Number 70. Of course, Joel is only one half of The Last of Us journey. Ellie is played by Bella Ramsey. Number 71. Tons of women auditioned to play Ellie. Bella Ramsey had to beat out over 100 different actresses, all vying for the role. Number 72. When The Last of Us was still being developed as a movie, Maisie Williams from Game of Thrones was a frontrunner to play Ellie. However, by the time the story was reworked into a TV show, Williams was too old to play the character. Number 73. Funny enough, Bella Ramsey was also on Game of Thrones. When The Last of Us producers saw her audition, they actually reached out to Game of Thrones showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. They had nothing but nice things to say about her, so with their recommendation, Ramsey was in as Ellie. Number 74. Before her audition, Ramsey had never played The Last of Us. Like Pascal, Ramsey didn't want the game's version of the character to affect her performance. However, she did watch some gameplay on YouTube to get a sense of what the story's about. Number 75. To prepare for the role, Ramsey had to learn an American accent. She also cut 15 inches of her hair and regularly wore a chest binder on set. By her account, she wore the binder 90% of the time, something she suggested not to do. Number 76. Like Troy Baker, Ellie's original voice actor, Ashley Johnson, is in The Last of Us as well. 
She actually plays Ellie's mother, Anna. Number 77. Anna is another inclusion exclusive to the show. Druckmann felt that her character was important, so he added her into the story. Number 78. Druckmann had always wanted to tell Anna's story, well before The Last of Us was even in talks to get a live-action adaptation. After The Last of Us released in 2013, Druckmann wrote a short story about Anna, intent on turning the story into an animated short film or even downloadable content for the game. Number 79. It's nice to see the original voice actors make an appearance, and Ashley Johnson and Troy Baker aren't alone. Merle Dandridge plays Marlene, the head of the Fireflies. Number 80. Unlike Baker and Johnson, Dandridge also played Marlene in the game, doing the voice and even the motion capture. She's the only actor from the game to reprise the same role. Number 81. Druckmann and Mazin recast Dandridge as Marlene because she closely resembled the character enough to be put into live action. She did need one change though. She had to wear a wig for her role. Number 82. Joel's younger brother, Tommy, is played by Gabriel Luna. Number 83. Luna was offered the role only six days after submitting his audition tape. The Last of Us producers quickly knew he was the one. Number 84. Luna was so good for the role that the producers even let him contribute to Tommy's look. The Indian paintbrush on Tommy's boots. The First Nations crafted belt buckle. Both visual details suggested by Luna. Number 85. In the game, Tommy is played by Jeffrey Pierce. Pierce also appears in The Last of Us show as Perry, a character exclusive to the show. Number 86. Pierce got the role by reaching out to Druckmann to voice support and well wishes for the show. Sure enough, something came up that fit for Pierce to be a part of the cast. Number 87. Filming and production proper on The Last of Us started in Calgary in July of 2021. It was actually supposed to begin a week earlier. Number 88. Nearly the entire show was filmed in Alberta. Just about all of the US locations and even Jakarta, Indonesia were recreated there. Number 89. More specifically, Canmore, Alberta was used to replicate Jackson, Wyoming, while Calgary itself was used as a model for Kansas City, Missouri. Number 90. Some shots were actually filmed on location in Kansas City after the bulk of production was already finished. Filming caused a whole traffic jam and everything. Number 91. Filming and production finally wrapped in the early morning of June 11th, 2022. Number 92. Apparently, The Last of Us is speculated to be the largest TV production in Canadian history. The show was anticipated to pull in 200 million Canadian dollars of revenue for Alberta. Number 93. Druckmann was regularly on set for the first few months, traveling between Calgary and Los Angeles. Eventually, the traveling started cutting into his work at Naughty Dog, so he opted to work remotely for the rest of the production. Number 94. The Last of Us was originally supposed to be 10 episodes instead of 9. HBO decided to combine the first two episodes after their executives felt the original ending of the first episode wasn't captivating enough to keep people watching. Number 95. The original ending just cut from Joel burning the infected boy's body to Ellie in chains. HBO felt the ending was too grim, so they had the production team move up Joel and Ellie's first meeting. Number 96. The Last of Us's music score was composed by Gustavo Santolala and David Fleming. Santolala wrote the show's opening theme on his own, though. Number 97. Santolala also wrote the score to The Last of Us game. Number 98. The first episode of The Last of Us dropped on January 15th, 2023. Number 99. The premiere of The Last of Us managed to pull in 4.7 million viewers across all platforms in the US, both for HBO on TV and streamed on HBO Max. Number 100. Those ratings make The Last of Us the second biggest show to debut for HBO over the past 10 years or so. Only House of the Dragon has it beat. Number 101. In Latin America though, The Last of Us holds the title for the biggest premiere for HBO Max. Number 102. The show is particularly popular in Brazil. More than half of all online interaction related to the show came out of Brazil alone. Number 103. It probably has to do with the cast of the Brazilian dub. The Brazilian cast brought back the same actors who dubbed the original Last of Us game. Number 104. Viewership started strong and has only grown since the premiere. The 8th episode's debut was watched by 8.1 million people, a 74% boost from the series premiere. Number 105. The show has boosted the game's sales too. 
In the UK, after the premiere, sales of The Last of Us Remastered and The Last of Us Part 1 increased by 337 and 305%, respectively, from the previous week. Number 106. As far as what's next, Druckmann and Mazen have both said that they would move straight into the events of The Last of Us Part 2 if a second season was greenlit. Number 107. Well, a second season was indeed greenlit. HBO renewed The Last of Us for a second season on January 27th, 2023, less than two weeks after the debut. Reportedly, the writer's room has been plugging away in LA since at least February. And just like that, we've reached the last of The Last of Us facts. And as we reach the end of our video, we will journey to the Outer Banks. You know, for 107 facts about the Outer Banks. Number 1. The entire plot, concept, and framework of Outer Banks comes from three different guys. The show was created by Josh Pate, Jonas Pate, and Shannon Burke. Number 2. Yes, Josh and Jonas Pate are brothers. Actually, they're identical twins. Number 3. As a setting for their story, the Outer Banks resonate with both of them. The Pates are originally from North Carolina. Number 4. Growing up, the brothers also spent a lot of their time in South Carolina on Kiowa Island, just south of Charleston. It's pretty much considered the Hamptons equivalent of South Carolina. Number 5. When they weren't hanging out on Kiowa Island, the Pates also spent a bunch of time further inland, but still on a different island, John's Island. John's Island is actually the largest island in South Carolina. Number 6. Growing up in South Carolina, bouncing between the two different islands, the Pate brothers have first-hand accounts of the class divide. This divide was the first influence behind the Outer Banks' two different cliques, the Kooks and the Pogues. Number 7. In fact, the Pates even based a few of the characters in Outer Banks on people they knew in high school. They also based elements of the script on experiences that they had during their teenage years. Number 8. Outer Banks is hardly their first outing as filmmakers. Josh and Jonas Pate first got their official screenwriting start in the 1996 thriller The Grave. Number 9. Still, the Banks had their eyes on writing well before then. In 1992, Josh Pate earned his bachelor's degree in English from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Number 10. Before ever trying his hand at screenwriting, Josh Pate originally wanted to be a novelist. When Jonas started getting more into filmmaking though, Josh followed suit and shifted his writing career. Number 11. Josh actually tried writing a novel right out of college. At one point, he had completed a novel that came in at about 300 pages. However, he thought that it was so terrible that he ended up burning the entire thing. Number 12. Shifting gears to screenwriting with Jonas was hardly a massive leap for Josh. He found that writing novels was incredibly difficult, so he welcomed the format and style change. Number 13. Eventually, the Pate twins moved from New York back to the familiar shores of the east coast of North Carolina. Specifically, they found a spot in Wrightsville Beach. Number 14. By at that point, the two had written a screenplay together and were eager to get some new eyes on it. Lucky for them, legendary actor Dennis Hopper happened to be living nearby. To get his attention, the Pates hung a bedsheet on a light post across from Hopper's house that read, Dennis, we have a script, call us. Number 15. Sure enough, Dennis Hopper took the words of the bedsheet to heart. Two months later, Hopper called them up and invited them over to his place to watch basketball and talk about their screenplay. Number 16. Of course, the Pate brothers are only two-thirds of the Outer Banks equation. While Shannon Burke is originally from Illinois, he actually went to the same college as Josh Pate, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Number 17. However, unlike the Pates, Burke's professional journey didn't immediately begin with writing. After college, he lived in New York City where he worked for the fire department as an EMS. Number 18. Still, while working as an EMS, Burke still found the time to write. A lot of the time, in fact. He managed to squeeze 7-8 to eight hours in every day just for writing. Number 19. Burke's format of choice was novels. Using his experiences as an EMS for inspiration, Burke wrote and published a number of novels throughout the 2000s and 2010s, including Safe Light in 2004, Black Flies in 2008, and Into the Savage Country in 2015. Number 20. Don't let the long list of novels fool you though. Outer Banks is not his first screenplay. Burke also worked on the screenplay for the 2005 political thriller, Syriana, starring George Clooney. Number 21. Despite the recent 
recent genre shift, Burke considers himself not a novelist turned screenwriter, but equal parts both. Actually, he endeavored to be a lawyer before he was even an EMS. Number 22. Lengthwise, Burke likens his own novels to about a season's worth of television. He says that, as different as they are from novels, writing screenplays feels familiar and that there's a lot of overlap when writing for TV. Number 23. For Josh Pate, the idea for Outer Banks first came about when he read a news article. There was a storm that had hit the real life Outer Banks, causing a large power outage, just like the opening of the show. Number 24. Of all the inspiration Josh drew from the news article, there was one particular image that stuck with him. A darkened, powerless mansion looming in the waning light of dusk. Number 25. And so, with the image and premise fresh in his mind, Pate reached out to Burke with the idea for Outer Banks. From there, the two decided they wanted to do a story centering around high school and teenagers. Number 26. Trouble was, there was already a number of famous teen dramas that were also based in North Carolina. For one, One Tree Hill is also set there. Also, while Dawson's Creek is set in a fictional Massachusetts town, the series was actually filmed in Wilmington, North Carolina. Number 27. So, to set their story apart from the others, they also drew inspiration from books. One book in particular rang out as an influence, The Outsiders. Number 28. Like The Outsiders, Outer Banks featured two rival gangs, divided by class and constantly at each other's throats. On the lower class, you've got the Pogues, or the Greasers, and on the upper class, you've got the Kooks, or the Soches. Number 29. Growing up on the East Coast, Josh Pate was always regularly exposed to the real world divide in the class of beach communities. He said that the beach scene is very have and have not, and that he considers Outer Banks to be biographical in a way. Also, while Burke didn't grow up anywhere near the East Coast, he also incorporated elements of his high school experience into the story. Number 30. Once they had a plot, fleshed out the setting, and a solid cast of characters, Josh and Burke brought this early version of Outer Banks to Jonas for some feedback. Jonas added that they needed some juice to help the story take off from the foundation that they laid. Number 31. Sure enough, that juice ended up being the specific genre. To punch things up, they decided to make Outer Banks an action-adventure story. Number 32. For the adventure element, Josh Pate and Burke looked to old-school, fast-paced adventure novels from the 1800s. Treasure Island was a particular influence on the Outer Banks. Number 33. They also infused the adventure aspect with some notes from books like Anna Karenia. Specifically, John B.'s plot draws a bunch from Vronsky's action sequences. Number 34. Among all of their literary inspiration, Pate and Burke also looked to the real-life story of the treasure of Captain William Kidd, hidden on Gardner's Island off the east coast of Long Island. Number 35. However, 19th century novels and real-life treasure hunts weren't their only influence. Pate and Burke also took a number of adventuring cues from the Indiana Jones movies. Pate and Burke would watch Raiders of the Lost Ark over and over again to reverse engineer moments that inspire them. Number 36. This reverse engineering process was a regular part of Pate and Burke's writing process. They would use classic moments from old stories as touchstones, add a special twist, and incorporate them into their story for Outer Banks. Number 37. Although there's a three-man team behind the creation of Outer Banks, Josh, Pate, and Burke do the actual literal writing. Jonas, on the other hand, works more exclusively from the director's chair. Number 38. Of course, Josh and Burke know that Jonas is still in their metaphorical writer's room, which they admit is radically different from traditional TV writers' rooms. Number 39. They attribute their different writing and creation process to being a product of their long-standing friendship. It's an unconventional process by most standards, but they trust each other enough to know that it works for them. Number 40. For the writing itself, Burke says they're more focused on logic than magic. In any given situation, they would rely on how the characters would react instead of trying to puppet master them through the scene, moving them around like pieces on a chessboard. Number 41. Given the events of Outer Banks, sometimes they would get caught up in the tension and the action of what was happening. In that case, they would use a similar strategy to escape those dead ends, imagining what the characters were feeling and using that as a starting point for how to move forward. Number 42. When writing the action itself, Pate, Burke, and the writing team flew by two masters guiding them. They would find the universal touchstone they were trying to convey, and then from there find a way to convey it in the most dramatic way possible. Number 43. Of course, when writing a whole TV series, not everything works out along the way. Pate said that for every 50-page script they wrote, there were 300 pages that were totally thrown away, possibly set on fire in Pate's case. Number 44. When Pate and Burke would find themselves at a dead end, be it lack of tension or a weak plot point, they said that instead of thinking themselves out of the hole, they'd write their way 
layout until something worked, hence all the thrown away pages. Number 45. Burke described the way they'd find their momentum as smelling blood in the water. Once they had banged out 8, 9, or 10 pages of script, they'd allow instinct to take over and push forward until it was finished. Number 46. Like striking gold, the Outer Banks creators had their own stroke of luck when pitching the series to Netflix. One of the Netflix executives they met was actually from Columbia, South Carolina, so they were already familiar with a number of the areas that Burke and the Pates were describing in their story. Number 47. At the time, Josh Pate was worried that their script would never sell. He felt that it was the least sellable pitch that he'd ever gone out with. Number 48. Of course, hindsight tells us that he was worried for nothing. Netflix ordered one season and announced Outer Banks May 3rd, 2019. Number 49. By then, the major players of Outer Banks had already been cast, so the roster of actors was announced at the same time as the show. Number 50. Josh Pate was adamant about assembling a cast that felt like real outdoor kids. He wanted the show to have an authentic southern feel and didn't want a bunch of theater kids from New York City with little or no real outdoor experience. Number 51. In general, Josh Pate wanted Outer Banks to lean into the outdoor aesthetic. He wrote the script as a way to glamorize the idea of kids being outside, wake surfing instead of being on their phones all the time. In Pate's own words, the ocean's cooler than the computer. Number 52. So to truly capture that outdoor kid vibe and avoid the sheltered theater kid one, almost the entire cast is from the southern parts of the US. Number 53. At one point, Jonas Pate had moved back to North Carolina and had been living in Wilmington for a number of years. Number 54. Funny enough, Josh Pate doesn't live anywhere near the Outer Banks these days. He's actually based out of Idaho. Number 55. Of course, the cast didn't assemble themselves. The casting director for Outer Banks in Wilmington, North Carolina was Lisa May Fincannon. Number 56. According to Josh Pate, Fincannon and her husband Craig were key figures in getting the southern, outdoorsy cast that they were looking for. Number 57. From the jump, the Pate brothers and Burke wanted the cast to bond as quickly as possible, so Jonas Pate brought the cast to the real-world location of John B's house, aka the Chateau. Once they all arrived, Jonas locked the cast in the Chateau overnight with a keg of beer and pretty much said, get to know each other. Number 58. To be clear, this impromptu lock-in wasn't the first time the cast had met each other. They actually met for the first time at a table read. You know, like the typical cast of a TV show. At the read, though, they connected instantly. They were all determined to go on this journey with each other. Number 59. After a group cast dinner the night of the table read, the whole cast also received boating lessons the next morning. Number 60. Between the reading, boating, and inebriation, all the bonding did pay off. The cast hit it off and are all friends outside of the show, hanging out off and on the set during filming. Number 61. According to Chase Stokes, the Outer Banks cast had so much fun goofing around that they could make a whole additional 10 episodes out of the bloopers alone. Number 62. The Pates actually wanted to film Outer Banks on a location in Wilmington, North Carolina, but Netflix opted out of filming in North Carolina completely. Number 63. Netflix refused to film in the state due to the state's controversial House Bill 2, or the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act. Number 64. Passed in 2016, House Bill 2 forces people to use bathrooms that correspond to the sex that is listed on their birth certificate. It's been described as an aggressively anti-LGBT piece of legislation. The bill was officially and completely repealed in December of 2020. Number 65. With Wilmington out of the picture, filming for Outer Banks instead took place further down the coast in Charleston, South Carolina. Number 66. Sure, filming in South Carolina wasn't what the Pates had originally envisioned for Outer Banks, but Josh thinks it worked out for the better. He feels that the filming locations in South Carolina were a better fit for the story after all. Number 67. Naturally, filming in South Carolina, pretending that it's North Carolina forced Outer Banks to be fairly liberal with its geography. For example, in season 1, John B. and Sarah take a ferry and end up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Number 68. In reality, Chapel Hill is pretty far inland, so a ferry straight there from the coast wouldn't actually work. There was originally a scene with the two of them in a cab, but it ended up getting cut because it wasn't working. Number 69. Principal photography for Outer Banks began in Charleston on May 1st, 2019, just two days before the show was officially announced by Netflix. Number 70. As for the main hero of this whole adventure, John B. Rutledge is played by Chase Stokes. Number 71. Sure enough, true to Pate's word, Chase Stokes is from the South. He's originally from Annapolis, Maryland. Number 72. 
Jonas said that before they knew Stokes was their John B, they saw over 600 actors, all auditioning to play the part. Number 73. For playing John B, Stokes tried to layer the fact that John B's dad is presumed dead into every part of his performance. This includes how he carries himself in every situation and even how he walks. Number 74. Tragically, Stokes' grandmother had passed away just a few months before shooting began on Outer Banks. Three weeks into shooting, he actually had to go back to Florida for his grandma's funeral. Number 75. Once Stokes made it back to set, he saw a sign that let him know that his grandma was with him. Stokes said that she always talked about seeing things in threes and that dolphins were her favorite animal. Amazingly, on the first day back on set, Stokes walked out onto a dock at the chateau and saw three dolphins. Number 76. After a clear sign like that, Stokes considers season 1 to be an ode to his grandma. Number 77. The character's name, John B, is kind of an ode in and of itself to an old Bahamian folk song. You've probably heard the famous Beach Boys rendition of it. Number 78. As for the once queen of the kooks, Sarah Cameron is played by Madeline Klein. Number 79. Madeline Klein actually grew up not too far north of Charleston in a small town called Goose Creek. Number 80. To play Sarah, Madeline Klein first started by identifying and working with the character's insecurities. She felt that exploring them was cathartic and that it made her feel like it was okay to feel the same things. Number 81. When Klein first read the script, she saw Sarah was a pretty different character. She said that Sarah was originally pretty one-dimensional, a stereotypical standoffish rich girl. You know, a kook. Number 82. Klein worked extensively with the creators and writers on Outer Banks to create her own version of Sarah, the more fleshed out, nuanced version that we know the character to be. Number 83. Also, you shouldn't be too surprised that John B. and Sarah had such chemistry. Chase Stokes and Madeline Klein actually dated in real life. Number 84. As a couple, they also starred together in a music video for Kygo, a Norwegian DJ. Number 85. Music videos aside, both Stokes and Klein share credits in a different Netflix series that's more popular than Outer Banks, Stranger Things. Stokes briefly appeared in Season 1 as a character called Reed, and Klein plays a character named Tina in Season 2. Number 86. So how about the other Pogues? Well, Madison Bailey plays the kook-turned-pogue Kiara Key Carrera. Number 87. Bailey is from North Carolina, but not near the Outer Banks. She's from a town closer to Winston-Salem, farther inland from the coast. Number 88. Jonathan Davis plays Pope Hayward, the brainy Blue Ranger of the Pogue crew. Number 89. Davis is a southerner, but he's even further inland than Bailey. He's originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Number 90. And as for J.J. Maybank, he's played by Rooney Pankow. Number 91. Pankow is actually the only one of the main kids who isn't from the South, but he's hardly a city kid. He's from Alaska. Even better, the part of Alaska he grew up in, the southern coast, is a series of islands not unlike the Outer Banks. Number 92. Sure, he didn't quite explicitly fit Pate's southern criteria, but with Pankow growing up in Alaska, Pate knows he's an outdoorsy guy. Number 93. So, we've covered all the Pogues, but what about the Kooks? Well, Sarah's obsessive ex, Topper, is played by Austin North. Number 94. Unsurprisingly, North's namesake isn't a funny bit of irony, but a dead giveaway. He's not from the South, but the Midwest, Cincinnati, Ohio. Number 95. As for Topper's buddy and Sarah's brother, Rafe Cameron, he's played by Drew Starkey. Number 96. Rest assured, this kook is a true southerner. He's from North Carolina, but not the coast. He actually grew up near the Catawba River. Number 97. Charles Aston plays Ward Cameron, Sarah and Rafe's dad. Number 98. If you're like me, you recognize this guy not as Charles, but Chip Eston from those old episodes of Whose Line Is It Anyway? Makes sense that Ward is so good at thinking on his feet. Number 99. Oh, and for the record, Eston's not from the South, he's from Pittsburgh. But he's not one of the kids, so it's cool, I guess. Number 100. Watching Outer Banks is one thing, but listening to it is an experience unto itself. One of the key players of the soundtrack is chill psych rock trio Krong Bin. Their music perfectly sets the laid-back surfer vibes of the Outer Banks. Number 101. Don't believe me? Check it out for yourself. If you haven't already, you've been able to watch Outer Banks since Season 1 first dropped on Netflix on April 15th, 2020. Number 102. Meanwhile, the second season was renewed by Netflix on July 24th, 2020, and was released just over a year later on July 30th, 2021. Number 103. Despite the show's success, it wasn't all smooth sailing for the Outer Banks. 
On December 21st, a North Carolina teacher named Kevin Wooten sued Netflix, The Pates, and Burke for stealing the plot of his novel, Pennywise, The Hunt for Blackbeard's Treasure. He was seeking ongoing royalties and damage payments. Number 104. Well, about a year later, a federal judge dismissed the suit, siding with the Outer Banks creators. In a 25-page opinion, the judge says that while the two stories shared similarities as far as hidden treasure goes, such similarities would render every other treasure hunting story liable for copyright infringement. Number 105. When describing the then-upcoming Season 3, Josh Pate described it as an escalation of Season 2 in the way that Season 2 was an escalation of Season 1. Number 106. More specifically, Pate said that Season 3 will expand on the mythology of the treasure. Number 107. If you can't already, you'll be able to put that claim to the test on February 23rd, 2023, when Season 3 comes out. 1,407 facts about movies and TV that premiered in 2023. Seems like a wild amount, especially looking back at it. I can't believe I said all this stuff. But here we are. So, what did you think of today's marathon? Which release was your favorite? Did we miss anything from your best of 2023 list? What are you looking forward to in 2024? Make sure you let us know down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching and remember, Frederator loves you.